Simon says subscribe and click on the bell icon to receive notifications. We've made the files the instructor uses in this tutorial available for free. Just click the link below in the video details to get these. Hello everyone and welcome to this course on Microsoft Access 2019. My name is Deb and I'm your course instructor. I'm a MOSS certified TAP accredited IT trainer and I've been using Access for a very long time along with all of the other Microsoft applications. And Access really is a product that's changed a lot in the last couple of versions. And what I plan to do in this course is just really to show you how Access can help you manage large amounts of data. Now, you might be thinking, who is this course exactly for? And when I was designing this course, I kind of broke it down into three separate groups. So the first group of people this course would be ideal for would be for people who have either never used Access or any kind of database software and people who have certainly never designed or built a database. Now on that note, we are going to start completely from scratch. So I don't require you to have any existing knowledge in Access in order for you to be able to sit through this course. I do, however, require you to have at least a little bit of knowledge of the use of Windows software and applications. So, for example, if you've used something like Excel or PowerPoint or Word before, that's fine. So I'm going to assume that you can at least find your way around a Windows application. The second group of people this course is designed for are people who have maybe used an older version of Access. This current version, Access 2019, could be very different from the version that you're used to using, particularly if it was Access 2010 or before that. You may not even have used Access with the ribbon interface that was introduced in 2010. And the third group of people that this course is designed for are users of more recent versions. So whilst you might be familiar with some of the later versions of Access, so maybe Access 2013 or 2016, you may not be used to some of the newer features in 2019, such as the creation and use of web apps. Now I am gonna go through this whole course in sequence, step by step, and I would advise you to do exactly the same. Some of the earlier sections are going to contain more introductory material, where we'll go over a lot of the features and the views in Access, and then we'll work our way up through some of the more intermediate modules. Now the version I'm using is the desktop version of Access 2019. And there are some things that are not going to be covering in this course, such as VBA programming. Now we will be looking a little bit at macros, but we won't be going into VBA in any great depth. And the only thing that you really need in order to be able to work your way through this course is a live internet connection for some of the things such as online help and downloading templates. So that is it, we are ready to go. In the next section, I'm going to talk to you about acquiring Access 2019 and getting it working. So please join me for that. Hello again, and welcome back to our course on Access 2019. In this module, we're going to take a look at how you can acquire Access. In other words, how you can download it onto your PC. And there are a couple of different ways. And as with everything in Microsoft, sometimes it does tend to look like it's a pretty confusing process due to the fact that Microsoft do tend to change up their website fairly frequently. So I just want to talk to you about the couple of options that you have in order to get the copy of Access on your PC. Now, the first option is what you can see here, and that is to download a version of Office 365. Now, in case you're unsure exactly what Office 365 is, it's basically a subscription service. So for a certain amount of money, and you can either pay monthly or yearly, you can essentially rent your Microsoft applications from Microsoft. That's how I like to think about it. It's very similar to if you've ever used a subscription service like Netflix or Spotify. 
you pay Microsoft and you get access to download all of the Microsoft applications and use them. So what you can see here are a couple of the options that you have for purchasing Office 365 on the Microsoft website. And you can see just underneath, it shows you which applications are included. So you do want to make sure that if you're purchasing this predominantly to get access to Access, that that application is actually included. And you can see it here, it's included with Office 365 Home and Office 365 Personal. And you'll see it says PC only next to each of these icons. What that basically means is that there's no mobile version of Access included with these two subscriptions. So unlike the other applications like Word, Excel and PowerPoint, where you can go into your Office 365 portal and essentially use an online version of the applications, you can't do that with Access, but you can certainly download it to your PC and use it in that way. Now, the good thing about Office 365 or purchasing an Office 365 subscription is that it means that your applications are always going to be up to date. They automatically receive updates when they're available from Microsoft. So you never have to worry about purchasing the next version because the version you have is always and consistently kept up to date. So that's why sometimes I feel that this is a good investment. Now, the second option that you have when it comes to downloading Access is that you could choose to do a one-time purchase of Office. And you can see here I've got up on the screen a few of the different plans that you have. The cost is a lot higher and this is a one-time purchase, which means you're not paying a monthly subscription. Once you pay your money, you download the software and it's yours to keep. However, just be aware that unlike Office 365, it doesn't receive constant updates. So it might be that you download this once, you use it for a couple of years, and then you need to repurchase it. So it's really up to you whether you choose to go the subscription route or if you go the one-time purchase route. Just make sure if you are doing a one-time purchase and you specifically want it to contain access, make sure that you go through and the version that you're buying does actually contain access. There are, of course, various other websites which offer a download of Access 2019. So it is worth doing a little bit of research before you plump for one or the other options. I would say if you're just Googling, trying to find a different resource for downloading Access, then please be really careful as to which download source you use. Just make sure that it is a legitimate source before you pay any money and download the application. Once you've chosen which one of those options you want to go ahead with, then you can just click buy now and you'll be sent a download link for which you can download the software. And then you are pretty much good to go. So that's it. Just some quick tips on how you can acquire Access 2019. In the next module, we're going to talk a little bit about the structure of this course. So I will see you over there. Hello again and welcome back to our course on Access 2019. Before we get started and jump into the content, I just want to take a few moments to explain to you the structure of this course. Now, this course is arranged in two sections and in each section are modules with videos. Now, this course is designed to be followed in sequence, so try not to be too tempted to jump ahead. Now, saying that, if you have used a very recent version of Access before coming to this course, there might definitely be some sections, particularly towards the beginning, where you might want to skip ahead. For example, we'll be discussing things in some of the earlier modules, like how to use the Quick Access Toolbar, and some things which are more generally related to Microsoft functionality, as opposed to specifically Access functionality. So if you are very used to using Microsoft products, there may definitely be some modules at the beginning which you can comfortably jump ahead of. I'm also going to be setting some exercises throughout this course, and not only will I show them to you, but we will also do them together. And I'm going to save my own copy of the exercises in the Exercises Files folder, and you'll find a downloadable link for that under the relevant section in this course. So make sure that you're familiar with those and you know where they are located. And the contents will look something similar to this. And as I said, we will be referring to these files in the course. 
I'll also be doing some demonstrations throughout this course and what we're essentially going to be doing is we're going to be developing a very straightforward database and the files I use for that will be in the course files folder which will look something like what you see on the screen right now. So again make sure you're familiar with where those are located and save them off to your PC and I recommend that you use these files to work along with me with. So hopefully that gives you more of an idea as to how this course is structured and the files that we're going to be using. That's it for this section. I will see you in the next one where we'll be talking about how you can use database templates. Hello again, this is Deb and welcome back to our course on Access 2019. It's now time to start using Access. So what we've got here is just a blank desktop. And the first thing I'm going to do is I'm just going to search for access using my search at the bottom here. Now I'm using Windows 10, so if you're using a different version of Windows, then it might be slightly different. But I'm just going to type in access. And you can see there the app is the first one listed. So I can click it just to open it. But because I'm going to be using access all the time, what I prefer to do is right click and I'm going to select pin to taskbar. And what that will do is it will pin the access app to my taskbar at the bottom here so that I can access it whenever I need. It just makes it a little bit easier. I don't have to go in and search for it every single time. So I would recommend that if you are using Windows 10, Windows 8, Windows 7, that you do pin it to your taskbar. So I can now just go in and click on the access icon and that will open up the application. So this is where you'll be taken when you first open up Access, and this is what we call the Start Screen. And there are some buttons on here which should look fairly familiar if you're used to using other Microsoft applications. So if you just glance your eyes up to the top right-hand corner, you'll see we have a little question mark just there which will allow you to access um, the Access Help. You could also press the F1 shortcut key to get into that. We have our Minimize if you want to minimize the application our restore down or restore up button and we also have our close button in the top corner. I also have there my account details so if I wanted to see more about that I could jump into there. So those should be reasonably familiar to you if you're, if you're used to using other Microsoft applications. We then have a menu bar on the left hand side you can see currently home is selected. And what I have on this home page is I have a number of different templates that I can select and the ones that you can see here aren't by any means all of them. If I want to see the whole lot of templates I have on offer, I can click that more templates link on the right hand side. I'm going to come back to that in a moment. I just want you to cast your eyes underneath that. So we have a recent and a pinned tab. Now, if this is the first time you're opening Access and you haven't created any databases yet, then your recent list is going to be blank, much like mine is just here. If I click on pinned, you'll also see that that's blank. Now, when I start creating a database, what I could do if I wanted to is I could choose to pin it and it will then appear underneath this pinned section. So in general, the kinds of databases that you might want to pin would be ones that you use frequently. So it just enables you to access them, get to them a lot quicker. I then also have options in the left hand menu for creating a new database and also for opening an existing database. So if I have one stored off somewhere on my local drives or maybe in the cloud, OneDrive for example, I could go in here and I could browse to that database to open it. Now I'm going to click on new for the time being because we're going to direct our attention to the different templates that we have available. And in Access 2019, databases can be of two types. You can have a desktop database, which is more of your traditional uh, kind of database, which sits on your desktop, and you would in general use it locally for maintaining databases. And alternatively, there is the web app, which is a database that is used online that you can share with others. Now, the reason why you might want to use a template is that it's a really good kind of jumping off point. So instead of just being faced with a blank database that you need to construct yourself, you might want to have 
a starting point that you can build on. And there are a whole host of templates available to you within Access. And you can see some that we have here. These are some of the more popular ones you might want to use. There is obviously a blank database, which you could use. We've got asset tracking, contacts, students, event management, so on and so forth. So it really depends on the type of database that you want to create as to which one of these is going to be most useful to you. If I scroll down, you can see eventually we do get to the end of the templates. Now, if you can't find what you're looking for just here, you do have a search bar at the top to search for more templates. So if I was searching for uh, contacts, let's just type that in. And I'm going to click the magnifying glass. That's going to go away. It's going to search all of the available access templates and it's going to pull back any that are kind of related to or might be useful if I want to create a database of contacts. To come out of here, just click on that little back link and it will take you back to that main starting template page. Now, what we're going to do is we're going to use one of these templates and we are going to use this one just here, the contacts template. So let's click on that. Now, what I'm presented with when I select my template is I can see a preview, essentially, of what that contact list database is going to look like. Obviously, it's fairly blank at the moment. I also have a description on the right hand side. So it says provided by Microsoft Corporation. And then I have quite a lengthy description as to what this database is all about. So essentially, it creates and maintains a comprehensive database of your customers, partners and vendors using this popular template. It then shows me the download size. So this is a fairly small template at 143K. And underneath that, I then have an option here for choosing my file name. So essentially what I want this database to be called. And the information I have in there currently is really just the default name that Access assigns to this database. So it says database one dot ACDB. And it's worth noting that ACDB is the file extension for databases in Access. And then underneath that, it shows me the path or where this database is going to be stored. So I can see currently that it's going to be stored on my C drive in my documents folder. And if I wasn't happy with that, I could go in and I could use this browse button and choose a different location in which to store that database. Now, I'm not going to change anything at this stage. We're going to actually save this database using a different name later on. So I'm happy with those defaults. Now, one thing else to point out before we actually create this database is just these arrows that we have on the right and left hand side. If I want to scroll through more of the templates, I can click this arrow and it will take me to the next template along. So if I wasn't particularly sure that that contacts database was exactly what I wanted, I could use my arrows and go through and see if there's another template that's more appropriate. Now, I'm just going to go back because I am happy with that contacts database. And I'm going to accept all these defaults and I'm going to click that big create button in the middle there. So what we're looking at now is a contact list or a contact management database. And it's fairly empty at the moment. We haven't added any contacts into here yet, but it gives me a really good starting point for which to start my contact list. So you can see here it has definitions for the information that I will need to have in this contact list. So you can see here, it's got first name, last name, company, job title, category, email address, business phone, home phone, mobile, zip. So some basic fields that I can go in and I can complete. And of course, you can modify these, you can remove fields you don't want, and you can add fields that you do want, which we'll get into later on in the course. Now, the panel on the left hand side that you can see here tells you what's included in this template. So you can see that we have some tables, some queries, forms, reports, macros and modules. And again, I'm going to explain what each of those mean during the course. But this in general is typical of what you will see when you open up a template. 
Now it's worth noting that sometimes when you open a template, you may receive a security warning. Access does tend to default to being rather cautious when you're opening new files. So before you run it, you need to consider where that template came from. So the one that we've just opened was from the Microsoft website. It's an official template. So I'm pretty sure that that is a safe place to download this template from. However, if you've got your template from some other source, you might want to proceed with a little bit of caution. You don't want to download something horrible onto your PC in the form of a template. So just be aware of that. And if you do get a security warning pop up, if you determine that it does come from a safe location, just click the enable content button when you see that warning message. Now, what I'm actually gonna do is I'm just gonna close this database down again, and I'm gonna reopen access. And I just want to show you that now, because we've created a database underneath recent, you can see our database sitting there. So let's click on it to reopen it. And this is what you'll see sometimes is you'll get a welcome screen and it really kind of walks you through what the context database is all about. So you have some information just here and you also have a little video if you want to watch that. And all this screen does, is it really gives you information on how to use this template. Now it's worth noting, and the reason why I've kind of shown you this is that you can create your own help screens and welcome screens as well, which can sometimes be particularly useful if you're sharing a database that you've created with other people. So it gives them an idea of how they can use that database. Again, I'm not gonna to get too much into that at the moment, but I really did think that that was worth highlighting so you know that you can do that. So I'm just gonna close this window down and I'm actually gonna close all of Access down again in preparation for our next module. So that's this module done. What we're going to move on to in the next module is saving and opening databases. So please join me for that. Hello again, this is Deb and welcome back to our course on Access 2019. In the previous module, we looked at those different access templates and we opened up the first contacts list database. So now what I want to talk about in this module is how you can create, save and open databases. So we're starting off back at that home screen. And if you look now underneath recent, you can see that we have our database one dot db, which was that contacts database that we created in the previous module. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to double click to open that database. And again, as we discussed previously, you will get a welcome screen, which I'm just going to close by clicking on the cross at this moment in time. So now I have this contact management database open and we did give it a rather generic name. We took a default name of database one. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to save this and give it a different name of my choosing. So I'm going to go to file. I'm going to go down to save as and I'm going to save this just as a regular database. So that's the default option just here with the ACDB extension and I'm going to click save as. Now you'll see what I get here is a little warning message which says all open objects must be closed prior to continuing this operation. So what that actually means is if I just close that down and click the back arrow to go back to my database, I actually have to essentially close down this database in order to save it, which kind of seems a little bit counterintuitive. But I'm going to go all the way over to the right hand side and you'll see just here we have a little cross and as I hover over it says close contact list which will essentially close that database and all the attached objects. I can now go back to file down to save as and click the save as button again and this time it's going to let me save this database in a location of my choosing and I'm going to save this in the course files folder and I'm going to call it contacts zero one. I'm happy with that ACDB file extension and I'm going to click on the save button. Again, I'm going to close down the welcome screen and what you'll see is that you will get a security warning at the top here. So all you need to do there is just click enable content. 
and I'm going to close down all of Access one more time and I'm going to reopen. So let's click on Access from my taskbar. So this time when we open up Access, you can now see under Recent, I have those two separate databases. So even though they are essentially the same at the moment, we've got two separate file names, two separate databases. And you can see Contact01 has the path name of where that file is actually stored underneath. Now, obviously, if I wanted to go back in and just start working on that Contacts database, I can double click to open it. But if I wanted to open a different database, I would go to the open button from my menu on the left hand side. And what you can also see in there is my context database and my database one that we've created. So I can open from there as well. But alternatively, if I have another database stored off, I could choose a location from which to open it. And this will really depend on what services you have access to. So you will be able to uh, browse locally on your PC. And if you are connected to cloud storage, so maybe something like OneDrive, like I am just here, you can go straight in there and open an access database that you have saved to the cloud. Now, what we're going to do is we're gonna go back to new and we're going to create a new blank database. So we're essentially going to start from scratch to work on the course database that I'm going to use for most of the demonstrations in this course. So let's click on blank. So again, you can see that this new blank database has a default file name and file location. Now I'm actually gonna change this because I want to save this into the course files folder. And I'm going to change the file name at this point as well. And this database that we're going to be creating is essentially for a travel company that runs some rather exclusive tours. And the name of the travel company is Esprit de Tour. So I'm going to change this file name. I'm going to delete out database two and we're going to call it Esprit de Tour. And this database is going to go through a few different versions. So let's add 01 on the end just there and click on create. And there we go. We've created our first new blank database. Now, one thing that you may notice is if you look at the top, you'll see that the file name is very long at the top there. So where it says Esprit de Tour 01 and it then has database and then a very long path name as to where that database is saved. And that looks a little bit messy there at the top of the screen. Now we're going to sort that out later on. I'm going to show you how you can make that look a lot neater. Now what you're actually looking at when you open up a blank database is basically a single table. And this is where you create your database. And at the moment it has nothing in it. And we're going to build on this throughout the course. Now, one other thing to show you just before we leave this module is that when I click on file, one option I have there is close. So let's click on close. And what you'll see is that it doesn't actually close access. It only closes the current database. So I just wanted to point that out because sometimes that can be a little bit confusing. You're never sure if you're closing the file or if you're going to close access entirely. So in this instance, it closes the current database that you have open, but leaves the access application open. So that's about it for this module. In the next module, we're going to be talking about the Access workspace and the backstage area. So please join me for that. Hello again, and welcome back to our course on Access 2019. In this module, we're going to take a look at the Access workspace, and we're also going to delve into the backstage area. And really the aim of this module is really just to give you a tour around the Access workspace and get you familiar with some of the features and functionality. Now we're starting off again back at our start screen. You should be reasonably familiar with this now. And if you look at what we're looking at here, so underneath Recent, our list of databases is getting ever longer. Each time we go in, we have a new database that we've created listed there. And eventually this list will start to get so long that databases will drop off the bottom of that list. So it will be a little bit harder for you to find recently used databases. 
Now, one way that you can get around that, and I did mention this in an earlier module, is to pin databases that you use frequently. So for example, if I hover over Esprit de Tour, you can see that I get this little pin icon. If I hover over, it says pin this item to the list. Now, I'm not going to do that at this moment, but if I was to do that, what would happen is that Esprit de Tour would then always be available underneath this pinned tab just here. So again, it's just a really quick way of being able to access those databases you use frequently so that they don't drop off the bottom of the list. Now, what we're actually going to do first is that we're going to go back into our contacts database. So I'm going to double click to open contacts. Again, I'm going to close down this welcome screen and we're just going to do a quick tour of some of the main features of the workspace, just in case you're not familiar with them. Now, I will say that if you are very familiar with Microsoft products, so maybe something like Excel or Word or PowerPoint, particularly in the later versions, 2016, 2019, even 2013, then you might be able to skip over this module. If you're not familiar with those versions, or if you just like a refresher, then stick with me because that's what we're going to go through now. So starting at the top here, we have what we call a ribbon and ribbons are organized onto different tabs. So you can see here, I currently have the home tab selected. We have a create tab. We have an external data tab, database tools and help. So each of these tabs contains what we call a ribbon and a ribbon is this list of commands or different groups of commands running horizontally across the top of your workspace. And these tabs will change depending on what exactly it is that you're doing at any given time. So we do have something called contextual tabs or contextual ribbons. And those are ribbons which only appear when they are needed. So if I'm doing something to do with a table, it might be that I get at the top here a table tools ribbon, which I can't currently see because I don't need it. So just be aware of that. These tabs aren't fixed. They will change depending on what it is that you're doing. But these ones you can see now are the standard tabs for access. And on each tab, we have groups. And within those groups, we have commands. Something else we also have is if you glance above those tabs, we have something called the quick access toolbar. And it's right here, right in the top left hand corner. And currently when I hover over my quick access toolbar, I can see a save icon. I can see undo and I can see redo. And I also have a little drop down up here, which will allow me to customize that quick access toolbar. Now, the quick access toolbar will either be right at the top of the screen or if you prefer, you can display it underneath your ribbon. And I actually prefer to have it underneath the ribbon. So I'm going to select show below the ribbon to move it down here. I just find that's a little bit easier for me to see. Now, what the quick access toolbar is, is it's somewhere where you can add commands that you use frequently so that they're easy to access. So you're not hunting around through the different tabs and ribbons for a particular command. And you can customize this until your heart's content and you can access pretty much every single command that's available in access to add it to your quick access toolbar. And I'm really going to cover how you can customize this quick access toolbar in a later module. So just hold that thought for now. Let's jump right down to the bottom. So right down here, we have what we call our status bar. And this status bar can also be customized. So if I right click my mouse on the status bar, you'll see that I have lots and lots of different things ticked. And this is really informational for you. So for example, I've got caps lock ticked which means that when I turn my caps lock on, you can see in the status bar, it tells me that I have caps lock on. So that can be really very useful. I'm just gonna turn my caps lock off and you'll see that that disappears. So there's lots of pieces of information that you can choose to display in that status bar at the bottom, just by either checking or unchecking in that customized status bar menu. Now let's move on to this navigation panel that we have running down the left hand side. This is really what we call the nerve center of our database. It basically lists all of the objects that are available in your database and you can see that they're categorized. We have tables, queries, forms, reports, macros and modules. And these can be collapsed or expanded 
to see the information. So if you have quite a lot of information in this panel and you're only particularly interested in tables, you could collapse up all of the others just to make it a little bit easier for you to see. So you have those little chevrons in order to be able to do that. So these chevrons to collapse and expand particularly come into their own if you have a very large complex database where you might have hundreds and hundreds of objects. Now, most of the time, this navigation pane will be open, but if it's becoming a nuisance or you don't have any need for it at a particular time, you can click on the little chevrons at the top here just to kind of minimize that. It doesn't close it. You can still see navigation pane just there. And of course, you can click on those chevrons again to bring that navigation pane back. You can also change the width of it. So if I hover my mouse just over that divider, I can drag it out or I can drag it back in again. What you also have in here is a little search box. So it might be that you need to maybe search for a form or a report or a query, and you can do that just using this search facility at the top. So you can type in your search criteria, click on the magnifying glass, and it will find it in your navigation pane. And another thing you have in this navigation pane is this little drop down arrow. If I click it, it gives you a number of other options to help you find and deal with objects. Now in the main window that you can see, we have our contact list. And this looks a little bit like an Excel spreadsheet. It's not in fact a table, it is actually what we would call a form. And if you look in the navigation pane, we have contact list just here, which is what we're currently looking at. And in the contacts list, each row represents one line of data. So essentially, each contact that we add will occupy a row. Now, the other forms that we have here, welcome, that controls the welcome screen that comes up whenever we reopen our Access database. And we're going to take a quick look at contact details. Now, to open this form, if I right click on it, and I can select open. Now, alternatively, I could have just double clicked and that would also open the contact details form. So what this shows is all of the detail for one contact on one form. So you might use something like this in something like an application where you're going to ask someone to update their contact details. Now, both the contact list and the contact details are forms, but they're very different types of forms. You can see that when I open this contact details, it kind of opens in a new window and it looks like it's hovering over the top. So let me just close that down. And apart from opening a form, there are other options that you can go into. So for example, if I right click again on contact details, I have the option of going into design view and you can see straight away that this is a very different thing altogether. This is where I could go in to design that particular form so I can make changes to it essentially. So if I wanted to, I could go in and I could do things like uh, grab this little section here and I could move it around so I can just pick it up and I can drag it down and drop it so I can really change the design of that particular form. So forms are very different when you're in design mode to a form in what we call open mode or run mode. Now, once I've made my changes to my form and I'm happy with it, I can then close this form down by clicking on that little cross in the top right hand corner. And of course, it's going to ask me if I want to save the changes to the design of my form contact details. Now, in this case, I'm going to say no. I'm just going to close out of that. So the point I'm trying to make here is that sometimes we'll open forms to use them to add information into our database and sometimes we'll open them in design mode. So now I'm back to my contact list and again I'm going to very quickly just close contact list down. I'm going to click on the contact list form in the navigation pane. I'm going to right click and jump into that design view again. And again, you can see here, I can go in and I can make some changes to the actual design of that form. Let's close that down. 
Now, everything I've said there with regards to design view is equally true of all of the other objects. So it's true of reports. You can run or change the design of some reports. The same for queries, macros and tables. And we're going to look at all of those throughout this course. So let's move on now back to having a tour of our workspace. So we were looking at the ribbon tabs earlier, which we have running across the top. And to the left, you'll see that there is a tab that says file. Now, this isn't actually a ribbon, essentially. If we click on file, it takes us into what we call the backstage area. And this is where you'll find a lot of your what we would call administration tasks for your database. So we've already explored home, new and open previously. We're now in the info tab. And we're going to go into some of the options which we have in info a little bit later on. We have save as again, that's something that we've already utilized. We have print, which will allow us to print our database, select a printer or even print preview our database before we print it. And we have a close option. As we saw before, that will close down your current database. It won't close down access. And then right at the bottom, we have an account option. And this shows which account is currently being used for this copy of Access 2019. And it also shows me that I have OneDrive connected just here. On the right hand side, I have Office Updates. And it's always really important to make sure that your copy of Access is always up to date. So just be aware of that. And I can also do things in here, some more fun things like change my office background. I have numerous different things I could select and I could also change my office theme. So currently I have colorful, but I could go for dark gray if I wanted a completely different look. We also have black and that one is new for 2019 and we have white. So again, that's really personal preference. We then have a feedback tab which will allow you to send either good, bad or suggestions to Microsoft. And then finally, at the bottom, we have an options area and options is made up of a number of different pages with settings that make your copy of access work as you like it. And we're going to talk a lot more and explore some of these options later on. There's a whole host of features in here which will really allow you to set up access in a way that works for you. So we're going to come back to that a bit later. So that is the end of this section. In the next section, we're going to talk a little bit about online help and the new Tell Me feature. So please join me for that. Hello again, and welcome back to our course on Access 2019. In this module, we're going to be talking about online help and the Tell Me feature. Now, before I do, let's go back into our contacts database by double clicking. And we're going to deal with something that's probably been annoying you up until this point, which is this welcome screen. Now, it is a really useful screen, particularly if it's the first time that you're opening the database. But if you're just closing and reopening fairly frequently, it can get a little bit annoying to have to keep coming in and closing down this welcome screen. So let's look at how we can deal with that first of all. So I'm going to close it down and I'm going to go over to my navigation pane and underneath tables, I'm going to go to settings. And when you double click on settings, you'll see that there is one row in this table. And the second column says show welcome screen. If I was to make that a little bit bigger or oh, sorry, show welcome. And you can see that it has a tick in that box. So if I go in and just uncheck this, the next time I open this database, that welcome screen won't be shown. So I'm going to close down this settings table and I'm going to say yes. And I'm also going to close down this contact list form. So now what I want to discuss is help in Access 2019 and all of the help is located online. So that means that you're going to need an active Internet connection in order to be able to access help. 
Now the quickest way to access help in Access 2019 is to press the F1 key on your keyboard and you'll see you then get this pane on the right hand side where you can go in and you can browse through the different categories or you can type in your search criteria, so what it is that you require help on, into that field that's flashing at the top. Now if I wanted to browse, I could click on, for example, Get Started, and it will go through and I have a little video there of how to create a database in Access. And it's worth noting that you can pull this panel out, so if you're finding it quite small, if you hover your mouse over the top until you get that double-headed cursor, you can drag the panel out like so, and you can also resize it to make that a little bit bigger. If I want to go back to my category list, I have a little arrow just here, which will take me back to those main categories. And just to reiterate the point that I mentioned before, this help is online, so you do require an active internet connection. Now, a good place to start might be uh, to find out a little bit more about some of the new features in Access 2019. So I could go up to my uh, search bar at the top here and type in what's new in Access 2019 and press the Enter key. And I can see that the top link there is probably going to be quite useful to me. So let's have a little click. We can go through and we can look at all of the new features that have been added to Access since the last version. So that's a really, really useful thing. And I would say if you are new to Access 2019, definitely go into help and definitely have a look through this because it's really going to give you a good idea of some of the new stuff that you can expect. So again, let's click on the back arrow to go back to our menu. And if you just want to browse through these categories, you can. So if I click on Tables, you can see I have a whole host of other links. So again, it really depends what you're looking for help on. So really do utilize that search facility in Help at the top. So that's your online help. By pressing the F1 key on your keyboard, you can access that. So let's just close this down for the time being. I want to now talk to you about something called Contextual Help. So what that means is that if you're doing something and you access help, you can access it at a point that is relevant to what you're doing. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to open the contact list form. So I'm going to go to File, I'm going to go to Open, and we're going to select Contacts. Now, one thing you may already be familiar with if you've used other Microsoft applications is the notion of contextual help. And whilst contextual help is available in Access 2019, it's not as, shall we say, prevalent as it was in some of the previous versions. But what contextual help essentially means is that if you're doing something and you need help, you access it at the point that is relevant to what you're doing. So for example, I've opened my contact list form and I'm going to go up and look at the ribbon and I'm going to go to this text formatting group at the end of the home ribbon and just click the down arrow, which is going to take me into my data sheet formatting options. So if I was in here and I decided that I needed help on data sheet formatting specifically, you'll see that I have the little question mark in the top bar just here. And when I hover over, it says help. So if I click on it, now what you'll see here is that when I've clicked on that, it's basically taken me to a web browser and it's taken me to that standard help homepage. So let's just close that down and jump back to access, close out of here. And this time I'm going to go to a different part of access. So let's go to database tools and I'm going to click on relationships and I'm going to click on the question mark again. And this time it takes me to help that is relevant to the task I will be performing. So the reason why I've shown you those two different examples is really just to illustrate the fact that it is a little bit patchy and inconsistent with regards to if you're going to go to a help page that's specifically directed at the thing you're trying to do, or if it's just going to take you to that standard help homepage. Of course, remember, if you do go to that standard home page, you can just type into the search box exactly what it is that you're looking for. But just be aware that it can be a little bit flaky in that regard. 
Finally, I want to talk to you about the new Tell Me feature in Office 2019. Now I say new, this was included in the previous version as well, so in Access 2016, and you'll find it up here. So it's next to your ribbons essentially, and it's this little kind of search box that says, tell me what you want to do. And as I hover over, you'll see there is a shortcut key of Alt plus Q. And it says, just start typing here to bring features to your fingertips and get help. So let's pretend that I have forgotten how to create a table. So I'm going to type in create table. And you'll see as I type, it tries to match it with actions or commands that are available in Microsoft Access 2019. So if I'm creating a new table, table design is really the command that I want. And I can see that I have it there. So if I click on it, it's going to take me into that particular option. Now it's also worth noting if we click back in tell me and type in create table again, I do also have access to further help from here as well. So again, whenever you type in some search terms, you'll get a list of actions that you can take. But then also at the bottom, you'll get a list of help topics. And if I just push that arrow out to the side, you can see I've got my help topics just there. So that's another way of kind of getting, getting into that contextual help. And I am just going to tidy this up and close down those tables that I no longer need. So those are the different ways that you can utilize help. Biggest thing to take away here is to quickly access help. Press the F1 key on your keyboard. That's the end of this section. I will see you in the next one where we'll be talking about the ribbon structure a little bit more. So I'll see you over there. Hello again, and welcome back to our course on Access 2019. In this module, we're going to be discussing the ribbon. Now, we already briefly took a look at the ribbon in a previous module, but I want to go into a little bit more detail now and also show you some useful shortcuts for navigating around and utilizing the ribbon. So the ribbon that you have in Access 2019 is pretty much similar to the other Microsoft applications. And this ribbon structure was introduced all the way back in Office 2007. And it was introduced to replace the menu system. If you can remember back that far, we used to have menus running across the top. You'd click and you'd get some drop down options. So now all of our commands are organized horizontally in what we call ribbons running across the top of your screen. And it makes it easier to locate and use your commands and settings. So your ribbon is this big bar, which you can see here at the top. And your commands are divided into different tabs. So I'm currently clicked on the Home tab and you can see the ribbon and all of the commands. We have Create, External Data, database tools, and finally, help. Now, these are the standard ribbons that you'll see when you open up Access 2019, but they aren't the only ribbons that you have access to. And again, I mentioned this in a previous module, you will see from time to time what we call contextual ribbons, which will appear as and when they are needed. Now, in order to move through your ribbons, you can just click on them as I did just then. Alternatively, if you have a scroll wheel on your mouse, you can just scroll. So I'm scrolling down and that will move me across those ribbons or scroll up to go back through them. Another alternative way of navigating through your ribbons and the commands on those ribbons is to press the Alt key on your keyboard. And what you'll see there is I get some um, shortcut keys, essentially, which will allow me to navigate using my keyboard only. So, for example, if I wanted to go to the Create tab, I can press C and it will jump me across to there. And then I get a whole new set of shortcut keys that I can use to access whichever command I want. If I want to get rid of them, I just press Alt again and it will take me back to my normal mode. Now on each tab, you'll see that we have different groups. So again, I'm on the create ribbon and you can see the different groups we have. The group names are listed at the bottom. So we have templates, tables, queries, forms, reports, and macros and codes.
And you can see that these are separated by a vertical dividing line. So this just groups together commands which kind of essentially belong together, just to make it a little bit more organized and easy for you to see. Now I'm going to jump back across to the home ribbon for a moment. Now I will say that what you're seeing on my screen might differ slightly on yours, and it all depends on your screen resolution. So at the moment, because I have quite a large screen resolution, I can see all of my groups and all of my commands. However, if yours is a little bit more squashed up, you might see that these commands will be rearranged ever so slightly. So don't worry too much if yours looks slightly different to mine. It could be just down to the screen resolution or screen size that you're using. Another thing to point out is if we look at this clipboard group as an example, you can see here within this group that the cut, copy and format painter are currently greyed out, which means that they're not available for me to use at this time. Now that's because I can't actually use these. So I haven't clicked anywhere in order to be able to use cut, copy or format painter. If I click in my contact list database, you should have seen some more of these commands in other groups became active because I can now use them. If I had some text in this cell where I'm currently clicked, I would be able to highlight it and then cut would become available. But because I have nothing highlighted at the moment, I don't have my cut option available. The same thing for copy and the same thing for format painter. So these will be deactivated when you can't use them or don't need them and activated when they are available. Now, some controls on the ribbon will bring up a dialog box. So for example, let's go to this big group at the end here, the text formatting group. I have numerous different options here for text formatting. A lot of these you're probably fairly familiar with, such as bold, italic, underline, etc. But if you look in the corner, we have this little sort of diagonal arrow, and that's our dialogue launcher. So if I click it, you'll see that I get a whole host of other options underneath there as well. So watch out for those little launchers in the bottom corner, because it will normally give you more options or some other advanced options. Now, I mentioned earlier, and I've mentioned a couple of times in the course so far, these contextual ribbons, which only appear when they're needed. So currently, I just have these five tabs at the top, Home, Create, External Data, Database Tools, and Help. Now, I'm going to switch into a different view. I'm going to go into the Design view for the Contact Details form. So I'm going to right click on my form and I'm going to go into Design View. And now that I've changed my view and I'm in design mode, if you look up at your ribbons, you'll see what I mean. I now have this large ribbon that says Form Design Tools and it has three sub ribbons, Design, Arrange and Format. And these have appeared because I've gone into design view. So these are now relevant buttons that I can use. So there's lots of controls in here, which I can add to my form. Remember, in this view, I'm designing or changing the layout of my form. And there's lots of different options that I can add. The point I want you to take away here is that you will see these contextual ribbons appear from time to time as and when they're needed. So a lot of these commands weren't relevant or weren't useful to me before I went into design view, which is why I didn't see all of these form design tools. So in a way, it's Microsoft's way of decluttering the screen for you, only presenting you with options as and when you need them. So again, if you look at these two tabs, the two different forms that I have open. So I'm currently clicked on contact details. Now watch what happens to this contextual ribbon when I click on contact list. You can see it disappears because those tools are not needed in this particular form. Now one thing I will say about this ribbon is that it does take up a little bit of room on your screen. So if you're doing something and you don't particularly need to use your ribbon at that moment in time, or if you just want to temporarily hide the ribbon, you can do that. So if you go over to the right hand side, you'll see that you have an up arrow. And when I hover over, it says collapse the ribbon. Control F1 is the shortcut key for that. If I click it, it will just collapse that ribbon all the way up there. If I want to bring it back, all I need to do is click on one of the tabs. So if I click on Home, 
it brings that ribbon back. Now it's only temporary. You'll see that if I click back onto my uh, form, the ribbon disappears again. So if I now want to lock that ribbon back in place, I need to go over to the right hand side again and click on the push pin to lock that ribbon down once again. Now, of course, you can customize the ribbon to suit how you want to use it. And you would do that by going into file and going down to options. And you'll see in there you have an option or you have a menu item for customizing the ribbon. And this will allow you to remove groups and commands from your ribbons or even create new tabs, new groups, so on and so forth. Now, I'm not going to go into detail as to how you do this. That might be something which you can look up if you really want to learn how to customize your ribbon and set it up for you. So I think I'm going to leave that as kind of a little piece of additional homework for you to do. But just be aware that if you do want to do that, this is where you would come to customize your ribbon. Now, another thing that you can customize, and again, we did mention this briefly earlier on, is your quick access toolbar. And that was this little toolbar which lurks underneath, or in some cases above, your ribbons. And I have a few commands on there at the moment. And in the next section, what we're gonna do is we're gonna take a look at how you can customize this quick access toolbar so that all of the commands you use frequently are super easy and quick to access. So that's enough about the ribbon. I will see you in the next section. Hello again, and welcome back to Access 2019. In this module, we're going to take a look at the Quick Access Toolbar. And I've pointed this out to you quite a few times so far in this course. But what I really want to show you in this module is just how you can customize it to suit your own needs. Now, as we've mentioned before, the Quick Access Toolbar, you'll either find it above your ribbon in the top left hand corner. But if you remember, I moved mine to below my ribbon so I can see it just here. And currently, I only have three commands on my Quick Access Toolbar. That is Save, Undo and Redo. Now, if I click the drop down on the end there, this pulls up the customized quick access toolbar menu. And you can see that the commands that I currently have on my quick access toolbar or QAT for short are currently ticked. So save, undo and redo. And I have a list of 10 or so there, most popular commands that I could very quickly add to my quick access toolbar just by selecting them and essentially putting a tick next to them. So, for example, if I wanted to add a spell check, I could click on spelling to add that to my quick access toolbar. And it just makes it a lot easier for me to find when I need it. Now, aside from these standard few that we have listed, you can actually add any command that's available within access to your quick access toolbar. And you do that by going down to more commands. Now, this should jump you across to a fairly familiar area. Once again, this is something we've been into a couple of times already. And this is essentially your access options again. And it's taking you directly to that quick access toolbar area. Now, what you have at the top is you have an option of what you can choose. So currently, I have popular commands displayed in this list below. And it's worth noting when you are searching for a particular command that these lists are displayed in alphabetical order, which does make it a little bit easier. So this is what Access determines to be the most popular commands. However, you can change that if we click the drop down. You can select to look at commands that are not on the ribbon, all commands, macros, or you can go by whichever tab you think the command is on. In general, I'm never really sure which tab the option I'm looking for is on, so I generally go for all commands. And that will list absolutely every command that's available in Access in alphabetical order. So once you have your list on the left hand side, what you have on the right hand side is essentially your quick access toolbar. So you can see there the commands that I currently have on my QAT save, undo, redo, and spelling, which was the last one that I added. So I'm gonna go through this list and I'm gonna add, let's go for an old favorite. I'm gonna add bold, which is just there. So I select it and click on the add button in the middle and it will add it to my list. 
Let's add another one whilst we're here. Let's go for relationships. So let's click on that one and add to the list. Now, once I've got these on my quick access toolbar, I can rearrange the order as well. So if I don't particularly like that order, I can choose to move relationships using these up and down arrows on the right hand side. So I'm going to move relationships down to the end. I'm going to move bold down like so. Now, another thing that's quite useful sometimes is if you want to kind of separate your icons on the quick access toolbar into groups. So much like on our ribbons, we have those vertical divider lines. You can do the same on the quick access toolbar by adding a separator and separator will always be listed at the top of the list. And you can add as many of these as you like. So I'm going to click add. Let's add a couple. And I can then choose where I want those separators to live. So I'm going to select the first one. I'm going to move it up. I'm going to add it in there and then I'm going to take the second one and I'm going to add it like so. I'm going to click on OK. And it says you must close and reopen the current database for the specified option to take effect. Now, this is different to all the other Microsoft applications. In Excel or Word or PowerPoint, when you click on OK, it will just add those icons to your quick access toolbar. But access works slightly differently. I need to click on OK. I'm going to close my current database. I'm going to close this one again and you can see that it's added those on. So let me just go in and reopen my contact list. And I can now see there is my quick access toolbar and you can also see those separator lines that we've put in, which just makes it a little bit easier to see and group together different commands. Finally, there is another way that you can add commands onto your quick access toolbar and that is simply by selecting them. So again, if I'm on the home ribbon and maybe I decide that I want to add the filter command to my quick access toolbar, I can right click and select add to quick access toolbar and you can now see there I have my filter. So very simple, but very important to know how to customize that QAT. Now we've got our heads around that, we can move on to the next module, which is going to be all about contextual menus. So I'll see you over there. Hello again, this is Deb and welcome back to our course on Access 2019. In this very short module, we're going to be talking about contextual menus. So apart from using the ribbon to access commands and controls, you can right click and take a look at a contextual menu instead. And sometimes that's a little bit easier or a little bit more convenient than having to go up to the ribbons and look for the option that you need. So the idea behind contextual menus is that whatever you right click on, it will bring you up a menu that's relevant or contains relevant commands to whatever it is that you're currently clicked on. So what do I mean by that? Well, let's go over to our navigation pane. You can currently see that I've got contact list highlighted under my forms because that's what I currently have open. Now, if I was to right click my mouse on contact list, you can see I get a list of relevant options. And this is what we call a contextual menu. And we've been in here before when we've switched to design view. So you can see we have some other options in there. I can open this particular form. I can switch between different views. I can export it, rename it, hide it, delete, cut, copy, and also view the properties. So it's a lot easier for me to just quickly right click down here, then go up to the ribbon and look for the particular option that I need. So that is one form of a contextual menu. The same applies if I was working actually in this form. So if I was to click in a field such as email address and right click, you'll see I get a different contextual menu. It's showing me options which are now relevant to where I'm clicked. So in this case, I have cut, copy, paste. I can sort. So if I had information in here, I could sort it A to Z or Z to A. I can filter on some text and I can do some other sorts as well or searches. So just bear in mind that it really depends where you're clicked as to what contextual menu you will get. But it is always worth doing a right click and seeing if the option you need is to hand. 
And it really is as simple as that. As I said, this was a very, very short module, but one that was important for you to understand because it can greatly increase your efficiency and improve how you move around the application. In the next module, we are going to talk about how we can use the status bar. So please join me over there. Hello again and welcome back to our course on Access 2019. In this module, we're going to be taking a look at the status bar. Now, the status bar might seem a, a fairly innocuous thing to spend quite a bit of time on, but it's actually really, really helpful. Now, first of all, your status bar is this sort of blank looking bar which runs across the bottom of the workspace. So you can see over on the left hand side, it says datasheet view. And then we have a few other things down here. So num lock filtered, and then we have our different views. So let's look at that in a little bit more detail. Now, currently I have the form contact list open. And if I look up at the home tab, the first group that I have there is called views. And you can see that it has a drop down arrow. And this just enables me to switch between all the different views. So we're familiar with design view, which we've been in before. We're currently in form view as that's highlighted in gray. And we also have a layout view, which we could use as well. Now, those three buttons correspond to buttons that we have on the bottom right hand end of the status bar. So again, if you cast your eyes all the way down to the bottom, you can see that currently I have form view selected. And there I can switch to layout and there I can switch to design view. So you have the options in two different places on the status bar and also on your home ribbon. Now, if we right click on the status bar, again, we came into this a little bit earlier on. You have some options which will allow you to customize the type of information that's shown on your status bar, which can be very useful. So the ones that are currently ticked are the ones that are currently turned on. And you can go in and you can turn these off and on to your heart's content. So, so I could untick caps lock, for example. So that means that when I have caps lock on, so if I press caps lock on my keyboard, it's not going to tell me in the status bar that I have caps lock on. If I was to turn that back on, you can see that now it's telling me I have caps lock on. I'm going to press caps lock again on my keyboard just to turn that off. So it's really an informational area that you can customize. So let's look at this in a different way. Looking at this contacts list, let's suppose that I have hundreds of contacts and I only want to see the contacts with a specific job title. So I could go to the job title heading. I could go down to text filters and I could say equals manager. And click on OK. So now that list is filtered on managers. Now I know I don't have anything in here, but it still has a filter applied to this column. And you can see the little filter up there. And what you'll also see is down in the status bar, it's telling me that it's filtered. And that's because when I right click, I have that filtered option turned on. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to clear that filter. And you can see that the word filtered has now disappeared from that bottom status bar. So it's really an informational area that can be pretty useful. And remember that information will only appear when there is actually something to show. So now that I don't have this column filtered, it's not showing me that information. So it is worth going in and either ticking or unticking the information that you think you might be interested in seeing in your status bar. Again, just to increase and improve your efficiency and the way that you're working with access. That's pretty much it. That's all I wanted to show you on the status bar. In the next module, we're going to be taking a look at keyboard shortcuts. So I will see you over there. Hello there and welcome back to our course on Access 2019. In this module, we're going to take a look at the use of keyboard shortcuts. 
Now, keyboard shortcuts are a great way of moving efficiently and working efficiently within Access. And some people actually prefer to use keyboard shortcuts as opposed to a mouse. Now, that might be just down to personal preference, or it might be that they have some kind of physical or physiological reason why they need to use a keyboard as opposed to a mouse. Now, I would say that if you don't use the keyboard much and you're perfectly happy with working with the mouse, then you can skip this section. But I would say that I use keyboard shortcuts a lot, but I don't tend to use them when I'm recording a video such as this one for demonstration. Mainly for the reason that if I'm using keyboard shortcuts when I'm working in Access, you can't actually see when I'm using them. So I prefer to use the mouse because it's easier for you to see what I'm doing that way. However, in my daily working life, I do use quite a number of shortcuts, not only in Access, but across all of the Microsoft applications. And I would say that most people probably have in general, maybe seven to 10 that they use all the time. So things like, cut, copy, and paste, so control X, control C, control V, and also maybe save, control S, print, control P. People generally have their favorite shortcuts that they utilize all the time. And I will say there are so many shortcuts in Access that you're never gonna remember all of them off the top of your head. However, there is a way to find out the keyboard shortcut for your commands. So for example, if I hover over on the home ribbon, the copy button, you'll see there it's telling me that control C is the keyboard shortcut for that particular command. If I hover over spelling, you can see that F7 is the shortcut key for that. So some of these commands do have that useful screen tip, which will allow you to see what the keyboard shortcut is. However, if you hover over some other commands, so let's hover over totals, you'll see the screen tip literally just says totals. It doesn't show me the keyboard shortcut. So it's worth remembering that not every command has a keyboard shortcut. However, if you do want to see a definitive list, you can find a list of all of the shortcuts available within help. So I'm gonna press F1 to pull up my help, and I could in help search for keyboard shortcuts. And you can see here the first link there is keyboard shortcuts for access and I can then pull it up and it goes through the whole list in a table. So that might be something which you want to print out, have near you so that you have access to all of those as and when you need them. I'm just going to close that down. And also remember, as we discussed before, if you press the Alt key, that's going to pull up the shortcuts that you can use to jump between your ribbons. And when you jump across to a new ribbon, you can then select whichever command it is that you need, again, using entirely your keyboard. So don't forget that you have the Alt option there as well. That's about it on keyboard shortcuts. In the next module, we're going to discuss key tips. So I'll see you over there. Hello again and welcome back to our course on Access 2019. In this module, I just want to briefly go into a little bit more detail about those key tips. Now in the previous module, we talked a lot about keyboard shortcuts and I referred you to the definitive list of shortcuts in the help section. And one keyboard shortcut that I pointed out was F7 for spelling. So if we remember on the home ribbon, we have spelling and if I hover over it, you can see the shortcut key is F7. So if I now press F7 on my keyboard, I have no data in here. So obviously it's gone through and it's told me that the spelling check is complete, but at least I know that that F7 key is actually working and is actually doing that spell check. I also highlighted to you that some commands such as totals up here don't have a keyboard shortcut assigned to them. And many commands in Access 2019 don't have a shortcut. So that alternative facility then becomes really important. And that is what we call key tips. So again, if we press the Alt key, it lets us access all of our tabs, our ribbons, and the associated commands on those tabs using our keyboard. So if this time, if I press X, that should jump me to the external data tab. 
which it does. And now I have a whole new set of key tips to choose from. So if I wanted to look at how to export to Excel, I could press X again, and that will take me into my export to Excel wizard. So, so far I haven't had to touch my mouse at all, which can be very useful for people who have disabilities, for people who have some kind of physiological problem, or even if you just prefer to navigate and find it more efficient using your keyboard. I know a lot of people who really do prefer to keep their hands on the keyboard the entire time as opposed to constantly using the mouse. So this is a great option for all of those groups of people. Now, it is worth pointing out that when you get to the command or setting or control, it doesn't necessarily mean that you can do everything using the keyboard, but you can get pretty much most of the way. So if I was on this screen here, now, you might think that I would have to use my mouse, but if I press the tab key, can you see that browse is now highlighted? I could then press enter to select browse, and then maybe I can use my arrow keys to select a file. If I press tab again, it moves me to the next field, and I could press my down arrow, and I can select my option by pressing enter. And I can carry on pressing tab, and it will take me through all my different options. So now I'm on OK and I can hit enter if I wanted to. So I can pretty much go most of the way using my keyboard, but just be aware that maybe some occasions where you will have to use your mouse, but using a combination of uh, down and up arrows, enter key, tab, you can pretty much tab your way through and select most things. Now I'm just gonna cancel out of there. And again, it's worth remembering if you are in alt mode where you have your keyboard shortcuts up here or your key tips, I should say, press alt again to come out. Alternatively, you can press the escape key and that will also get rid of those key tips. So that's it. I just wanted to give you a little bit more detail on those key tips because it is important for a number of different groups of people. In the next module, we're going to be taking a look at databases and language options. So please join me for that. Hello again and welcome back to our course on Access 2019. In this module, we're going to take a look at the Access Options and many aspects of Access Options will allow you to essentially customise the way that you use Access. And what I want to do really is just highlight to you some of the ones that I think are useful and also some of the ones that are, are pretty important to you as well. And I would always say before you kind of start using Access or even as you're using it, that you go into options and you really review how you have everything set to make sure it's set in the way that's best for you and how you like to work. And options are something that we'll revisit quite a lot throughout the entirety of this course. So let's jump into our options. We're going to jump up to our file tab. And right at the bottom, we have options. And this should look reasonably familiar to you. We have been in here before when we've been looking at how we can customize the quick access toolbar and also how we can customize the ribbon as well. Now we're going to start up here on the general tab. Now this isn't the most important tab out of all of them, but it is worth taking a look in here and I'll just highlight a few things which I think are particularly useful. So the first thing here is that I have enable live preview ticked. So let me show you what that live preview actually means. I'm going to cancel out of this screen and what I'm going to do is I'm going to go to my contact list form I'm going to go up to my form layout tools contextual ribbon and jump into the design tab and I'm going to head over to themes. Now what you'll see here is I get a list of different color themes that I can apply to my form and themes really control the styling of your form essentially. So that might be fonts, colors, styles, things like that. Now because I have live preview enabled, you'll see that when I hover over any of these in this list, you can actually see it changing on my form. And that is what we call a live preview. And I actually really like this feature because sometimes maybe I'm not sure which one I want to use. So it allows me to kind of go through all of my options before I actually select one. So with that in mind, let's jump back to file 
and down to options again. And this time I'm going to turn off that live preview and click on OK. And now you'll see that when I go into themes and I hover over, it doesn't change at all. So that setting really is a personal preference. As I said, I actually really like to have this feature turned on. And of course, Live Preview doesn't just apply to themes. It will apply to things like fonts, table styles, all of those kinds of things as well. So you can turn that off or on, whichever suits you best. Now, another thing is this screen tip style. And you can see that I have mine set to show feature descriptions in screen tips. So again, let's just remind ourselves what we mean by a screen tip. I'm going to cancel out of here. I'm going to hover over. Let's do themes again to keep it consistent. And you can see when I hover over that command, I get a little pop up box or a screen tip with the title, which says themes. And then I get a description of what that command is actually going to do. So that is the screen tip. Now, again, I find these quite useful because sometimes if you're not sure what something does, that can be quite a helpful description. But I do know that some people find them a little bit annoying, a little bit distracting, and sometimes they can kind of cover up what you're trying to work on below. So a lot of people do like to turn these off. So again, that is personal preference, but that is basically what we have in this options area here. I can choose to show feature descriptions in screen tips, don't show feature descriptions. So that would just give me the title of themes or I can choose to turn them off entirely. So again, that's another feature that you can customize to your liking. And in this case, I'm going to keep all of mine as they were. I'm going to enable that live preview once again. So let's move down now to this creating databases section. And you want to make sure that you have the default file format for new blank databases set correctly. And you have numerous options in this drop down. So it really does depend which version you are using. Now, you may have noticed that mine's set to access 2007 to 2016, and this is a 2019 course. It doesn't appear that Microsoft have added that into this drop down for some reason. But I would say that the version I'm using, so 2019, is pretty much exactly the same as Access 2016. So I have mine set to that latest version. So just make sure you go in there and check it set correctly for your version. Underneath that, I then have a default database folder. And you can see that this is set to my local drives, to my documents folder. And this is where all of your new databases will be created by default. Now, obviously, you can change that by clicking on the browse. If you have a specific location where you want to save your databases, please do feel free to go in there and change that as well. And then underneath that, we have this new database sort order. So by default, a new database is assigned a sort order and I have mine set to general legacy and your default really needs to be set according to language. So my default is set to English. Um, if you're using a different language, you may need to use a different sort order. So this is related to how things get sorted in your tables and in your databases. So you want to make sure that that is actually relevant to the language that you're using. So again, if you're using something other than English, then you might want to come in here and select your language from the list. And then finally, at the bottom, we have a section to personalize your copy of Microsoft Office. And you can see there it has my username and my initials. So this means that this is a copy of Microsoft Office that's registered to me. And if I was doing anything such as uh, comments and things like that, it would come up with my name and it will take that information from this section of options. I can also choose to set an office background if I wanted to. So lots of different options in there for me. And also, again, as we saw previously, you can set an office theme. So that is really down to personal taste and is really just about the look and feel of your copy of office. Now, there's really only a couple of other things I want to look at in this options page at the moment. So let's jump across to the second option down in this list, current database. So these are my settings for the current database. And you can see the application title at the top there. And this basically determines what is shown at the top of the workspace. So you can see at the moment, it says contact management database. Now, if I scroll down to the navigation section, I also have the option to switch off the navigation pane as well. 
Now you might be thinking, why on earth would I want to disable the navigation pane? Well, if you're sharing this database with someone else, if they come to use the database that you've created, you may want to switch off the navigation pane to restrict access. So to things like uh, deleting data or going into design mode, things like that. So it could be used as a kind of way to control the integrity of the database that you've created. So don't forget you have that option in there as well. I'm now going to jump down to the language area. And all you need to do in here is make sure that you have the correct language set. So I use two languages when I'm creating courses. I use English United States, which is my current default. And I also use uh, English United Kingdom as well. And you can see both of my languages are listed there. Now I could add more languages if I wanted to. So if I click the drop down, I have a choice of many, many different languages. So I can just come in here, select whichever one I want to add, and then click that add button just there. And if I want to make a different language a default language, for example, if I wanted to switch my default to English United Kingdom, I can just select it and click on the set as default button at the side. Now we've already looked at the customize ribbon option and also the customize quick access toolbar. Add-ins we're not going to look at in this course and trust center is something that we're going to look at in a little bit more detail a bit later on. But for now, those are the only things I really wanted to point out in your access options. We're now going to start making some databases in the next section. So please join me for that. Hello there and welcome back to my course on Access 2019. In this module, we're going to take a look at how we can create a table and field. So essentially how we can create our first working database. Now, the main example will be the Tor database and we created a starting point a little while ago and now we're going to add some content. Now, before we begin, there is one thing that I want to do just to make this look a little bit less messy, and that is deal with that big long title that we have running across the top of the screen. It doesn't look particularly tidy, and we have a lot of superfluous information in there, which we don't really need to see at this stage. So I'm going to change that title. And if you remember back to the last module when we were looking at access options, there was an area in there where we can go and make an amendment to this big long title. So let's jump back into our options by clicking on File and going down to Options. And I'm going to give this a more appropriate title. So in this application title box, I'm going to type in Esprit de Tour, Trips of a Lifetime, and click on OK. And there we go, that instantly looks a lot tidier. Now, the core of any database that you create is the data. And the data in modern databases is held in tables. And for this Tor database, we're going to have a number of different tables. And the first table will contain the details of our core trips. And when I say trip, what I mean is a trip is one entity and during the course of the year, we may run the trip several times and each instance of a trip, we're going to call a tour. So for example, a trip that we run all year round might run 15 or 20 times throughout the year. So that one trip will have many tours. And what I've done is I've put together an example for you of the information that we might want to keep about each trip. So I've put together an example of the information that we might want to keep about each trip. And you can see it there in this notepad file that I have on the screen. So each trip will have a code, GCA, and GCA is basically an abbreviation of the name of the trip. So in this case, Grand Canyon Family Rafting Adventure. And there are several types of trip, family, escorted, group, activity, and landscapes. The activity level for the trip is moderate, and the country this trip operates in is the USA. 
We then have a description of the trip, so just a couple of lines just there. And of course, later on, we might add more detail into this, such as a more detailed itinerary. But at the moment, we've just got a very brief description. The duration of this trip is eight days and the price range, excluding flights, is $3,080 to $3,112. So with this pricing, individual tours, so instances of the trip, the prices will vary depending on when the trip is and how much demand there is. So all of this info is going to be stored for this particular trip. Now, one particular part of the trip, the type, I'm not going to store in the trip table at the moment. And the reason for that will become apparent a bit later on. So I'm going to skip type and I'm going to set up everything else. Now, one or two things I want to highlight just here. What I'm going to do in a moment is I'm going to make a deliberate error and I'm going to correct it later on. So sometimes one of the best ways to do these things will happen later when you become more familiar with access. So let me give you an example of that. Look at the trip definition. So it says country USA. And you might say to yourself, well, surely some of the trips will go to more than one country. Shouldn't we have a list of countries that are visited on the trip? And the answer to that is yes, you should, but we're going to deal with that later on. So the main point I'm trying to get across here is that it's a good idea to try and get things as right as you can early on, but be aware that you may need to make changes as we go through creating this database. And sometimes changing things in database design can be quite hard. So some things are easy to change and some not quite so easy. You would have to go through and do what I would call a little bit of faffing around in order to get it how you want it. So just be aware of that as we move through. So just try and get everything as right as you can from the outset. So with all that in mind, let's create our first table. And this is the table that will hold the trip information. I'm going to go up to the Create tab and I'm going to click on the Table button. And you can see that this has been given a default name of table one. We can see that just lurking there on that tab. And table one opens in data sheet view. And again, remember that you can check your views right down in the bottom right hand corner. You can see that the one highlighted in gray is the one currently in use. So I can confirm there that I am in fact using data sheet view. Now, the other button we have in the bottom right hand corner is design view. And we did look at this earlier. So let me click on design view. Now, one thing that happens quite a lot when you're working on a table is that whenever you do something in terms of design or even creating the table, you'll be asked if you want to save. So I am actually going to go in and I'm going to save this table. Now, this is the trip table, so you might be tempted just to call it something like trip. Now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to follow a convention whereby the objects have a prefix which identifies the object. So in case of tables, the prefix is TBL. So I'm going to call this TBL trip, which identifies that as a table to me. Now, this might seem a little strange, but I might later on have maybe a form where I maintain trip info. But that would have a prefix of FRM trip. So I would know the difference between the table and the form. So now I'm in design view for the trip table. And in design view, I can see the fields that make up the table. So by default, I have a single field. It has a field name of ID. It has a data type of auto number. And I can put a description in. Now, the description I'm going to put in here is unique trip ID. And this is not the same as the trip code. The unique trip ID is a unique identifier and it's a very important part of the table. The importance of that unique ID is best explained in an example. So let's suppose I set up this Grand Canyon trip and it runs for a few years, and then we decide to drop it. If then later we create a different trip with the code GCA, we would need to identify it, and we do that using the unique ID. 
And very often unique IDs are not visible to the people that are using your table or your form or your database. They are more used in the back end. And unique IDs can be searched on for trips, things like that. So these numbers will always be unique and they're very important when you're setting up any kind of trip. Now, before we add fields to the table, let's close this property sheet on the right just by clicking on the X, which gives us a little bit more room. Now, let's add a second field. Now, our second field, if we refer back to our notepad, is going to be this first line in our trip information, so trip code. So let's add in a second field. So this is where I'm going to list that trip code. So I'm going to say uh, code as the field name. Now the default data type is short text. And you'll see that there are many different data types that we can work with. And we're gonna go through some of these as we move through the course. Now in description, I'm just gonna type in three character trip code. And with this row selected, you can see the properties of that field in the lower half of the screen. So in the lower half, we have this section here called field properties. And if you look at that first section there where it says field size, we have the number there of 255. And what that means is that we can have a maximum of 255 characters input into this. Now, I doubt very much that I would ever have a trip code that's 255 characters long. So we can change this. And I know that all of my trip codes are going to be a maximum of three characters long, so like GCA. So I'm gonna change that to three, which will kind of restrict the amount of characters to three characters only that you can enter into that specific field. Now, a lot of these other properties we're gonna come back to, but there are a couple that I would like to point out. So just here where it says required, and it's currently set to no. So what this is saying currently is that in order to store a trip, this table doesn't need a code. Now, that's not correct. I want to make sure that in order to store this trip, every trip has a code. So I'm gonna click the drop down at the end and change that to yes, a code is required to store this information. Then underneath that, we have allow zero length. So again, this is set to yes. So what that essentially means is that the code can be zero characters in length. Now, again, that's not what I want. So I'm going to select the drop down and select no. And finally, we have index. Now, is this field going to be indexed yes or no? And I'm going to explain a little bit more about indexing at the start of the next module. For now, the answer is yes but the trip code cannot be duplicated. So let's just change that to yes, no duplicates. So now I basically have the definition of the second field in my trip table. We're going to be going into this in more detail in the next module, so please join me for that. Hello again, this is Deb and welcome back to our course on Access 2019. In the preceding section, we started work on creating our trip table for the Esprit de Tour travel company. And I have a few things that I want to point out before we move on, and that's related to indexing and keys. So as the content of the database grows, as the people are using the database, it can take longer to find what you need in a database. So really here, what I'm referring to is searching. So if you think about it, if you're going to book a trip, so maybe you're on a website and you want to book a trip, think about the things that you generally tend to search for when you're looking for a trip on a website. It might be that you search by a particular place name or trip type, or maybe you search by activity level. So if you want a particularly active holiday, you might search for trips that are active, or you might be more interested in the price of the holiday. So this is where indexing comes in, and indexing really improves performance when searching. So the last field we added was a code field. If someone wants to find this information about the trip and the code is not indexed, Access has to read through all of the trips in the trip table to find that specific code. 
However, if you do index the field, it means that access can essentially go straight to the trip with this code. So it's a lot quicker and it definitely improves performance as access isn't having to churn through loads and loads of trip codes searching. It can go directly there if you've indexed the field. And there's always a downside to these things sometimes. And the downside here is that in order to maintain these indexes, as data gets uh, modified or changed, this process tends to slow down the maintenance process, as in maintaining the data. And you'll see down in the bottom right hand corner, it shows a pop up about indexes. So it says an index speeds up searches and sorting on the field, but may slow updates. Selecting yes, no duplicates prohibits duplicate values in the field. Press F1 for help on index fields. So if you do want to read a little bit more, definitely jump into that help file and have a little bit more of a read on indexing. Now, you might be thinking to yourself, how do I decide if a field that I add needs to be indexed? And there are some technical considerations, but there are also business considerations. So for example, we've indexed the code and that's because it's a very important identifier. So that would be the sort of thing that you would want to index. An example of something you probably wouldn't want to index would be the description. So not many people would jump onto a website and search for a trip by its description. They're more likely to use maybe the code or the trip name or the price or something along those lines. So really think about that and it will determine whether you need to index that field or not. Now, the other thing to point out here is in the ID field. So I'm going to click on the ID field. And I don't know if you can see in this first column here, there's a little key symbol. And if you glance up at the table tools design ribbon, you can see that we have primary key highlighted in gray. So what that means is whatever the ID is, it's the main unique way that we identify a record in this table. Now let's move on a little bit and talk a little bit more about these views. So we're currently in design view and you can see that we have a contextual tab up here. So table tools and design, and that contains all of our commands. And some of these controls we're going to look at later on. But one of them that I want to draw your attention to is this property sheet. So if I click that, you can see I get that pane appear on the right hand side. I want you to note also that to the left of this button, we have some commands for inserting rows and also deleting rows. And I showed you earlier how you can switch to data sheet view. There's always a couple of ways to do these things. So if I jump across to this views drop down, I'm going to switch to data sheet view. And remember, we spoke earlier that whenever you make any changes, it's going to ask you to save. So I'm going to click yes to save. And I've now switched to data sheet view. So now that I'm in a different view, if I glance up at my ribbons again, you'll see that I have different contextual tabs now. So I still have table tools, but this time I have a fields tab and a table tab. Now, the reason that I get different tabs when I'm in datasheet view is that in general, datasheet view is what you would go into to make changes, to add fields, things like that. Whereas in design view, we're really controlling the overall design of our table. So different things, you'll get different tabs. So you can see here in datasheet view, we now have those two fields. So we have ID and code, which is the one that we just set up. Now, if I wanted to add a third field, I could go across to where it says click to add. I can right click and I can select my data type. So I'm going to say short text and I'm going to call this field trip name. So essentially, I've now defined another field. Let's switch back to design view now. So I'm going to use my button in the bottom right hand corner. And you can see now there is my trip name. So I'm going to want to define some properties for my field. So I'm going to click on it. I can see my data type is short text, which I'm fine with. And if I look down in my field properties, again, field size, 255 characters. Now that should be plenty for a trip. So I'm just going to leave that. Do we require a name? Well, yes, we do. Every trip must have a name. So I'm going to change that to yes. 
Do we allow a zero length name? Well, that's going to be no. And do we want to index this particular field? Now, in this case, I'm going to say no, because in general, you wouldn't index text fields. Normally, if you want to find a trip with a particular name, you would expect Access to go through the trips and find that particular one. So we're going to say no to indexed. So those are the basic settings for trip name. What I'm going to do now is put in a description. And that's my field set up. Let's jump back to Datasheet view. And of course, I'm going to save my changes by clicking yes. And now we have three fields in the trip table. So hopefully by now you can see a pattern of setting up fields in the table. Now, one thing that we haven't done is add any data. And I'm going to add a dummy trip now to show you some of the things you need to be aware of. So each row is essentially a record in our table. So in our case, a trip. And we have a row here with a star and it says new. So that indicates that if I start typing in this particular row, I'm going to be creating a new trip. So let's set up a code for a new trip. So my code for this one is going to be LEX. So this trip is going to be called Louisiana. Explorer. And if you don't have enough room, you can drag this column in and out to make it wider or narrower. Now also note that I have a little pen icon in the farthest most left column. And that just indicates that this record is the one that I'm currently working on. Now this doesn't have all of the information that we need, but it's a very good start. So now we have three fields defined and I've added a row of data. In the next section, we're going to be adding more fields. So please join me for that. Hello again, and welcome back to our course on Access 2019. In this module, we're going to continue setting up the trip table and particularly focusing on the next field, which is activity level. So the key difference between activity level and the field so far is that activity level is going to offer up a number of options. So again, if we refer back to our notepad file, we can see here activity level for this particular trip is moderate but we might have numerous different activity levels. So we might have moderate, active, leisurely, anything along those lines. So we're going to need to set up something which will allow us to select multiple options. So in this case, we're going to set up three different options, but you could have 20, 50, 100, as many as you like. So let's first give our field a name. So I'm gonna call this activity level. I'm going to tab to get across to data type. Now this time from the drop down, I'm going to go all the way down to the bottom and select the lookup wizard option. And this is going to jump you to a wizard. And again, if you've used Microsoft products before, you may be familiar with this wizard. In general, wizards guide you through a process. They can be really helpful if you're not entirely sure what it is that you want to do because they can just help you. You just select different options and then the task is done for you. So I really like uh, wizards. And the reason why I'm using the lookup wizard is because for activity level, what I essentially want people to be able to do is to pick an activity level from a list. So whether it's active, moderate, leisurely, so on and so forth. And we're going to create that list using this lookup wizard. So let's just read what we have on the screen. It says this wizard creates a lookup field which displays a list of values you can choose from. How do you want your lookup field to get its values? And you can see the first option there is selected by default. So it says I want the lookup field to get the values from another table or query. Now you could use that option, but in this case, I want to actually define the lookup values myself. So I'm going to say the second option, I will type in the values that I want. And I'm going to click next. Now when it comes to setting up the options that a user can select, 
we could get pretty complex and have lots of different columns. But in this case, we're going to keep it fairly simple and we're just going to have one column. And remember, the options we are adding are for activity level. So I'm going to click in column one and I'm going to type in uh, leisurely. moderate and challenging. So essentially each trip is classified using one of the three options. And I'm going to click next. So now it's asking me what label would you like for your lookup field? And you can see it's picked up there essentially my field name, which is activity level. Now, when it comes to naming fields, I like to name them without spaces and keep them fairly simple. And you might have your own naming convention. Now, it's not that you can't put spaces in between your words, so activity space level in this case, but that can cause some problems later on. So just to kind of get around all of that, I either have it all as one word or I might separate the two words using something like an underscore. I have a little checkbox underneath that says limit to list. So do I want to limit the choices to the list that I've created? So yes, I do. So I'm going to select limit to list. I don't want someone to be able to go in there and add in more activity levels. The next option, do you want to store multiple values for this lookup? Now, this is a little bit controversial in access. So if you have a list, what this means is if you allow multiple values, it will allow the user to select more than one activity level. Now, in this case, that might seem a little bit odd. You probably wouldn't have a trip that's challenging and leisurely. So you'd probably just select one in that case. Now, this might be valid in some circumstances to select more than one option. So, for example, if you had a big long list of countries and this trip applied to multiple different countries, then you might use something like a multi select. But in this case, I'm not going to allow multiple values because they aren't needed. So I'm just going to click finish. I'm going to add a description for my field. So we're going to say indicator of how active this trip is. And let me go down and select my or set my field properties for this particular field. So field size. Now this is only holding one word. So it's going to be leisurely, moderate or challenging. So I'm just going to change this to 30 characters. That should cover it. Is the activity level required? Yes, it is. Is it indexed? So do we want to be able to search on the activity level? So I'm going to say yes for this because it might be that you want to go in and do a search for all holidays that are moderate. So I'm going to say yes and I'm going to say duplicates OK because there might be multiple trips where moderate has been assigned as the activity level. Now, because this uses a lookup, I'm going to go to the lookup tab in my field properties. It's just next to general just here. And this is where I can set my properties for that little drop down or that lookup. So you can see the first field here, it says display control and it says combo box. And again, if you've used the uh, combo boxes in Excel, then you might be fairly familiar with what these are. So it basically just means like a little drop down box where you can select an option. And again, I'm going to explain more about the different styles of drop down that you can have. But for the moment, I'm happy to keep this on combo box. We then have row source type. So do you want to get the values from a table query or type them in? So we chose to type them in, which is value list. So I'm going to keep that just there. Then underneath that, we have our row source. And you can see there we have the three different activity levels, leisurely, moderate, and challenging. And you could probably see very simply how you could modify those. So if I decided that I wanted to remove leisurely, I could just come into here, highlight it and delete it. Or if I wanted to add another one, I could very simply just come onto the end here. I could type in a semicolon and then type in my new activity level in quote marks. So you can modify your raw source from your field properties. So I'm actually going to do that. I'm going to jump into here and I'm going to add in another field that says leisurely to 
moderate. I'm just putting that in quote marks and making sure I have those semicolons in between. So super simple to modify those. Do I want to limit to list? Yes, I do. I only want people to be able to select the data that I've specified or the activity levels I've specified. So that's fine. Do I want to allow multiple values? No, I don't. You can only select one. And do I allow value list edits? I'm going to say no, as I don't want anyone else other than me changing those values. So that's the settings for the activity level field. Now I need to set an appropriate value for our Louisiana Explorer trip. So I'm going to jump to Datasheet view. Now this is a warning message that you'll see pop up from time to time. And it's basically access doing a check of its data integrity rules. And you can see here it says data integrity rules have been changed. Existing data may not be valid for the new rules. It says this process may take a long time. Do you want the existing data to be tested with the new rules? Now, we're still very early on in the process of setting this database up. And whilst later on, it's probably going to be good for me to get access to do a data integrity check to make sure everything is OK. At the moment, I'm not too worried about that. So I'm going to click on cancel and we can run the testing later. So now we are back at our Tubble trip. We can see we have the Louisiana Explorer trip in here and we now have a new field for activity level. When I click in this field, you can see that now I have a little drop down arrow. And would you look at that? There we have leisurely, moderate, leisurely, moderate and challenging. And for this one, I'm going to select leisurely to moderate. And again, you can widen that column out if you need to. So the next field to add in is the country field. And ultimately, we need to be able to specify that a trip goes to a number of different countries. But at this stage, I'm just going to record the main country that the trip visits. So in this case, it would be USA. I'm going to use a lookup again, but I'm going to say that selection is not limited to the list because I'm not really sure about my country list yet. The list might change. So I'm going to go away and I'm going to set up this country field and I'll join you in a few moments. So country is now set up. I'm going to jump back to datasheet view. And I'm going to record the country for my Louisiana Explorer, which is USA. And we have one final field to add, and that is the description. Now, description won't be a short text field. It might be longer than 255 characters. So I'm going to change this data type to long text. And a long text field can hold up to a gig of text. Now, it's a little bit difficult as a user of access to really be able to know what that means. What is a gig of text? What I will say is that each field can hold roughly 64,000 characters, and I very much doubt we're going to have a description that's that long. So I'm now going to set the properties for this field. And the only one to really point out here is that in general, a long text description wouldn't be indexed. So I'm going to have no just there. Let's add a quick description. And then let's jump back to Datasheet view. And we're going to add a description in here for our Louisiana Explorer trip. So that's it. We have a few more fields to add and they are all numeric and we're going to cover those in the next module. So please join me for that. Hello there and welcome back to our course on Access 2019. So far, we've been setting up the fields in the trip table of the Esprit de Tour database. And we're now going to add all of the remaining ones, which are all numeric. So the first one that we're going to add is the duration of the trip in days. So again, let's refer back to our notepad file. And you can see the duration here is eight days. So I'm going to add in a field name and I'm going to say duration days. And this time the data type is going to be number because it's a numeric field. Now, if we glance down to the properties for the field, you can see here it says field size long integer. And we have a whole host of different options. 
Now, depending on how much you know about the way numbers are stored, you may or may not be able to choose a number field size. So you might not know if it's integer or byte or single or double. You might not have any idea what those are. And it is a little bit confusing in that way, but there is help on this in Access Help. So let's jump into Help by pressing our F1 key. Now, because I was clicked in that property field, it's actually jumped me to the correct page within Help that I need. If we scroll down, you can see a description here of those different options. So you can see here, if we were to choose byte, that would store numbers from 0 to 255. So if we use byte to store the duration of the trip, the longest number of days for our trip could be 255 days, which is roughly 8 or 9 months. Now that's pretty good, but it might be that as this grows, we might have trips that are longer than that. So it's probably going to be better for us to go to the next one up, which is integer. So you can see here, integer stores numbers from minus 32,768 to plus 32,767, which is a pretty long trip. So to be on the safe side, I'm probably going to select integer for my trip. Now, while we're here, I would definitely say it's worth looking through, reading through the rest of these different field types just so you become familiar with them as you set up your database. So I'm going to close this down and in my field size property, I'm going to select integer. Now, so far, we've been ignoring some of these other properties. I want to make sure that when people are storing the duration of the trip, they are storing a positive duration. So we don't want a trip that has minus days. We always want it to be on the positive side. So in this property where we have validation rule, I'm going to say it always must be greater than zero days. And I'm going to add some validation text to that. So we're going to put in duration must be greater than zero. Is the duration required? Yes, it is. Every trip must have a duration. Do we want it to be indexed? Yes, we do, because people will often search on the length of a trip before they select it. And I'm going to say yes, duplicates OK, because we could have multiple trips with the same duration. And I'm going to add a description, which is going to say duration of trip in days. So let's now test this out and test some of those rules and properties that we've set up. I'm going to jump back to Datasheet View. I'm going to save, of course. I'm going to say no to testing at this moment in time. And I'm going to go to Duration. Now I'm going to just first enter in a minus number. So I'm going to say minus three days. And there we go. I get a little pop up that says duration must be greater than zero. So I can see that those validation checks that I've done there are working correctly. Let's change this now to plus eight days. And that allows me to enter that with no issue. Now, the final thing we need to do with regards to numeric values is price range. So again, let's look at our notepad file. You can see the price range here, excluding flights, is $3,080 to $3,112. And essentially, if you have a price range, it should be stored as two separate values. So a minimum price and a maximum price. And the reason why we have a, a price range in general terms is that when someone books a specific tour, so one instance of the trip, there will be a set of specific prices for that tour. So we might have things like special offers for families, things like that. So what we're going to do is we're going to store a minimum price and a maximum price. So let's jump back to design view. I'm going to say price minimum. And the data type here is going to be currency. Now the currency will be selected based on whatever you have it set up as. So my default is US dollars, which is what my currency is going to be in. I'm going to add a description. So minimum price of trip. 
I'm going to set some properties. So I'm going to say my validation rule, the price must be greater than zero. And my validation text is minimum price must be positive. Is this a required field? Yes, it is. Every trip must have a price. And is it going to be indexed? Yes, because I would say that this is probably one of the main things that people search on, and that is the price of a trip. And I'm going to do exactly the same for price maximum. We're going to select currency. Maximum price of trip. Validation, it must be greater than zero. OK, so let's now jump back to data shape view. We're going to save. I'm going to say no to testing. And what you can see here immediately is that for these two new fields, the price minimum and price maximum, Access has automatically put in my currency in the correct format for me, which is really good. I don't have to go in and change anything. So I'm going to grab my minimum price. I'm just going to do a quick copy and paste. So minimum. And let's do the maximum. So that's it. I've now finished the definition of the trip table and we will need to load some more data later on. But that's it on the trip table for now. It's now time for you to do exercise one. So I will see you over there. Hello there and welcome back to our course on Access 2019. It's now time for you to do exercise one. And exercise one is really the first step to creating a movie rental database. Now, this isn't only a database with movie information. We're going to start off with movie information and then we will add information related to people doing online rentals of physical DVDs. So not downloads, but physical DVDs. And we're going to put a pretty simple database in place. Now, the only reason I have chosen a movie database for the exercises is that movies are something that people in general are very aware of. And they're also aware of the sort of information that is available for movies. But if you didn't like this, you could choose to do a subject of your own. So maybe something that's more related to the type of work that you do. But whichever you choose to use, either my example or your own, the main thing I want you to concentrate on is the features that I'm using. So those will be the same regardless of the data that you're using. Now, the way that these exercises work is that I'm going to give you a brief outline of what I'd like you to do. Then I want you to go away and I want you to try and do that. And I'll be providing you with my sample answer as well, which you'll find in the exercises folder. The reason I provide my own solutions is that, say, maybe you get stuck or maybe you haven't had time to complete an exercise. You can always use my sample answer as a starting point so you can then move on to the next exercise if you want to. So let's get on to talking about exactly what I'd like you to do for this exercise. So first of all, I need you to create a movie rental database. And it's for the rental company called Night Movies. And that's Night spelt N-I-G-H-T. So I'd like you to call the first version of this database Night Movies 01.acdb. And the movie table needs the first four of those fields you can see there. So title, director, year of release, and runtime in minutes. Later on, we'll add information about genre and the actors in the movies, but don't worry too much about that just yet. Also, I don't really want you to start adding lots of movie information as I'm going to provide this to you later on and I'm going to show you how to import it. One last thing I'd like to point out before I let you get on with this exercise is that you're probably going to want a unique identifier as many movies over the years have been made with the same title. So give that a go. My solution is in the exercise folder if you get stuck. Good luck with that and I will see you in the next section. 
For the next section, you'll want to download the course exercise files. Click the link below in the video description to get these. You can also scroll through the details to find timestamps for each section in this course. If you're enjoying this training, please leave us a comment. Hello again and welcome back to our course on Access 2019. In this module, we're going to start talking about importing data from Excel. And really what I want to do is just introduce to you some basic ways of importing data into a database. Now, before we start, so far when we talk about a database, we mean a single file. And within that file, there are many different things. For example, there could be a number of different tables. And we've already seen how to create some tables. And you could have a lot of different tables within your database. Now, it's not always the case that these tables will hold the data. It might be that you need to import data from a different source. So the data might be essentially external. So we mentioned earlier on that when it comes to people booking vacations, they probably book and then pay using their local currency. So it might be that there is a table somewhere where we look up the currency conversion rates. Now, that might not be a table that we maintain in our own database. It could be on an external website or in an external service or in a different access database somewhere else. And we really just want to import that data in. Now, when we do access data from another source, the term within access is called linking. And you can link together tables in other databases. Now, we're not going to be covering linking too much in this course, but we are going to take a look at importing data. And we're going to import data from two different sources, which would be the most common sources, importing from an Excel spreadsheet and also importing data from a text file. So how do we do that? Well, let's go up to our external data ribbon. And you'll see here the first group we have is import and link. I'm going to click the new data source and I can choose to import from numerous different sources. So if I hover over from file, you can see I can import from an Excel file, an HTML document, XML file, text file. I can import from another access database if I wanted to, or from an SQL server, Azure database, DBase file, or I could choose to import from different online services. So maybe you have a SharePoint list or maybe some other kind of data service. And then we have from other sources, which will allow you to import from something like an ODBC database, which is basically a database that's compatible with access. So lots of different ways that you can import data into access. Now, let me just show you the data that I want to import first of all. So this is the Esprit de Tour trip import worksheet and you'll find this in the course files folder so you can open that up and take a look at it for yourself and you can see here what we have are the the field names essentially are our column headings in excel so we have code trip name activity level country description duration days price minimum and price maximum and each row is a different trip so we have the grand canyon family rafting adventure iconic Italy, special family safari, so on and so forth. And if I scroll down, you'll see that we have not too many, a dozen or so trips within this file. And what I want to do is I want to import all of these into my tuple trip table in Access. So I'm going to close down my Excel spreadsheet. I'm going to go up to new data source and I'm going to select from file and Excel. The first thing we need to do, you can see here we've got this little wizard pop up again, which will guide us through this process. Access is asking me to specify the source of my file, essentially. I have a default file name in there, so you just want to browse to wherever you have your Excel spreadsheet saved. I then need to specify how and where I want to store the data in the current database, and I have three options. I can choose to import the data from that Excel spreadsheet into a new table in the current database. 
So if I was to choose this option, it will basically import it and create a brand new table. My second option is to append a copy of the records to a table that I specify, which in this case might be tuple trip. So in this case, what it will do is it will import the data from Excel and it will append it to this current table. And that is actually what I want to do. If you remember in Tubal Trip, we currently have one trip listed. That's the Louisiana Explorer. And I just want to add all of these trips in my Excel spreadsheet to my current Tubal Trip table. The third option I have is to link to the data source by creating a linked table. As I said, we're not going to cover linking too much. But essentially, if you were to select this option, it doesn't import the data into Access, but it will create a link to it in Excel. So there may be some occasions where you want to use that option. Now, I'm happy with the second option. I'm going to click on OK. And you can see here the import wizard has analyzed my data in Excel. And because it's in Excel, it's made it pretty easy for Access to slice up that data according to the various different columns or field names. So I have code, trip name, activity level. And if I scroll across, just to make sure, there's the description, might be quite long. I'm going to go to the end. Duration days, price minimum, price maximum. So that all looks pretty good to me. So I'm fairly confident that if I was to click finish on this wizard, it's going to import all of that data into Tubal Trip. So really simple to import data from Excel. Now I'm going to click cancel here because I want to actually show you this using a different method. So using the same data, but it's going to be stored in a text file as opposed to an Excel file. So I'm going to click cancel just here. So before we do this, let's just look at the text file. So here we have the Esprit de Tour trip import.txt file. And again, you'll find this file located in the course files folder. And this is exactly the same as the Excel file that we just saw, but it's a little bit harder to read. As you can see, we don't have the nice Excel grid structure dividing up these different fields. I can see fairly clearly that we have the code listed in this first column. We then have trip name, activity level, and everything starts to get a little bit bunched up, making it quite difficult to read. However, there is a pattern to this, and the pattern is that each of my fields is separated with a tab key, which is a little bit hard to see, but I can almost see in here, yes, there are tabs in between each of these fields. And it's really important to know what you have separating your fields. We call that the delimiter. Now, in this case, the delimiter is a tab, but it might be that if you have your data in a text file, you've separated the fields using maybe a comma or a semicolon or something like that. But identifying what that delimiter is is really important, as you'll see over the next few steps. So I'm going to take this text file. I'm going to separate it up so it's nice and neat, and we're going to append it to our data that's currently in Tubal Trip. So let's close this file down. Let's go back to our external data tab, go over to new data source from file, and we're going to select text file. And again, we just need to browse to where we have that text file stored. So there we go, Esprit de Tour trip import. I want to append to the bottom of Tubble Trip. Click on OK. Now, Access hasn't done a great job here so far of splitting up these different columns. And that's because we haven't actually really told it yet how to split up these columns. So you'll see at the top, we've got delimited highlighted. So it says characters such as a comma or a tab separate each field. So that is the option that we want to choose. I'm going to click Next. And we now need to tell Access what delimiter we're using. And it's correctly picked Tab for me. If you have your data divided up in a different way, so maybe your fields are separated by commas or spaces or some other kind of character, you can also specify those in here. But with Tab selected, you can see now my data looks a lot neater. So I'm fairly happy with that. 
Another important thing to select here is to say that the first row contains field names. So the first row where it says code, trip name, activity level, those are essentially our headings. They're not actually part of our data. I'm going to click next. I want to import this to tibble trip, which is correct. And I'm going to click finish. Now, once Access has finished importing the data, it's going to pop up this little step here. So it says save import steps. So if this is something which I was doing fairly frequently, I might want to just select save import steps and it will whiz me very quickly through this process the next time I go to do it with exactly the same settings that we've used. I'm not going to check that. I'm just going to click on close. I'm going to double click to open Tubble Trip. And there we go, that data has been imported in. Now, of course, you can't see all of the descriptions. You may have to widen this column out a little bit, but that is how you can import your data from an Excel spreadsheet or from a text file into a current table. So that's it for this module. In the next module, I'm going to set you another exercise. So please join me for that. Hello again and welcome back to our course on Access 2019. It's time now for exercise two. And what I really want you to do in this module is just to practice importing data from either an Excel file that I've provided you or a text file. And you'll find both of these files in the exercise files folder. And it really is up to you which one you choose to do. So I would suggest that if you use Excel quite a lot, you might want to choose the Excel file. Alternatively, there is a text file there for you to import as well. Both files contain exactly the same information, so it doesn't really make too much of a difference which one you choose. Now, in the last exercise, I got you to create the Night Movies database. So this is what you should really have ended up with. We have our Night Movies database, our Tubble Movie. And we have those five fields that I asked you to add. So ID, title, directors, year of release and runtime minutes. Now, one thing I do want to point out with regards to these field names, because this is really important, is that in Access, there are a number of what we call reserved words. So these are words that Access uses for various different things. So if you use them for field names, they might appear to work initially, but they may cause you some problems further down the track. So you really want to try and avoid using those reserved words as your field names. So you might be wondering how you can find out what those reserved words are. Well, I'm going to jump up to the tell me what you want to do bar and I'm just going to type in reserved words and I'm going to get help on reserved words. And there you go. The first link says learn about access reserved words and symbols. And as we scroll down, you can then see the list of all of the reserved words. Now, some of these you would probably never choose as a field name, but there are some in here that you might possibly choose without even really thinking about it. So if I scroll down, you'll see you have words like from. So if I was to use that as a field name, that might cause me some problems. So it is worth having a quick look at this list of reserved words when you're naming your field so you don't come across problems later on in the process. So I just wanted to point that out as we are on the topic of field names. So given the names I've used and the field properties, this is version one of my Night Movies database. I've then created a version two and I've saved that into the exercises folder. And that is where you'll find my answer if you'd like to refer to that. So let's now look at the exercise I want you to do. Now, as I mentioned, I've provided you with two files, an Excel file and a text file. So let's take a look at the Excel file first of all. So this file has a list of 50 or so movies. And the file name is Night Movies Movie Import .xlsx, which you'll find in the exercises file. And you can see here the column headings exactly match my field name. So where it says title, directors, year of release, runtime minutes, that exactly matches what I have 
just here. And it's really important that you do have these field names and your column headings exactly matched. Otherwise, you'll experience some problems again when you're trying to import. So if you do find there is a discrepancy between the two, you either need to come into Access and change the field name to match the Excel spreadsheet, or vice versa, you could jump into here and modify the column heading in your Excel spreadsheet before importing into Access. So what I want you to do in this exercise is just to import this list of movies into the database that you've created, your TBL movie table. Now, the alternative way of doing this is to use the text file, which is also saved into the Exercise Files folder. And you'll see that contains the same information. Again, it's just set up slightly differently. So just be aware of your delimiter when you import. So it's entirely up to you which file you use. They will both hopefully give you the same result if you've done it correctly. So what I'm going to do now is just jump across quickly to my version 2 of the Night Movies database so you can see my answer. And here we go, there is my answer. Now you might notice at the top we have Shawshank Redemption listed twice and that's because I didn't delete out. I started out with that test line at the top there of Shawshank Redemption and because it's also included in the data that I imported, it's now listed twice. Now I'm going to leave that there for the time being because I want to show you how you can deal with duplicates and delete them out a little bit later on. It's worth noting that it's let us add it in because it has a different unique ID. So even though the rest of the information is exactly the same, because the ID is different, it will allow us to add it into the database. But this is what you're aiming for. So give that a go, import the data from either Excel or the TXT file into your Night Movies database. See how you go with that, and I will see you in the next section. Hello again and welcome back to our course on Access 2019. In this module we're going to talk a little bit about backing up your database. So we're moving away from building our database because this is a really important step that I want to make sure you understand before we continue adding anything else. Now once you start adding data to your database you need to really make sure that that data is safe. Because let's face it, there are things that can go wrong. So for example, if you're working on a laptop and maybe you've started creating your database, if someone stole your laptop, then you'd probably be in a lot of trouble. It might also be the scenario that you're working away on your database and for some reason something gets broken or stops working. So you want to make sure that you have a backup copy of your database. Now, one of the advantages of Access is that everything is essentially stored in one ActDB file. So you don't really have to do anything other than keep a backup or a safe copy of that ActDB file. So all you really need to do is just copy the file on a regular basis. Now, a regular basis, that might mean different things to different people. So I would say if you use your Access database every day and you're adding data and making changes, you really don't want to lose a lot of data. So I'd probably suggest that you take a copy of that file every day if you're updating it every day. If you only use your Access file occasionally, you might want to take a copy on a less frequent basis. You also might want to take a backup just before you make a major design change. So there might be many reasons why you might run a backup, and I do highly recommend that you do do this so that you don't lose any data. And there's a really good help topic that tells you how to backup and also how to restore your database. So here is that help topic, and all I've done is go into help and search for protect your data with backup and restore processes. So I would recommend that you have a read through here. And as you scroll down, you can see in this article, we have things like it will tell you how to plan regular backups, backup a database, backup a split database, restore, and also restore objects in a database as well. So I would recommend that you have a little read through this and implement your own schedule of backups, be they weekly, monthly, daily, whatever suits you for how often you use your database. So I'm just going to close down that help topic. 
And I'm just going to show you very quickly how I might save off or back up this Night Movies database. And it's very simple. It's really just a, a save process. So we're going up to File. We're going down to Save As. And you can see in our Save Database As options, we have an option for Backup Databases. I'm going to click Save As. And what Access will do is it will take me to my local folders. And again, you can just browse and select a, a folder if you want to. You might want to have a specific folder that you've created for backups. And the only difference here is that if you look at the file name, you can see that it's given it a date. And this is really useful because it tells me when I saved this file. So if I'm looking to restore a file, that date's going to be very useful to me. So essentially all you're doing there is really just taking a copy of the ActDB file. So nice and straightforward. But as I said, do have a read through all of those help options so you fully understand and can implement a backup process. So that's it for backing up. I will see you in the next section. Hello again and welcome back to our course on Access 2019. In the preceding section, we talked a lot about backups and the importance of backing up your data. And as I mentioned, it is essential to do this before you start investing too much time in creating your database. And over time, Access databases can become what we might call bloated. And also over time, you might find that your database gets broken in some way. Now, I've mentioned this previously in relation to restoring your database, but sometimes it is possible to repair a database without having to restore it entirely. So we're going to talk about the compact and repair option in this module. Now, as always, I'm going to refer you to the help topic for some further reading. So here is the help topic and you can see there I've just searched for compact and repair. And again, I would suggest that you have a little read through this as it will talk you through exactly what you need to do and the steps you need to take before you start to compact and repair a database. So lots of information in there for you to read and also some very explicit instructions on how you can do that. Now, let's just talk very quickly about what we mean by um, access databases getting bloated. As you start or begin to add data into your database, that obviously that file is going to grow with you. So the ActDB file gets bigger and bigger over time. When you do things like delete records from your database, the space is not automatically reclaimed. It just occupies kind of what we call empty space. And there are also pieces of coded data within your access file that access uses. And over time, we get this effect called bloat. So what we want to make sure that we do is that we remove the unused bloated space, essentially. And we use the compact and repair options to reduce the size and improve performance. Now, this is also useful if you have a file that's become corrupted. And if a database file does become corrupted, sometimes Access will realize this and it will prompt you to repair the file, which is absolutely fine. However, sometimes it doesn't prompt you. So you might carry on working for days, weeks, months without realizing that your file that you're working on is actually corrupted. So one way of dealing with this is to run a compact and repair. And really, you should run this not only when you're prompted to run it, but also as part of a general regular maintenance procedure. So I'm going to show you now how you can access that compact and repair option. So let's close down help and I'm going to jump across to database tools. And you'll see the first option there is compact and repair. So fairly straightforward. You can also access the same option in the backstage area. So let's go up to file. And you can see on the info tab, we also have the same compact and repair database button. So either of those will do the job. Now, what I would say is that before you do run a compact and repair, and this kind of harks back to the previous module, that you do a backup before you do a compact and repair. Compact and repair is usually successful and it will certainly compact the data and repair any problems. 
but it's always good to be able to go back just in case something goes wrong. So do make sure that you take a backup before running this option. Another point worth noting is that you should only really do a compact and repair when you have the database open for exclusive use. And what I mean by that is if you're sharing this file and lots of people or maybe just one other person are working on it, then doing a compact and repair could be pretty dangerous. So you want to make sure that before you run a compact and repair that you are the only person who's working on the database. Now there is a way that you can check that. So maybe you're not sure if you are the only person and you want to check to make sure that that is the case. So I'm going to show you how you can check that very quickly. Now the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to close this Night Movies database so that I just have access open. I'm going to go to File, down to Open, and I'm going to click on Browse. I'm going to find my file, which is this one just here, and instead of doing a straight open, what I'm going to do, so I'm going to click that drop down, and you can see there that we have an option for Open Exclusive. Now what this means is if I select this option, the file will only open if I am the only person using that file. So it's a good way to check that you are in fact the only person who's currently in that file. And there we go, my file is open so I know that it's just me who's working in this file. And I can then go in and run my compact and repair database safely. Now one other option I want to point out to you before we leave this topic is in Access Options. So let's go to File and down to Options. And I'm going to jump across to that current database area. And I just want to highlight to you this option just here in the middle of the screen, Compact on Close. And what this means is that Compact and Repair will run every time you close the database. Now, I would say to proceed with caution with this, you should really only set this if you know that you're the only person who uses this ActDB file. But that can be a way of keeping everything simply very small and tidy on a regular basis. But just be aware that you have to be the only one using it. So finally, I would just urge you to read through that help topic on compact and repair and implement a regular schedule for running it. That's it for this section. I will see you in the next one. Hello again and welcome back to our course on Access 2019. In this section and the next couple of sections, we're going to look at Datasheet View in detail. Now I mentioned earlier that you can do design in Datasheet View and also data maintenance. But Datasheet View isn't the most suitable way of doing either of those things, but people do like to use it. So what I'm going to do in this section is to look at how you can do design in Datasheet View. And in the next two sections, we will concentrate on the data aspects. Now, the first thing I'm going to do is I'm just going to turn off or minimize this navigation pane by clicking on the double chevrons. And let's select the Fields tab in the Table Tools group. And let's explore some of the options that we have on here. So the first group just here is the Views group. And if I click the drop down, you can see that we have those two different views in there. So Datasheet view that we're currently in and also Design view. We've been in here a few different times, so you're probably fairly familiar with this. But just be aware also that you can toggle between those two views simply by clicking the top half of that button. Moving along to the next group, we have an Add and Delete group. Now, we actually added a field in an earlier module, so you've seen how you can do that using the Click to Add at the end of the columns. But I could do this a slightly different way using this Add and Delete group. So for example, if I was to select the country field, I could add a field of one of these data types simply by clicking on the button. So for example, if I click on short text, you'll see that it adds a new field to the right of country and the data type is a short text field. And it gives it a default name of field one, which obviously you can go in and you can modify. Now, some of the most popular data types that you might want to select are shown in this Add and Delete group. 
But if you click on more fields, you'll see that there is a whole host of different data types that you can add. So you're not just limited to the ones that you can see in that group. Now, another button that you'll see in this group is the delete button. So let's just do the reverse of what we just did. So I'm going to select the field that we just added. I'm going to click delete. It's going to ask me if I want to permanently delete the selected field. So I'm going to say yes. And there we go. It's gone again. Now this time I'm going to select the trip name column and you'll see in this properties group that I now have some commands that are active and ready for me to use. And one of them is name and caption. So I could come into here if I wanted to change the field name, if I wanted to change the description, and I could also add a caption and caption is something we're going to be talking about a little bit later on in the course. I could also come in here and change the field size for this particular field. So if you remember, we set the properties to this field, 255 characters, but I could easily modify that from up here as well. Now, I also want you to notice these other options which are not currently enabled. So modify lookups, modify expression and memo settings. Now I'm going to go back in and just select the country field again. And you can see that modify lookups is now enabled because if you remember, we set this country field up as a lookup. So let's click on modify lookups. And this will again allow me to go in and make changes to that lookup wizard. So if you remember, we just added USA into our lookup, but I could add in more in there if I wanted to. Let's select the description field and see what we get for that. Now, once I highlighted the description field, you'll see that memo settings has now become available for me to select. And we haven't looked at memo settings at all in this course so far. Now, if I click the drop down, you'll see that there's two options there, append only and rich text. Now, if I was to select append only, it means you can only add text to the description. You can't essentially change what's already there. So you might use this option if you want to keep some kind of running log of what's happened. The second option you have is rich text, and this means that it will be formatted as HTML. So if you wanted to add some formatting into the description, so maybe you wanted certain words bold or italics or underlined, something along those lines, you could use this rich text option in order to do that. Now, I'm not going to apply either of those at this stage. Let's now look at the formatting group, and I'm going to use the duration days column to look at this. So you can see that this is a number field and currently the formatting is set to general number. But I could, if I wanted to, click the drop down and change this. So I could change it to a currency, euro, fixed, standard, percent or scientific. Now also note these buttons underneath. So again, this just gives us a quick way to apply currency format, to apply percentage format and to apply common number format. And we also have an increase and decrease decimal button. So for example, let's jump to the price minimum column. If I wanted to add in some decimal places, I could increase or I could decrease back down. And the last group we have on this ribbon is the field validation group. And many of these settings were set when we set up this field in the first place. If you remember, we did a lot of this in that bottom pane. So I can see here that this is a required field and also that it's an indexed field. And then we have this big validation button. And this will show if there's any validation applied to this particular field. So if I click field validation rule, I can see here the rule that we set up for price minimum is greater than zero. So that's the validation rule that we have set up for this particular field. Now, the dialog box that you can see here is called the expression builder. And we're going to look at this in more detail later on. But you can build up very complex validation rules and you can also maintain the field validation message. And I mentioned earlier that sometimes you need validation to consider more than one field at a time. So you can use validation control to set up a record validation that includes more than one field in a record. So let's do an example of this. 
So what we want to say, or what we want to build an expression for, is that the minimum price can't be more than the maximum price. So I'm going to cancel out of here. I'm going to click on validation again, and I'm going to go to validation rule. Now what you'll see here in the expression builder is that we have a list of all of our fields. So I'm going to go in and I'm going to create my expression. So I'm going to say price minimum, I'm going to double click, is less than or equal to price maximum. And the reason why these have come up in square brackets is that square brackets indicate that it's a field that we're using. And I'm going to click on OK. And I'm going to add a validation message. Minimum price cannot be greater than maximum price. And click on OK. So let's try this out. I'm going to change this minimum price in this first one to $3,880. And I'm going to click somewhere else in the column. And you can see there, we are now getting that validation message pop up. So I can see that validation that we've added is kicking in, it is working. Now I'm actually going to change this back so I don't keep getting that message pop up. And when we click away this time, obviously we don't get that validation message. So now let's move on to taking a look at the other tab that we have underneath Table Tools, which is this one here, Table. Now I'm not going to focus or spend too long on this tab, but there are some things that I'd like to highlight to you. Now we have three groups in the middle, Before Events, After Events, and Named Macros. And these are associated with macro code that may be run as a result of certain events occurring. So if someone makes a booking, you may need other information in the database to update, such as the availability of a trip, or you may need to trigger an action. So something like maybe triggering an invoice to charge the customer the deposit or the balance. And as a result of these triggers, other things may happen. Now we aren't covering programming in any great detail in this course, but we will be looking at macros a little bit later on. Relationships, which is this final group just here, we're going to cover in great detail over the next few sections. And then finally, the other thing that we have is this table properties. And this really relates to sorting and filtering. And that's exactly what we're going to be looking at in the next module. So hold that thought and please join me for the next module. Hello again and welcome back to our course on Access 2019. In this module, we're going to look at sorting and filtering in Datasheet View. And in this section and the next section, it's a good idea to have the Home tab selected as many of the things that we're going to be doing in these modules are all located on this Home tab. So the first thing we're going to look at is filtering. Now at the moment, we have a dozen trips or so, and it's not really that difficult to see them. So if I'm looking for a particular trip, I can just look down that list and find the trip that I want. However, once you build your database and you have a much larger number of trips, it might be quite hard to find them or find the specific record that you want. So for example, I might want to find a trip that's within my price range, or I might want to find a trip that has the required activity level that suits me. Now filtering can help you a lot with this. So let's use this example. I'm going to take activity level. And I might want to say that I want to see all trips classified as moderate. So I'm going to select my activity level. I'm going to go up to the home ribbon into the sort and filter group and you can see there I have a filter option. Now that's one way of getting to your filters. I'm just going to cancel out of there and show you another way. I could also just click on the drop down arrow next to the activity level column heading and I get the same options. So when you first go into your filter and we're looking at this section just here, you can see that all of the options for activity level are currently selected. If I deselect select all, it's going to remove the ticks from all of those. 
So I can now go in and just select the option or the activity level that I'm interested in. So I only want to see the trips which have an activity level of moderate and click on OK. And there we go. It's filtered that list quite nicely for me. Things are a lot easier to see. Once you've applied a filter, you'll be able to tell that you've applied a filter to a column because of the little icon. So you can see here we have this little filter icon just there. Let's click it again. And if I want to put everything back to the way it was, I could choose to clear the filter from activity level or I could choose to select all again. So I'm going to clear the filter to bring everything back. Now that's an example of a very simple filter and filters can be a lot more complex than that. So maybe this time I want to filter by country. So I'm going to select the drop down again. I'm going to deselect all and maybe this time I'm only interested in trips that are in the Americas. So I'm going to go through, I'm going to say Costa Rica, I'm going to scroll down and USA. Click on OK and there we go, I have my list of trips. I'm going to go up and I'm going to clear that filter from the country field again. So that's all fairly straightforward. Let's look at something slightly different now. I'm going to click on the description field and there are also some specialized types of filter. Now the description field, we wouldn't necessarily generally search for an entire description of a trip, but we might want to look for a specific word in that description. So maybe I'm interested in trips which involve trekking. So I might want to look for the word trek. So I'm going to go down to text filters and I'm going to go to contains. And I'm going to say description contains the word trek and click on OK. And there we go, I have one record. I'm going to go back to my filter and I'm just going to clear that filter from description. But I want you to take a look at the other text filters that you have in there. So I have equals, does not equal, begins with, does not begin with, contains, does not contain, ends with and does not end with. So lots of different options there for your text filters depending on what it is that you're looking for. Now filters don't just apply to text, you do have some numeric filters as well. So I could if I wanted to filter on the number of days. So if I want to see all trips with a duration of eight days, I could say equals to eight. But I want to draw your attention to the price maximum column just here. Now it might be that I say to myself, right, the maximum price that I can afford is $3,000. So I could go into price maximum, go into number filters and I could say less than and it will say price maximum is less than or equal to 3000. And there we go. I know that those are the trips that are going to be within my budget. Now I could make that slightly more complicated. Maybe I have a maximum price of $3,000, but I also don't want to go on a trip that's too cheap. So maybe I'm looking at a, a price range. So maybe I want trips that are more than 2,000, but less than 3,000. So let's go back into our filters and number filter. And I could say between. So I'm gonna say between 2,000 and 3000 and click on OK. And there we go, I have my list. So lots of different ways that you can use filters to really pull out the information that you're interested in. Now that should be enough just to get you started, but there are some more advanced features that you should be aware of when it comes to filtering. Now if you go up to the home ribbon into the sort and filter group, you can see here we have a toggle filter button which is currently activated and this will allow me to toggle between the entire list or back to the filter that I've just applied. And then above that I have an advanced button so I can do things in here like clear all the filters but I can do things like filter by form. Now with this option you can set filters on more than one field at a time to come up with a much more complex filter. 
Now that's kind of outside the scope of this course, but if there is something that you think you might want to use, then I would encourage you to do some further reading on that. Now I'm just going to go back in and I'm just going to clear my filter from price maximum. So let's now do some basic sorting. So in a table where you have a primary key, the table is by default sorted by that key. So if you remember, the primary key in our table is that ID field, and that is what this table is sorted by. But if I wanted to sort by, say, country, again, I can click the drop down, and I have some sort options at the top here. So I can sort A to Z or Z to A. So if I select A to Z, it's going to sort by country alphabetically. And of course, you can also sort on numeric fields. So again, if we go back to price maximum, I could sort smallest to largest or largest to smallest. So those are your sort options in their most basic form. Now, I've just switched across to the Night Movies database because I want to show you a little bit of a problem that can occur and how we can get around it. So let's suppose you wanted to sort the movies in this database based on title. So we would select the drop down and we're going to do a sort A to Z or an ascending sort. And what you'll find is that the two movies that appear at the top of the list, so 12 Angry Men and 12 Years a Slave, Access treats numeric characters before alpha. So that is why these two are right at the top of the list. Now, a way around this is that when people set up tables, they add another column or a field that's called sort title. So a lot of these movies would have the same sort title. So things like A Beautiful Mind, the sort title would be the same. But when they were adding in 12 Angry Men or 12 Years a Slave, the sort title would be 12 spelt out. So T-W-E-L-V-E. -E. And you could then perform the sort on the sort title column and everything will then be in the correct order. Another stumbling block with this type of thing is if we scroll down towards the bottom, where you have lots of movies that begin with the word the. So again, in your sort order column, you might choose to remove the the or have maybe Lord of the Rings, Return of the King, comma, the. I've seen that in quite a lot of databases. So those are just a couple of things for you to think about when you're setting up your database. So that's pretty much all I wanted to show you on sorting and filtering. We have one more section where we're going to look at data entry and modification. So that's the next section. I will see you over there. Hello again and welcome back to our course on Access 2019. In this module, we're going to take a look at entering and modifying data in a data sheet. Now we've done a little bit of this already, but I want to just give you some more tips and information about finding your way around when you need to add or modify data and just a few tips about how to make it a little bit easier. So the first thing I'm going to do is just give myself a little bit more room by minimizing the navigation pane down. And I just want to start out by taking a look at those column widths. And we've seen previously how we can adjust those simply by grabbing hold of the border and either dragging in or dragging out. But if you wanted to be particularly specific, you could also right click on the column heading and you can see there you have an option for field width. And this will allow you to define your column width essentially in units. So currently that's set to 23, but I might want to change that to something like 50 and do OK. Now what you'll also see in there, if we right click again and go back down to field width, you'll see that there is a best fit option. So let's click best fit. And that's basically access will take a look at the information that you have in your field and it will adjust the column according to what it considers to be the best fit for the information in that column. And I could apply this to multiple columns as well. So if I highlight or select trip name, hold down my shift key and select activity level, I can then right click, go to field width, choose best fit. And there we go. It's applied that to both of those fields.
Now, when you're dealing with something which has a lot more information in it, so something like a description where we have these long pieces of text, Best Fit won't necessarily widen this column to the length of the longest item in the column, because that could be extremely wide, but it will have a go at it. So let's right click, go to Field Width and say Best Fit. And it will be pretty wide, but if we scroll across, we now have a very, very wide column. So much so that we now need to bring into play our scroll bar if we want to move across the screen. And of course, if I wanted to change that, I could right click, go into field width, and I might say that I only want it to be, let's say 70 units across. And there we go, something a little bit more manageable again. Now we can also do the same for the row height. So again, I could do it with two methods. So I could grab this first row until I get that little double headed arrow and drag down. And you'll see what happens is that it adjusts the size or the row height for all of the rows in this table. Now this can be good for something like description because it will enable you to fit more in and you'll be able to see more of the description simply by adjusting the row height as opposed to adjusting the column width. And again, what I could do is right click and select row height and I could adjust that manually as well. Now I'm actually going to put these back to something uh, like they were before. So I'm just going to drag this first one up just to take that back. Now, if you have a table which has many fields, there may be a situation where you only need to see a small number of the fields or the columns. So for example, maybe you're particularly interested in working on the activity level and the price minimum. Now, scrolling backwards and forwards between these two can sometimes be a little bit of a pain. So you can make your life a little bit easier by moving the price minimum column over next to activity level. And again, this is a very simple drag and drop. So I'm going to select price minimum. I'm going to grab the header row and I'm just going to drag it. And you can see I get that big black line, which is showing me where it's going to be placed. So if I let go, it's now next to activity level and I can work on both of these side by side. So just be aware that you can also do that as well. Now I want to point out that with that, it doesn't actually change the design. So if we go back into design view, you can see that I still have my field names in that particular order. So activity level is still there and price minimum is just there. So it only really changes it in data sheet view. And I'm actually just going to move that back to where it was. Now, another thing that you can do is you can hide a column. So for example, if I wasn't particularly interested in looking at the description field, I could right click and I could select hide fields. Now it hasn't deleted it, it's still there and I can bring it back again just by selecting duration days, right clicking and saying unhide fields. And it will ask me which columns I want to unhide. So I'm gonna say the only one there which hasn't got a tick, description and that brings it back again. So again, these are all tips on how you can become really efficient when you're working in Datasheet View. So let's now look at the mechanics of entering data into your Datasheet. So first we're gonna look at deleting records. Now this first trip that we have up here, the Louisiana Explorer, this is one that we entered in right at the beginning, but it's kind of a dummy trip. It's not a real trip. So I'm going to delete that from my table. And again, there's always a couple of ways that you can do these things. We can right click our mouse and we have a delete record option in there. Alternatively, if we go up to the home tab and into the records group, we have a delete option just there. So I could say delete record. And I'm just going to confirm that that's what I want to do. Now it's also worth noting that when you delete records from a table, it is something that you can't undo. So I wouldn't be able to click the undo button. In fact, it's actually deactivated in order to undo that deletion. So just be aware of that. Now notice also that I have selected the ID field in the first record. If I press the tab key, not only do I go through the fields, but as I enter each field, the contents is highlighted. So if I was to now start typing something else, 
Axis is actually going to delete what's already in there because it's going to assume I just want to overtype whatever is highlighted. So be wary of that as you tab through. Now if I accidentally make a mistake, so if I press something like X, I can come back out of that by pressing the escape key. So if you do want to go into a field, uh, for example, say the trip name, and you want to make an amendment to this, so maybe I want to add in another word or remove a word, you must click within that field as opposed to pressing tab. So now I can go in here and I can make whatever change I need. So just be aware of the difference between clicking and tabbing. Another thing I want you to be aware of is just finding your way around the different records. So we've seen we can tab through them, but if you cast your eyes down to the bottom left hand corner, you can see we also have a way of moving through the records. So I can click these arrows to move to the next record, or I can go back up to that first record. I could also jump directly to the last record or directly to the first record. And if I wanted to add a new blank record, I do also have a button for that down the bottom there as well. And just so you know that you also have in this records group on the home ribbon, you have a new button which will allow you to add a new record into your table. Now the final thing I want to show you in this module is that it's useful to also have the ability to be able to find and replace data. So if I look at my description field up here, I can see that in this first uh, field, I have the word seven. So it says camping wild for seven nights. In this one, I have the word the big six. A little bit further down, I can see I have, it says tailored to families with children 13 years. Now I have a bit of an inconsistency here in the way that I'm typing out or using numerical numbers. So here I've got the actual word and in these two I have the number. And it's probably a good idea for me to make those consistent across my database. So if I wanted to change something like that, so if I wanted to change where it says camping wild for seven nights to a numerical number seven, instead of going through all my records and doing it manually, where it's very easy for me to make a mistake or miss something, I can use the find and replace options that I have available. So I'm going to highlight my description field and I'm going to jump up and select in this find group, replace. I'm going to say find the word seven and replace it with the number seven. And I want to search in the current field which I've highlighted, which is description. And I want it to match any part of the field. Now I'm going to do a find first of all, just to make sure. There we go. It's picked up that word seven. And that's the only time it finds that word. Now I'm happy with that. So I'm going to select replace all. And I'm going to say yes to continue. And now if you have a look in that field, it's replaced the word seven for the number seven. So I would highly recommend if you need to replace certain things. So maybe it's a, a country name that you've spelled incorrectly or something like that. It's always good to use your find and replace options. And they work pretty much the same across the Microsoft application. So if you've used them in Excel or Word or something like that, it's fairly similar in access. So that's all I wanted to show you with regards to entering and modifying data in data sheet view. It's now time for us to start looking at relationships and getting a few more tables into our database. So please join me in the next module for that. Hello again, and welcome back to our course on Access 2019. In this module, we're going to explore how you can create a link table. And I haven't mentioned this before, but Access is considered a relational database management system. So within it, you create what we call relational databases. And at the core of the system is a set of tables and the relationship between the entities in those tables. So to demonstrate what I mean to make it a little bit easier to understand, I'm going to create a relationship between two tables. Now we only have one table so far in the Esprit de Tour database, which is our tuple trip. So we need to first create another table. 
Now earlier we talked about trip type and I'm going to create a new table which will hold a list of the different types of trip that Esprit de Tour offer. So I'm going to jump up to the Create tab and I'm going to click on Table Design. And this gives me a completely empty table without even an ID field. So on this occasion, I'm not going to have an ID auto number type field. I'm only going to have a single field and that is called type. So let's type in the field name of type. And this is going to be a short text field. Now, because we only have one field in this table, I'm going to need to make this field the primary key. So I'm going to select that row. I'm going to go up to the design tab and select primary key. And then I'm quickly going to jump down to field properties and just check what we have going on down here. So the first thing is field size. Now my trip types um, are going to be fairly short, so I'm not going to need 255 characters. So I'm just going to change that to 30. Is the trip type required? Well, yes, it is. Do we allow zero length? The answer to that is no. And do we want this field to be indexed? Yes, we do, but we don't want any duplicates. So I have my single field in my new table set up correctly now. So now let me save this table. So I'm going to go to close it down and it asks me, do you want to save changes to the design of table one? So I'm going to say yes. And I'm going to call this tuple type and click on OK. So now you can see over in the navigation pane, we now have a second table here, tuple type. So let's open that by double clicking. And currently, obviously, this table is empty. So now we need to enter some data, which we've seen a few times before. And I'm just going to add in my first record, which is activity. Now I'm going to add in about seven or eight different trip types. So let me type those in and I will see you back here in a couple of moments. So there we go. I've added in my different trip types. Now, one thing I want to highlight here is the spell check. So I might want to check to make sure that I've spelt all of these correctly. On the home tab in the records group, we have an option for spelling. And I can see there spelling check is complete. Everything looks good. So those are now my values for type. I'm just going to close the type table and I'm going to go to the database tools tab and I'm going to open the relationships. Now this window shows the relationships that exist between the tables, which is currently none. But this show table dialog will enable you to control which tables are shown in the relationships window. So I need to show the trip table and the type table. And I'm going to click on add. So what I now need to do is to create a relationship between them, which will define that a trip can be of many types. So to do this, I will normally introduce a third table or what we would call a link table, which will link trips to types. So I'm going to create the link table next. So I'm going to close this show table dialog. I'm going to go to the create tab. And this time I'm just going to select table and I get that ID field and I'm going to need an ID field in this case. Now let me jump across into design view and of course we're going to name our table. So this one is going to be called tuple trip type. So that's the name of our link table and click OK. Now this table will enable you to link each trip to the type of trip that it is. So what I need to do here is I need to specify two things. I need to specify a trip and I need to specify a type. So let's type those in as our field name. So I need to specify a trip and I also need to specify a type. Now, by default, each of these fields is a short text field, but just be aware that that is not always the case. Now, the trip field 
needs to be able to identify which trip I'm talking about, so which trip is being linked to. So as you know, with a trip, and let's jump into design view for trip table. So I also want you to note here that I now have three different things open. The unique identifier here for the trip table is the ID. So that is the primary key. And in order for the trip type table to uniquely identify a trip, it needs to store the primary key value of the trip it refers to. So let's just jump back to trip type table. So when we are referring to an auto number field, so that ID field, the type we want is not short text, it's actually a number data type. And if you look down in the properties, you can see that it's a long integer. So to make this a little bit clearer as to what I'm referring to here, I'm actually going to change this field name to trip ID. So when a field in a record points to a primary key in another record, in this record, this is what is called a foreign key. So let's add a description for this as well. And I'm also just going to add a description for this ID field. So when a field in a record points to a primary key in another record, in this record, this is what is called a foreign key. So in the table trip type, trip ID is the foreign key which points to a primary key in a trip record. Now let's turn our attention to type. And I'm just going to open up the type table in design view. Now in the type table, the primary key is a short text field because it's the trip type. And there's no reason that I shouldn't use that as the primary key. Therefore, in the trip type table, when I refer to the type, I'm referring to a short text field. So this needs to be short text as well. I'm just going to add a description for this field. So let's now check the properties of this particular field. So I can see here for type, we have a field size of 255. So I'm going to change that to 30. Is this a required field? Yes, it is. Are we going to allow zero length? That's going to be a no. And will this field be indexed? Well, that's going to be a yes. And duplicates are OK because the same type might be used in many trips. Let's just also check trip ID. This is a long integer, so that's OK. Required, then that's going to be a yes. And is it going to be indexed? And we're going to say yes to that. And duplicates are OK. So I'm pretty happy with how that's been set up. So I'm just going to close down some of these tables. So let's close this down. I'm going to say yes to save changes. I'm also going to close down my tubal trip and also tubal type. So we're just left here with our relationships window. I'm going to right click just on the blank screen and I'm going to select show table, which will bring up that relationship show table dialog again. And you can see now we have another table that's been added. So we now have our tuple trip type in there as well, which is our link table. And I'm just going to add that table to the window. And you can drag these tables around. So you might want to move them into an order that you think suits you better or a way that it's easier to understand in your mind. So because this is a link table, I'm going to put it in the middle of these two. So now that we have these tables set up, we need to set up the relationships between the tables in the Esprit de Tour database. And this is exactly what we're going to look at in the next section. So please join me for that. Hello there and welcome back to our course on Access 2019. In the preceding module, we started looking at relationships. 
And in order to set up a relationship, I created a new table containing the types of trip and a link table that's going to link each trip with the types that the trip has. So in that way, we are building a relationship between trip and type. So I need to set up essentially two relationships, trip to trip type. So each relationship is based on the ID in the trip table. And each trip has a unique identifier, that's the primary key. And the records in the trip type table for that trip will have the same trip ID in the trip ID field in the records in the trip type table. So in order to set up the relationship, we want to drag ID in the trip table and drop it onto trip ID in the trip type table. So we're going to select ID in tuple trip and drag and drop it onto trip ID. So what you'll see now is the edit relationships dialog box where I can essentially set up the details of this relationship. So the first thing I want to double check is that I have the correct tables and fields. So I can see there tuple trip, I took the ID field, which is correct. And I dropped it onto tuple trip type, the trip ID field. So that is correct. The next decision I need to make is whether I want to enforce referential integrity. And I'm going to select that checkbox. Now, let me just explain to you what referential integrity is. So imagine a situation where I created a trip and corresponding to that trip, I have created four trip type records. So I might have activity, beach, cruising and trekking as my trip types. And each of those has the appropriate type and trip ID for my selected trip. Now, what would happen if I deleted that trip from the trip table? What would happen is I would essentially end up with four records, so cruising, trekking, so on and so forth, in the trip type table that had no links at the other end of the relationship. So they'd kind of be like orphans. Those records would refer to a trip that no longer exists because I've deleted it. So making sure that that doesn't happen is called enforcing referential integrity. So if I enforce, as I've done here, and then delete a trip, it will ensure that there are no outstanding records that reference that trip. Now, another option I want to point out here is this one, the cascade delete related records. If I check this and then delete a trip record, Access would automatically cascade delete the trip type records for this trip. So that can sometimes be useful to you as well. Now, I'm not going to do that in this case, but I am going to enforce referential integrity. And finally, at the bottom here, we have relationship type and it says one to many. So all that means is that one trip can have many trip types. I'm then going to select create. And there it is. So we have one trip with many trip types. I'm going to set up a second relationship now. So from the type in the type table, this is going to go to type in the trip type table. So let's do that. I'm going to drag and drop like so. So once again, I'm just going to do a quick check that I have the correct tables and fields selected. So I can see here the tuple type table, which is this one just here. I selected the type field and I want to create a relationship to the tuple trip type type field. So that all looks good to me. Once again, I'm going to enforce referential integrity. So again, as just a reminder, what that means is if I was to delete a type, I would want to make sure that there weren't any entries in the trip type table that were still using that type. I have my relationship type again, which is one to many. So one type can have many corresponding entries in the trip type table. And I'm going to select create. And there we have our link. And anytime you see this infinity symbol, it just means many. So that's really a perfect illustration of one to many. 
So right there, we've put in place one of the most fundamental building blocks in a relational database. Now, I know that if this is the first time you're seeing anything like this, it can seem a little bit baffling when you don't understand it fully. But it is one of the most fundamental aspects of working well in Access. So if you can get your head around this, you can pretty much get your head around anything that you might want to do within Access. Now, one downside to doing this is visualization. So at the moment, it's quite hard to visualize how all of these things work together. So what we're really going to want to do is to add some nice forms, which is going to show us. Now, we're going to spend quite a bit of time looking at forms and how we can create them. So we're going to do that in the next few modules. But for now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to close this relationships window and I'm going to save. And I'm going to open up my tables again. So let's open up trip table. I'm going to open up type table and also my trip type table. Now I want you to think all the way back to the beginning of this course when we were looking at that notepad file. Now we mentioned when we were talking about this trip, so this was for the Grand Canyon family rafting adventure, we mentioned trip type and it was something that we left out at the beginning of the course and we're actually going to deal with this now. So this trip has five different types, so family, escorted, group, activity and landscapes. And we're going to set all of those up. So let's jump back to the trip table and notice that I can just jump between my tables by just clicking on these tabs, which makes it nice and simple to switch between them. Now I can see in here that the GCA trip has an ID of four. So I'm going to jump to my trip type table. So all I need to do is go to trip ID and type in four and a type of, well, one of them was family. So let's do the next one. So this is another one four and the type this time is escorted. Press the down arrow. That looks fine. Now this time let's make a mistake. So let's say that we're trying to set it up for trip ID three and this time it's going to be group and you can see there I get a warning message. So it says you cannot add or change a record because a related record is required in the table tuple trip. So it recognizes that the trip ID of three doesn't exist. So let's click OK and just put that back to four. So let me just add in the rest of these types. Now you might look at what I'm doing here and think, wow, this is a really slow process. And there are quicker ways of doing this, particularly if you're entering a lot of data. But the reason why I'm showing you this in such detail is because I really want you to understand kind of from the ground up, because it's going to give you a really good foundation and will make anything else you do on top of this seem a lot quicker and a lot easier. So finally, I just want to show you that referential integrity at work. So, so far, as we can see here, trip four has five types associated with it. So I want to jump back to the trip table. I'm going to go to trip four, which is the top one here, GCA, and I'm going to delete it, which is a little bit dangerous. So I'm going to go up to the records group and select delete. And you'll see that I get an error. So it says the record cannot be deleted or changed because table tuple trip type includes related records. So essentially I can't delete it until I get rid of the trip type tables. So everything I've shown you here is a pretty manual way of doing a job like this. So we are going to need to start using forms to make all of this a lot quicker and a lot easier. But first, before we get on to forms, I'm going to get you to do an exercise. So similar to what we've done in this module. And I'm going to get you to set up some relationships in the movie rental database. So please join me for that. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to our course on Access 2019. It's almost time for us to do exercise three. 
But before you do, I want to run through another example of setting up relationships in the Esprit de Tour database. And this is going to help you set up a more efficient set of relationships and a more efficient way of entering data into the movie rental database. Now, what I'm going to do is going to be the same as what I did setting up these types, but I'm going to set up countries instead in the Esprit de Tour database. So I've created a country table. It has a single short text field and I've set up the countries visited in one or more tours. Now what I'm going to do is to create the link table, which in this case is going to be the trip country table. So I've set up those fields within the link table record and I've set the basic properties for each of those fields. But now I'm going to go one step further. And instead of just saying that the country in a trip country record must be one of the countries in the country table, I'm actually going to use the country table to give me a drop down list of available countries. So with the country field selected in the trip country design, I'm going to click back in short text there and I'm going to select from the drop down menu lookup wizard. And what I'm going to say is that I want the lookup field to get the values from another table or query and click on next. And the table that I'm going to get these values from is the country table. So that's fine. Click on next. Which field am I going to use? Well, it's going to be that one. It's the only field and click on next. And what I can also do is say how I want those entries in the drop down list sorted. Now here I don't have too many options. I just have one field. So I'm going to sort them in ascending order of country and click on next. So now it's showing me what would currently be in my list. So that's all of my countries. And I can now if I want to set the width for this list just by dragging those borders. So I'm going to make this slightly narrower and then click on next. And I can even at this point establish the relationship automatically, including enabling data integrity. Now notice the option there that is selected. I can either restrict delete, which is the option that we've used previously, or I can cascade delete. Now in this case, I'm going to go for the restrict delete option and then I click on finish tells me that my table must be saved before the relationships can be created. So I'm going to say yes to save now. Now let's take a look at that relationships window again. And something that's worth noting, if when you select relationships, you don't see that newly created relationship. If you click on the design tab under the relationship tools and click on all relationships, that will show you all relationships that are set up. Sometimes it doesn't pick it up for a while. So it's worth doing that if you don't immediately see that relationship that's been created between those two tables. Now, as you can see here, we have a one to many relationship from country to trip country. And of course, if I double click on that to look at the details, it's enforce referential integrity without cascade delete. So that is one half of the job done. Let's now do the same from trip to trip country. This one is a little bit trickier. So I'm going to go back to trip country. I click in trip ID and again, I'm going to go for lookup wizard. And again, I want to get the lookup field to get the values from another table or query. So I'm going to click on next. The table that contains the values that I want to look up from is the trip table and click on next. And if I follow the pattern of the previous couple of cases, I'd copy one of the available fields over. Now the field that's going to be the basis of the relationship is the ID field, the ID of the trip matching the trip ID in the trip country record. So I'm definitely going to need that field. But just showing the IDs will be a little bit problematic because I'll be choosing from numbers. So it's not very meaningful. For example, I might not be able to remember what each number is in terms of a trip name. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to display the code 
and the trip name as well. Now I'm still only going to store the ID in the trip country record as the basis for the relationship, but displaying the code and the trip name as well will make it easier for people to identify the trip. So with all of those three fields to display, let's click on next. Now, how would I like this list sorted? Well, I can sort it on any of the fields that are being displayed, but I think I'm going to sort it on code. Now, note that I have the option of sorting on up to four fields, but I only really need to sort on the code on this occasion. And click on Next. Now, you can see here I have Hide Key Column selected. Now, you could hide the key column if you wanted to, but on this occasion, I'm going to display it. This is the ID that's going to be stored in the trip country record but I'm probably going to want to do a little bit of rearranging here. I certainly don't need this ID column as wide as it is, so I'm going to drag that in. I'm going to drag the code column in a little bit too, and I'm going to drag the trip name out, like so. I'm going to click on Next. Now, when you select a row in the lookup field, you can store a value for that row in your database. Now, which of those three is going to be the value that I store? Well, of course, as we've mentioned a couple of times, it's the ID that I'm going to store. So that's selected. I'm going to click Next. Now, do I want to enable data integrity? I do. Now, do I want to cascade delete or restrict delete? Well, I want to restrict delete and click on Finish. Now, with a bit of luck, my relationship should have been created. So let's go to the Relationships window. And I can see that it hasn't. So if you remember that little hack that we have, we jump up to Design, we say All Relationships, and there you can see that relationship between Tubal Trip and Tubal Trip Country has been created. And just to make sure that everything's OK, let's double click to open that up. And yep, I can see ID, Trip ID, and Enforce Referential Integrity. So let's jump back to the trip country table and let's open this in datasheet view. Now, the first thing we need to do is choose a trip. Now, if I click on the drop down there, I get a list of IDs, a list of codes and a list of trip names. And this makes it much easier for me to choose the trip. So let's go through and select a trip. So I'm going to do Grand Canyon Family Rafting Adventure. Note that the trip ID, this is what is being stored. And then the country is USA. Let's click underneath and do another one. So let's do Iconic Italy, for example. And the country is Italy. So as you can see, by using more than one field, I make it possible to do a link between numeric fields and text fields. So that finally brings us to exercise three. Now I've provided you with a list in the exercises folder with information about the 50 movies. It's called the movie rental movie info.txt file. And although it's not in a format that is readily suitable for you to import into access, it does list the genre for each of the 50 movies. So for Shawshank Redemption, the genre is crime drama. For The Godfather, that's also crime drama. Schindler's List, we have drama, biopic, history, so on and so forth. So what I'd like you to do is to set up a genre table and then a link from movie to genre. I'd then like you to set up some data just data for two or three movies is fine. Of course, if you are enjoying yourself and you want to set up more of them, then please feel free to do that. But I would like your setup to work using the features that we've looked at in this section. So if you look at my answer to this exercise, exercise three, if you open up the movie genre table, I have actually entered all of the movies and the genres in there. But if you click, say, in this row in the movie genre table, you can see that it's the IDs and the movie titles being displayed. And the movies are sorted into alphabetical sequence of title. And when I'm selecting one of the genres for one of these records, again, if we click the drop down, 
you can see that they've been sorted alphabetically. So I'd like you to do the equivalent of that for exercise three, and I will see you in the next section. Hello everyone and welcome to this course on Access 2019 Advanced. My name is Deb and I'm your instructor on this course. Now in this introductory section we're going to be taking a look at assumptions, we're going to talk about programming, I'm going to give you some information about the sample databases I'll be using on the course, and I will explain the exercise and the course files. Finally, we'll talk about the changing features of Access 2019. Now, I'm sure you're eager to get started with your course, but it is important that I explain these things to you, starting with the assumptions I'm going to make. So the first assumption is that you have Access 2019 installed on your PC. We're not going to cover anything related to the installation of Access. The next assumption I'm going to make is that you have a good basic working knowledge of Access 2019. And what do I mean by that? Well, if you look at the course content for our Microsoft Access 2019 beginners course, I'm going to assume you're familiar with all of these topics. And when I say familiar, I don't just mean knowing the terminology. I mean that you could explain to me with a reasonable level of confidence what each of these tools and utilities are. So it's definitely worth having a scroll through the contents and having a look at the different topics covered in the beginner's course. If you do find that you have some gaps in knowledge, then I would say it's definitely worth going back and reviewing that course before coming to the advanced course. Now, if your knowledge of access is in an earlier version, if it's a pre-2007 version, then 2019 is really quite different. The new version has so many changes from the basics, such as the ribbon structure, to things like new reporting facilities. So again, if that applies to you, I think you should probably work your way through the beginner's course first. From 2007 through to 2010, 2013 and 2016, a good working knowledge of these versions will give you a good basis. So for example, if you're fairly confident with Access 2013 or 2016, you should be okay with moving straight into Access 2019. The next thing I'd like to talk about is programming. Now some users work with Access without ever writing any program code themselves. And you can develop some good access applications without getting to grips with programming. However, those people are missing out quite a bit because you can do a lot more with access if you learn about programming. So we're going to spend quite a lot of time looking at macro code and VBA code. So if you do have any reservations, it is definitely worth giving it a try as it will help you get more out of your access database. And the way that I explain it, I try to do it so that it makes sense to someone who doesn't really come from a programming background. Now let's look at sample databases. In the beginners course, we developed a travel company database called Esprit de Tour. And we also, as part of the exercises, developed a movies database. Now, if you haven't worked through the beginners course, you might want to familiarize yourself with those databases. In the advanced course, we won't only be focusing on one sample database because there is such a broad range of features, but we will be looking at one or two sample Microsoft databases as well. So it is advantageous of you to become familiar with the two databases from the beginner's course. And apart from the sample databases, it is a really good idea if you can work on a database of your own alongside the advanced course, which will more accurately reflect your own interests and the type of work that you do. Now, as part of this course, I'm going to be setting you exercises. And the exercise files are all in the exercise folder. I will also be using some sample files and you will find those in the course files folder. So make sure you download those and keep copies somewhere safe. If you're coming to Access 2019 from 2016 or 2013, then you can get a good overview of all of the new features from the help page, what's new in Access 2019. 
Now, a lot of these are fairly minor, but it is important to make yourselves familiar with them. So I would definitely recommend having a read through the help page before you proceed. So that's enough from me by way of an introduction to this course. It's now time to do some work and we'll do that in the next section. So I will see you over there. Hello again and welcome back to our course on Access Advanced 2019. In this section, we're going to look at primary keys and indexes. And as part of this, I'm going to introduce or reintroduce you to one of the databases we created in the beginner's course, the Night Movies database. Now, if you haven't covered the beginner's course, then there is a copy of this database in the course files folder. And we're going to be looking at primary keys, indexes and rules and guidelines. So the first thing to do is to open up the Night Movies database. And we're going to start by looking at the navigation pane. Now, the shortcut for bringing that up is F11. And we're going to go into the design of the actor table. Now, because the Night Movies database references the actor table, we need to close it first before opening the actor table. So now we can right click and open it up in design view. So in the actor table, we have eight fields and one of the fields, the ID field is marked as the primary key. And you can see that little key symbol in the first column there. Now, if you remember, the primary key uniquely identifies each record in a table. So the ID in this case is the primary key field. Now, you don't have to have a primary key on a table, but almost all tables do have one. So in the case of this table where the ID is sort of a, a dummy number, it's the number assigned and it's auto numbered. So it doesn't really relate to the name of any other property of the actor. It just identifies that actor. Now, as we've seen, the ID field is the primary key, but other fields are indexed as well. So if I click in some of these other field names, so for example, if I click in actor name, if you cast your eyes down to the field properties and look at indexed, you can see it says indexed no. However, if I was to click in the family name field and look at the field properties, it says indexed yes, duplicates okay. If I click in gender, I can see that that is also indexed. And if I click in birth country, I can see that that is also indexed as well. So let's now look at the purpose of indexes. So I've opened the actor table and let's look at some of the data in it. Now the ID values have no relation to the actor themselves. They are auto numbered and assigned when actors are added to the table. And actors in general are always added to the end of the table and they essentially get the next auto number in the sequence. And it's worth remembering that auto numbers are not reused. So for example, if I deleted someone, their ID would not become available to someone else. So let's suppose that there are no other indexes available on this table. And let's suppose then that I am doing a search on actor information and I'm looking for the information on Henry Fonda. Now, without any other indexes available, the only way Access is going to be able to find that information on Henry Fonda is to go through each actor in the table. So it will go to the first record. It will say, is this Henry Fonda? No, it will go to the second record. Is this Henry Fonda? No, so on and so forth until it gets all the way down to record number 17 just here, where it says, is this Henry Fonda? And then we say yes. So this process reflects the fact that primarily the reason for indexing records is to make it quicker to find them. So one of the options is to make the actor's whole name an indexed field. So if someone searches for Henry Fonda, what Access will have done is to maintain a lookup index. So it won't have to go through each of these records, each of these numbers it will go to its actor name index. It will go to the entry Henry Fonda and it will find that I want the record in the actor table with the ID 17. 
So essentially, I can go directly to record 17 without searching through all of the other records. So having an index on the actor name would be a good thing, as it can help users find what they're looking for much more quickly. However, not all queries are as simple as that. For instance, a different query might be, find me all of the actors born in the USA before 1930 whose first name is Henry. So in that case, you might find yourself stepping through all of the actors and instead of about 30 actors, which is essentially what we have here, you might have a table that has 30,000 records and stepping through each of those records can be a very lengthy process. However, if we had an index on birth country, that would certainly help us out a lot as we could just go through records whose birth country was the USA. And if we had an index on given name, we could look up the given name index. So essentially we could go to all of the Henrys and that would give us a subset of all the actor records to begin with. However, there is a downside to this approach. And that is that with each additional index, there is a maintenance load on the system. So whatever records are changed whenever an actor is added to the database, modified, deleted, etc., then the indexes also need to be maintained as well. And we find that the cost of improved querying is a deterioration in the performance of updates. So with all that in mind, how do you achieve a balance? Well, that will totally depend on the nature of the database and also the use of the database. So for example, if your database is relatively stable, but there are many, many people querying the database, then having good indexing is going to be advantageous. However, if you have a database where there are many, many updates, but not too many queries, then essentially the opposite is true. So the nature and use of a database will be one of the primary drivers in decisions about indexing. Now, the other thing to point out regarding the cost of maintaining indexes, indexes also take up a lot of space. So the more indexes you have, that's when space can become a bit of an issue if you're dealing with indexes with very large volumes. Now, there are some rules and guidelines that I'd like to run through next. First of all, the primary key is always indexed and you can have up to 32 indexes. And there are certain types of fields that you can't index. So for example, you can't index long text fields and you can't index only type fields either. And although this isn't a hard and fast rule, but more of a general guideline, where you have a field that has a very limited number of possible values. So something like gender, for example, where we only have the male or female value. Generally speaking, indexing something like gender will not really help when it comes to querying performance. Having said that, in more modern databases where more than two genders are recognized, I think there's something like 20 recognized gender classifications now, you may well need to introduce a gender index. Now, when you're indexing something like birth country, where you might have 50, 100, 200 entries, then it's also good to consider indexing in that scenario. Now, a couple of other things to point out. Clearly, with something like country, duplicates will occur. So we could certainly have multiple actors for the same country. So when you index the birth country field, you would specify that duplicates are OK. They are allowed. The same would be true for given names. Now, when it comes to actor name, it's a bit of a different story. In theory, two actors might have the same name, although the way that the rules in the acting profession are set up currently, the convention is that two people never have the exact same name. However, if you don't allow duplicates and you do find two actors with the same name, you'll need to find some way of dealing with that. Now, one final point to mention is that decisions about indexes are not final. So if you decide you need to add or remove an index, it is something that you can change later on. So if you find that some aspect of the performance of your database is causing you a problem, you may well need to change the indexing arrangements later on. 
Now in the next section, we're going to turn our attention to some more detailed work on indexes, including the use of composite indexes, auto indexing, and a brief discussion on the impact of compact and repair on indexes. That's it for this module. I will see you in the next one. Hello again and welcome back to our course on Access Advanced 2019. In this section, we're going to look more deeply into the use of indexes. And first of all, we're going to look at composite indexes, sometimes referred to as multi-field indexes. We're going to look at auto indexes. And finally, I'm going to describe the effect of compact and repair on indexes in Access 2019. In this version of the actor table in the Night Movies database, the actor name is an indexed field. And if you wanted to search on the full actor name, I might, for instance, specify the actor name of Henry Ford. Now, there is an alternative to this approach. If you consider that the actor name is essentially made up of two other fields, it's made up of the given name and also a family name. And you can treat the given name as an indexed field and the family name as an indexed field, and the two together as what we would call a composite indexed field, essentially made up of two fields. Now, if I wanted to do a search on Henry Fonda, instead of searching the act name field, what Access will be doing is looking up an index that has two parts. So the first part says Henry, and the second part says Fonda. Now, in order to set up a composite index, you need to go up to the Design tab, and you'll see you have a button there called Indexes. And if we hover over, we get our screen tip that says it displays the list of fields on which the table is indexed. So let's click on Indexes. Now, I'm actually going to remove the gender field for the reasons I explained previously. So I'm going to highlight it and just press the delete key on my keyboard. And I'm going to create a composite index. So I'm going to call it first last. And I'm going to start with the given names field. And now in the next row of this dialog, I'm going to leave the index name blank. And I'm going to put family name again in ascending. And the fact that the index name is blank for this row means that Access will treat this as a composite index. Now, one important point here is that you can include several fields in a composite index up to 10. And the first field, so in this case, given names, doesn't then need its own separate simple index or one that only has a single field. If you were to just search on given name, Access would use this composite index, but only the first part of it. Whereas for family name, the second field, if you want to be able to search on family name, you would leave the simple index for family name that's there already. So essentially, family name is there twice as a simple index and also as a composite. So I'm now going to close this dialog box. Now, I've opened the dialogue again as I want to talk about some other important points related to indexes. So let's return to our primary keys. Now, as we've mentioned before, primary keys must be unique. Now, a primary key can actually be a composite index. And although that is the case, although the key overall must be unique, the individual component field values might not be. However, no field used in the primary key can have a null value. Now for each index, so let's take this one here, family name. And if you look down at the properties in the bottom corner of this dialog box, you can see it says primary, no, unique, no, ignore nulls, no. But what exactly does ignore nulls mean? Well, when Access is building its index, in this case, the family name index, what happens if family name is null? If ignore nulls is set to no, then there is still an entry placed in the index for family name for this record. But the index value there is null. 
Of course, you might expect in a large table where ignore nulls is set to no, you may have a number of records where this particular index has a null value. But if you say ignore nulls yes, then any records for which this particular index is null will not have an entry in that table. So generally speaking, ignore nulls is set to no. But if you want to include null values from an index, you would set that to yes. Now it's worth noting for a composite index, the composite index value will only be null if every individual field value in that composite index is null as well. So if any of the individual field values are not null, then the composite index value will not be null as well. Now the next topic I want to look at is auto-indexing. So let's suppose I want to add a new field to this table and we'll just add a field called test and for the data type we'll leave it on short text. Now having added that field if you look down at the properties it says indexed no. Now if instead of adding that field I'd added a field called num underscore test and we'll stick with that short text data type. If you look down in the properties it says indexed yes duplicates ok. And also if I'd added a field called test underscore id and again we'll keep that on short text. Again you can see in the properties it says indexed yes duplicates ok. So why is that? Well to get an explanation, we're going to jump into our access options. So let's go up to File. We'll go all the way down to Options. And we're going to click in our Object Designers page. And you can see here in this top section in Table Design View, the fourth option down, Auto Index on Import slash Create. And there are four items by default in this field. So we have ID, Key, code and num. So if you create a table or import a table where the name of a field begins or ends with any of those four, then that field will automatically be indexed. Now you can change this. So if I wanted to um, not index anything that begins with num, I could delete that out. And all I would need to do would be to replace it with something else. So I could say semicolon and maybe something like index now. So if I was to add a field which started or ended with index now, then that field will automatically be indexed. Now I don't want to do that, so I'm going to cancel out of here to cancel that change that I've made. And I'm also going to delete these three fields that I just added. Now the last thing I'd like to cover here briefly is compact and repair. And as part of your normal maintenance function on your database, you should be running this on a regular basis. So this is important when you have a lot of indexes as it rebuilds all of the indexes. So if your database has been running for a long time, it will tidy up all of the tables and rebuild the indexes. And that will normally mean that from that point onwards, your database will run with maximum efficiency, at least for a period of time. So I strongly recommend running compact and repair on your database. And you can find that option if you go into the backstage area, clicking on file, you have that option there in the info tab, compact and repair database. So that is it for this module. I will see you in the next one. Hello again and welcome back to our course on Access Advanced 2019. In this and the next couple of sections, we're going to be taking a look at Datasheet View. Now, Datasheet View is something that you should be reasonably familiar with, but in this section, we're going to concentrate on some of the more advanced features. Now, to do this, we're going to use a different sample database. We're going to use the standard sample database from Microsoft, the Northwind database. So in this module, I'm going to show you how to set it up. Now, if you have already got this database set up, as I said, it is a fairly common one to use from Microsoft, then you can skip this module. 
Now in older versions of Access, in order to set up the Northwind database, you had to download it, which wasn't too much of a problem, but it's now been made a lot simpler. All you need to do is jump into New, and in the search bar just here, if you just type in Northwind and press Enter, it will pull back that Northwind database. So really very simple to find it. I'm going to click on the Northwind database. Again, you can see here it's provided by Microsoft and this is the sample database template, which demonstrates how Access can manage small business, customers, orders, inventory, purchasing suppliers, so on and so forth. Now you can also see here the download size, which is just about two meg, which really isn't a huge size. But even so, when you click create, it may take a few seconds just to download. And there we go. There is our sample template. Now, as always, you'll probably get this standard security warning. So I know that this template has come from Microsoft, which is a trusted source. So I'm just going to say enable content. Now, remember that you could move the database into a trusted location so that that doesn't pop up. But for now, I'm fairly happy just clicking enable content. And then what you'll see is that you're given the option to log into the Northwind database. And you'll see it comes up with a, a default user of Andrew Sincini. And things like this login dialog we're going to cover a little bit later on in the course. So I'm just going to click login. And there we have the home page for the Northwind database. Now, the last thing I'm going to do is I'm going to save this database into the course files folder. So that might be of use for any of you that can't download the template at this moment in time. So you can use mine or you can do it this way and save your own copy. So I'm going to go to file and I'm going to go down to save as. I'm going to save my database as an access database and click the save as button. I'm going to browse to my location, which is the course files folder, and I'm going to give it a file name of so I've given this a file name of Simon Says It, Northwind Traders A01.acdb. And I'm going to click on Save. And because I've saved it as a new file name, I need to enable content again. And I also need to log in again. So let me just do that. And there we go. We're now ready to go. So in the next section, I'm going to explain more fully the use of this database, and then we'll get into using Datasheet View. So I will see you then. Hello again, and welcome back to our course on Access Advanced 2019. In this module, we're going to be taking a further look at working in Datasheet View. And we're going to build on some of the basics that we learnt in the previous course and look at some more advanced topics. So for this, you're going to need to have the Northwind database open. And in this module, we're going to first start to look at a necessary update query. We're then going to look at navigation and keyboard shortcuts in Datasheet View. We're going to look at finding records, how you can add and change records, and finally, how you can delete multiple records. Now, one thing I'd like you to know is the heading there on the title bar. So it says Northwind Traders A01. So hopefully you can remember how to change that up there, and that will allow you to keep track of the versions. Now, some of the tables in this database, including the orders table, have dates in them. Now, if this is the first time that you've downloaded the Northwind database from Microsoft, what you'll probably notice is that your dates are going to be different to the ones that I have here. So basically what I've done is I've updated mine to reflect a more accurate date. So for example, I'm recording this course in November 2019. And so all of my dates, including all of the dates in the orders table, I've updated to reflect my current year. And you'll see if I scroll across, we have more dates in the paid date column as well. And you can see that I've updated those to 2019. Now, depending on when you're coming to this course, so it might be this year, it might be next year, or maybe even a few years in advance, this might be something that you want to do before you begin. You may want to update all of the dates to accurately reflect the year that you're coming to this course. Now, this isn't something that you have to do. It will just make it a little bit more relevant to you. 
And to help you out with that, I've actually written a small query which will go through and update these dates for you. So that really gets around the need to go in and manually change all of these records, which can be a little bit of a pain. If you would prefer to do it manually, then you can do it by selecting the column and going to replace and replacing whatever date you have in here or whatever year you have in here with your current year. That's a way around doing that. However, alternatively, in the course files folder, you will find a file. It's an SQL query and you'll see it has a .sql file extension. It is essentially just a text file and it's the one I use to take the dates in the orders and change them into the dates you can see there. So please take a moment to review those dates before you get underway with following through in this part of the course. Now it's also important to recognize uh, Datasheet View is not just a tool for somebody with a very simple database. It's very often the case that users will use Datasheet View to update data. And it can be expensive to create forms for all kinds of maintenance on a database. So sometimes users do prefer this approach to maintaining their data. And it's important to understand some fundamental features of Datasheet View. So we're going to start out by looking at keyboard shortcuts. So I want to start by directing your attention, as always, to the help file. And you can see there I've just searched for keyboard shortcuts. And as we scroll down, you can see one of the topics is work in a datasheet view. And this will give you all of those useful keyboard shortcuts for working in datasheet view, moving around datasheet view. So you can see things in this table like move to the next field. You can press the tab key or the right arrow key, move to the last field in the current record, press the end key, move to the previous field, shift tab or left arrow. And there's a number of these in here, and these can really improve your efficiency when you're moving around or working in Datasheet View. So I would definitely recommend, even if you're not somebody who particularly uses a lot of keyboard shortcuts, I would definitely make yourself familiar with some of these because it really is going to improve the way that you work within Access. Now, if we scroll down a bit further, you'll see a section here which says work with sub data sheets. Now, you may not have come across sub data sheets before, and we are going to be looking a lot at sub data sheets in the next module. But it's also worth noting that there are keyboard shortcuts for working within sub data sheets as well. Next, let's look at some features of Find in Datasheet View. Now, one thing you may not have noticed is that you can determine if the find begins with just looking in the current field or in all fields by your initial selection. So, for example, if I put my cursor in the order field and then bring up find by pressing Control F, by default, I search in the current field. Generally speaking, Access will remember the last search term that you used. But if I just have that single field selected, it will default to looking in the current field. So I could now enter a search term of, say, Nancy and click Find Next. And it's not going to find it because it's just searching in that first column, essentially. Now, what if I cancel out of here? If I was to highlight the entire row and press Control F to bring up my find, you can see it now defaults to current document. So if I now type in Nancy and click Find Next, it's found her. Now, another page in help that can be very useful when using find is wildcard characters. So you might be familiar with some of them. So things like asterisk, question mark, square brackets. And I am going to demonstrate that last one in a moment and I'll leave you to work through the others. So here you have a list of all of the different wildcard characters that you can possibly use. I'm going to demonstrate the square brackets now. So let's close out of help. And in my order table, I'm going to make sure that I have a whole record selected. And we're going to do Control F to bring up Find. And this time I'm going to search for an square bracket A and E. Close my square bracket. So essentially what I'm doing there is I'm asking Access to find anyone called Anna 
or anyone called Anne. And I'm going to say find next. And there we go, it's found Anna Bedex down here. If I do find next again, it's found Anne Helen Larson. So it's matching both of the characters that appear within those square brackets. Now, when working in Datasheet View, you'll need to be able to add, change and delete records. Now, when you want to add a new record, sometimes I see people scrolling down to the bottom of the data sheet. But there are various ways of doing new without having to do that. So if you jump up to your ribbons, your home ribbon in the records group, we have a new button just there. So if we click new, it takes you down to the first column in a new record. Now, in this particular table, the order ID is an automated field. So I can't actually type anything into this field here. So if I tab across, so in this field, I'm going to click on the drop down and I'm going to select Andrew Cincini. And you'll see that as soon as it gets to the point where it's allocated that order ID auto number, the record I'm working on is now a record that's being edited. And you can see there is a new line at the bottom for the next new row. So essentially, when you've added enough information for access to recognize that you're currently working on a new record, it will give you that new record again at the bottom of your table. Now, when I've finished entering my record, I'm going to need to save. And again, up in that records group, you can see that you have a save button. Alternatively, you can use the keyboard shortcut shift and enter. Now, if when you save, Access recognizes that data is missing, you'll see a message pop up accordingly, which means it just requires a little bit more information added into the record before you can save. So let's give save a go and see what happens. Yep, I don't get an error message, so all looks good with that record. Now, I could move on to a new row and start adding another one. But the final thing I want to look at is deletion. And I'm going to delete this record that we've just added in. So if I wanted to delete, it's very simple. I can just select the record. I can press the delete key on my keyboard. I could go up to the records group and press delete up there. Or alternatively, I could right click and in my contextual menu, you can see I have a delete record option. Now, you'll always get this warning, just letting you know you're about to delete one record. And one important thing to note here is that you're not going to be able to undo this. So if you delete something and then think, oh, I really wish I hadn't have done that, undo will have no effect. So deleting is essentially permanent in this case. Another thing you can do is delete multiple records. So if I select this record just here, hold down my shift key, and select the record that's two below, it's going to highlight all of those records. And again, I could go in and I could delete this record in any of the ways that I've just shown you. Now, I don't actually want to do that, so I'm just going to click away from there. So I've just given you a run through of some of the basics for working with Datasheet View and maybe extended your knowledge in some of those areas. In the next module, we're going to look at how to control the display in Datasheet View and also some of the sorting and filtering options. So I will see you over there. Hello again and welcome back to our course on Access Advanced 2019. In this module, we're going to continue looking at Datasheet View and we're going to follow on from the idea from the previous section where there are many situations where you might use Datasheet View for data maintenance purposes and even things like querying a database. Now, there are many ways in which Access can help you. And in this module, I want to look at different ways you can arrange Datasheet View to make it more convenient to use. So we're going to start out by looking at how you can format Datasheet View. We're going to talk about reorganizing columns. We're going to start exploring sorting options and also filtering options. And finally, we will look at how you can add a totals row to do calculations. Now, for this section, I'm going to use the orders table in the Northwind database. 
and we're going to first look at formatting. Now, when you look at a table in data sheet view, the formatting is primarily dictated by a set of options you can change within the access options. So we're going to jump into the backstage area and go to options. So we're going to select file and straight down to options. And we're going to stay on this data sheet page. And you can see at the top here, we have grid lines and cell effects. So do I want horizontal and vertical grid lines in my table? Now, I don't really want that, so I'm going to keep those unchecked. I can have a default cell effect, which is currently set to flat. So I'm going to change that to raised just so you can see what this looks like. And I'm fairly happy with my font size and font weight. Now I'm going to click on OK. And what you'll see is that not much change is noticeable. And that's because in order to see any changes you've made to the formatting through options, you need to close the table and reopen it again. And there you can see now I have that kind of raised look to the borders of my cells or of my records, I should say. Now, it's also worth noting that if I was to double click to open another table, so order summary, you'll see that those same default settings now apply. I'm going to close order summary down. Now, I can also make local changes to the formatting that only apply to the currently selected data sheet view. So if I go to the home ribbon and I go over to my text formatting group and maybe I change the font from Calibri to, let's say this one just here, Berlin, Berlin Sans FB. And now if I open order summary again, you'll see that those changes haven't actually taken effect. So you can use that home ribbon to essentially make local changes which only apply to the current data sheet. And I'm going to close down order summary again. Now, when you make a change to something like font size, etc., it's very often you will need to be able to change column widths and row heights in order to be able to see all the data. If you select a font that's slightly bigger than the one you were using, you might not have enough room in your columns to accommodate the new size of that font. Now, it might be that you need to adjust the width on one or more of your columns, and that's a very simple thing to do. So, for example, if I take the employee column just here, if I right click, you'll see that we have an option in our contextual menu called field width. And I could come in here and manually type in an exact width, or alternatively, I could select this best fit option. And if I click that, it will essentially widen that column to the length of the longest item in that column. So it's going to accommodate everything in that column very nicely. Now, when it comes to row height, each row must be the same height. So if I was to go to a row, so let's say this one, for example, and if I right click my mouse and go to row height, and I'm going to change this to, let's say, 30. I'm going to click on OK, and you can see every row has been changed to the same row height. Now, one thing I'm going to do here is I'm going to change this font back to Calibri. So the point I'm really trying to get across here is that some formatting you do applies to the whole sheet and some to individual columns. So, for instance, let's suppose I took the ship city column and changed it to bold. So I'm going to go up to text formatting and click on bold. You'll notice that all of the text in the data sheet changes to bold and not just in the column. I'm going to unbold that. Now with the same column selected, I'm going to center align the contents. And you'll see that this only applies to the selected column. So some changes apply to the whole sheet and some to the selected column. Now, when you're using data sheet view, the order of the columns or fields in the table is the same as the order in the table design. And that might be something that you want to change. So for example, if you're doing a lot of sorting and filtering, you might want to move the columns that you're sorting and filtering next to each other, even if it's just temporarily. And it's very simple to change the order of the columns. So for example, I want to move this ship city column 
over to the right of the customer column. So all I need to do is make sure I have it selected, click on it, and as I drag, you can see I get that big black line. So wherever that black line is, when I let go of my mouse, it's going to move that column to that location. And I'm actually going to move that column back to where it was. I could also, if I wanted to move multiple columns, I could highlight those columns. I can click and I can drag and it will move all three of those columns. So again, I'm just going to move those back. Something else you can do to make this a little bit easier is that you can hide or unhide columns. So for example, if I never needed to change any data that appears in this ship via column, I could right click it and you'll see that I have a hide fields option. And that kind of just hides it away. So that field hasn't been deleted, it's still there. It's just not currently in my view. If you want to unhide any columns that you've currently got hidden, if you right click your mouse and go to unhide fields, anything that doesn't have a tick next to it is currently hidden. So I can just click ship via and close and that column is now back. Now, something else you may not know with Access is that it's fairly similar to Excel with regards to freezing fields. So if you are an Excel user, you may be familiar with the functionality of freeze panes. Well, Access has something very similar. So say, for example, I wanted to always keep order ID and the employee column visible even as I was scrolling across all of this data. Well, I can just freeze the two columns. So I can select them, right click, and you'll see we have a freeze fields option. So now when I scroll across, you can see the order ID and employee stay where they are, and I can compare them against every column in my data sheet. If you want to unfreeze these panes, I'm sure you can guess where we're going with this. Right click your mouse and you have unfreeze all fields. So next we're going to look at sorting. Now sorting on individual fields is simple enough. So if I wanted to sort on customer, I can select that column, right click and I have a sort A to Z or a sort Z to A. Now remember, what you see in this contextual menu is somewhat determined by the type of data that you have in the column. So for example, if I was to click on this shipped date column, where we have dates in here as opposed to text, when I right click, I now get sort oldest to newest or sort newest to oldest. So this contextual menu will change depending on what column you're sorting on. Now, in Access, you're not restricted to sorting on just a single field. You can sort on multiple fields. And if you cast your eyes up onto the Home ribbon into this Sort and Filter group, you can see we have an Advanced drop-down. And we have an option for Advanced Filter and Sort. Now, when we click this, it will take you into a screen which I'm hoping will look reasonably familiar to you, particularly if you've worked through the Access Beginners course. And what we can do here is we can take our fields from our orders table. So in this top half of the screen, we have a graphical representation of all of the fields in our orders table. And the bottom half, we have a grid structure. So we can use this grid, which is basically the standard query grid, and use it to sort the order of the table. Now, I'm not going to go into how you do this right now, but we will be looking at this a bit later on in the course. But you could build a pretty complex sort using this approach. Now, you can sort on multiple fields just by making sure they are in the correct order from left to right across the datasheet view. So if I wanted to sort by ship via and ship city, so all I would really need to do here is make sure that the ship fire column is to the left of the ship city column, which it is. And I'm actually just going to move this one next to ship fire just to make it a little bit easier. So whichever one is further to the left, Access will assume that that's the first one that you want to sort on. So if I now select ship fire, right click and do sort A to Z, 
you'll see that it sorts it. So I have shipping company A and then I have shipping company B, so on and so forth, but it hasn't sorted ship city. However, if I was to select both of these columns, right click and do sort A to Z. So what you'll now see is that the sort is based on both of those fields. So for shipping company A, we have all the ship cities in alphabetical order, so on and so forth down the list. Now I'm actually going to remove both of these sorts and again if you glance up to the home ribbon in the sort and filter group you can see you have an option to remove sort and that essentially resets everything back to how it was. Now I've just gone in and reset some of those formatting options back to how they were originally just so everything's a little bit easier to see because the last thing I want to talk to you about is filtering. Now, one of the reasons this is important if you're using Datasheet View for maintenance is if you have a very large number of records, you can filter just to find the records you need to work on. And I'm going to assume that you are somewhat familiar with filtering. Now, we're going to do a filter on ship name. And you'll see if we click the drop down just there, we do have a number of different filters we could use. We have some text filters. And we could also make our various different selections depending on what we want to see in our filter. But before we do this, I want to point out a couple of things. Down here in the navigation bar right at the bottom, there is a filter on off toggle button. It currently says no filter. And you can use this button to toggle on or off a filter or specific filters. And you can use this as an alternative to the filter we've just shown. And what you probably didn't know is that you can select the value you want to filter on before you apply the filter. So for instance, if I click in the ship name, if I click in where it says Christina Lee, and then go up to my sort and filter group and click this selection drop down, you will see I have a number of text filters that are already based on that selection, Christina Lee. So if I wanted to filter for records that are equal to Christina Lee, in the ship name field. I can apply that now and it pulls back those five records. Now notice that that filter toggle in the navigation bar is now showing as filtered. And if I click on this button, it's going to change it to unfiltered and my whole list is back again. Now even though that I've unfiltered this set of records, Notice that it remembers that there's a filter in existence. So if I click this button once again, it's going to rerun that last filter I applied for Christina Lee on the ship name column. So now let me apply a second filter. So we're going to say ship via. And in this case, I'm just going to select shipping company C. So in this case, I have a composite filter. I have the ship name of Christina Lee and I have a ship via shipping company C. And once again, if I use this toggle at the bottom, I can go from my filtered records to my unfiltered records and back again. Now, just a couple of final points with regards to filtering. If you go back up to that advanced drop down, you'll see that the second option down is filter by form. So the currently applied filter is in force. We have a specific value for ship name and a specific value for shipping company C. But I could go in and apply a specific date and build up a complex filter in that way. Also, if we jump back up to advanced, if I go into advanced filter and sort, it will take me back into a grid where I can build up a complex sort filter using the querying approach that we're going to look at later on in this course. So I'm just going to jump in and I'm going to clear all filters to put my data back to how it was originally. And the very last thing I want to show you is that along with Microsoft Excel, you can have a totals row in Datasheet View in Access. So where you have any number of records and some of them hold numeric data, if you want to do things like determine totals of columns, maybe the maximum, the minimum, or maybe even the average of columns, you can do those by applying a totals row. So again, in the records group, you see we have an option for totals. 
And it's as simple as that. If we scroll down to the bottom, you can see we have our totals row. Now there's currently nothing in that totals row because we need to tell Access what kind of calculation we want to do. So for example, if I go to something like shipping fee, maybe I want to see the total amount of all of the shipping fees. So if I click the drop down, I'm going to choose a sum calculation in here. If I wanted to do something like a min or a max, if I go to order date, and click the drop down. Maybe I want to find the earliest order date. So that would mean doing a minimum in this column. And I can see the earliest order date is February the 15th, 2019. So that totals row is very straightforward. If you want to turn it off, just go back to records and click on totals again, and that will remove that row. So we've covered quite a lot in this module. That's the end of this section. I will see you in the next one. Hello again, and welcome back to our course on Access Advanced 2019. In this module, we're going to be taking a look at sub data sheets. Now, when you're working in data sheet view, and if you need to update and modify data, it may seem as though you are restricted to working on one table at a time. But it is possible to show more than one table in data sheet view, and also show tables that are linked together in one to one or one to many relationships. So in this module, we're going to have an introduction to sub data sheets. I'm going to show you how you can add a sub data sheet. We're going to learn how to remove or hide a sub data sheet. I'll show you how you can open and close sub data sheets. And finally, I will show you how to add and update data in data sheet view using sub data sheets. So we're going to start with our S reader tour database. And I really want to look at the relationships within this database. Now, if you haven't done our beginners course, you may not be as familiar with relationships, but I'm currently in Tubal Trip and I've opened up the relationships window and you can see there is Tubal Trip table in the top corner. And for a trip, there are a number of tours which are specific instances of a trip. So we also have trips going to many countries and also a trip can have many types. Now, the relationship I'm most interested in is the trip to tour relationship. Now, if I go back to the trip table in data sheet view, you can see along the left some plus signs. And if there is a sub data sheet for this data sheet, if I click on the plus sign, I will see entries in the sub data sheet. So I'm going to click on the plus to the left of iconic Italy. And what comes up is a dialogue. Now I'm going to come back to this dialogue box a little bit later on. So for now, I'm just going to click on cancel. So if there is a sub data sheet, you will access the records in the sub data sheet using those plus signs. And when you have used it, it turns into a minus sign. But more on that later. Now let's click on the plus again and bring up that dialogue. So this is telling me that there isn't currently a sub data sheet added to this data sheet. So I'm going to cancel again and I'm going to add one. So I'm going to make sure my record is selected. I'm going to go to the records group. I'm going to click on this more drop down and you can see I have an option in the middle there for sub data sheet. Now you can add a sub data sheet to correspond to another table or query. And we're going to concentrate on tables. And the sub data sheet we're going to add is the tour sub data sheet. So I'm going to select Tubal Tour. Now, when I select that, it will display in the two fields at the bottom the linked fields in these two tables. And they are the same two tables you will see linked in the relationships diagram for this database. So the child field, and that is the field in the child record, and that's the tour record is trip code and the field it's linked to in the master record and that is in the trip record is the code in the trip record. Now normally when you do this access will correctly identify the linked child fields and linked master fields.
So I'm going to click on OK to add. Now, still at this stage, there is still no real evidence that a sub data sheet exists. So let's click on the plus next to Iconic Italy again. And now you can see the list of tours for that trip. So these are all of the tour records for the trip, which has the code ITI. And in fact, if you look through the Tubal Tour table and identify all of the tours for which the trip code is ITI, you will see that all of these are the tours. Now, one thing to make clear, you can't have multiple sub data sheets. So in this case, from the top level trip records. So you couldn't show sub data sheets for tours and countries at the same time, but you can nest them. So having set up at the top level the trip record in the data sheet and then the sub data sheet showing the tours, if you have a relationship between tour records and some other records in your database, that had a one-to-one -one or one-to-many relationship with tour records, then under each of these tour records, you could put a lower level sub data sheet linked to each of these. So for instance, you might want to show all of the bookings for each of the individual tours. And maybe for bookings, you could show all of the names of the individual people that have booked onto each tour. And in fact, you can go down to a nesting level of eight. So using this method, it can give you a really sophisticated structure. Now, there may come a point in time where you want to remove or hide a sub data sheet. So first of all, you need to make sure that you have a record selected. Then we're going to go up to our records group and click on more. Go down to sub data sheet and you'll see you have an option there for remove. So if I remove this sub data sheet, you'll see now that that's gone. And if I click on the plus now next to iconic Italy, it takes me back to that insert sub data sheet dialog box. Now, let me just put that tubal tour back on again. And it's worth noting that one other way that you can do that is to use the properties of the table because the current sub data sheet is a property. So let me go into the design of the trip table and I'm going to bring up the property sheet. And you can see in the properties sheet, the one option we have there is sub data sheet name. And what I can do is click the drop down and change that to none. And then when I go back to my trip table, and click on the plus next to Iconic Italy, you'll see that that sub data sheet has been removed again. So that's an alternative way of removing sub data sheets. Now, once again, I'm going to put that sub data sheet back again. Now, one other thing is that if I've got the sub data sheet open for a particular record, I can close it again by clicking on the minus. And again, if you jump up to that more drop down and go to sub data sheet, you'll see that you have an expand all and a collapse all. So if I click expand all, it's going to expand out all of those sub data sheets. And I could effectively do the reverse and collapse up all of them. Now, finally, in this section, we're going to look at data maintenance. Now, one of the reasons for using sub data sheets is that people use them for data maintenance. For straightforward situations, they are particularly convenient, but as a general rule, I avoid using sub data sheets if other people are going to be updating this data. I would generally consider it to be safer to give people forms to update data with. But if your users are safe and pretty skilled at working with data sheets, then you might want to give them access to do that. So let's suppose in this case, I'm going to maintain the tour information about the iconic Italy trip. And one of the things I'm going to do is increase the price for the last trip on the list. So I'm going to increase this from $2,320 to $2,520. And we're also going to add a new tour. Now note that the child price here is zero, and that's because this is an adults only trip. So the maintenance of the data in Datasheet view works pretty well. I can delete old tours, although I would say I probably wouldn't want to do that. I tend to like to hang on to old tours for historical or reporting reasons. But you can certainly let people update data in Datasheet view using sub data sheets. 
Now, a couple of things to note here. By default, when you add a sub data sheet, you get all of the fields in the relevant record. So in this case, start date, price adult and price child. You can, of course, hide those fields if you don't need them. So if I right click on price child, I can hide that field. And when you add a record using the sub data sheet approach, in the underlying tour record, the trip code ITI is auto added on the basis that you are looking at the sub data sheet for ITI. So I'm going to now save this as version 22 and I will see you in the next section. Hello again and welcome back to our course on Access Advanced 2019. In this module, I'm going to be setting you exercise one. And exercise one is not quite as straightforward as it might first seem. However, if you are pretty good with queries, you should be able to figure it out without too many issues. Now, all I want you to do is to add a sub data sheet to the genre table. I'm just going to open up the genre table. And all I want you to do is make sure that we can just see the names of the biopic movies. So I want it to look like this, just the names. So there is a bit of a challenge for you. My solution for this exercise is in the exercise folder and it corresponds to version A22 of the Night Movies database in the Course Files folder. So that's it for exercise one. I will see you in the next section. Hello again and welcome back to our course on Access Advanced 2019. In this module, we're going to be taking a look at how you can link tables to other access databases. So we're going to start out with some background to the features. I'm going to talk through with you the difference between importing and linking. I'm going to show you how you can establish relationships between linked tables. I'm going to show you how to use the linked table manager. And finally, I'm going to show you how you can remove a link. So let's look at the background to the requirements we're going to consider in this module. Now, Access has been around for a long time and traditionally it's been based on a single file. It was a desktop based database system and one file would contain all of the data. So that's all of the tables, forms, queries, reports, etc. And as time went on, this restriction of putting everything in one file became more and more difficult, particularly when you get a few different people wanting to share a single database. So giving them all access to one file and essentially keeping them all in step and making sure one didn't delete things, etc. Those considerations became more and more important. Another factor is that as access databases became more significant, they very often contain data that was useful to other databases or other applications. So it became more and more important to be able to access data in access databases from other databases. So that is essentially where the requirement to link to other databases has come from. Now, if you think about the Northwind Traders database, it contains a lot of information about invoice orders, forms and reports, but it also contains information about customers and information about customers tends to be used widely in a business context. And in order to demonstrate linking to tables in other databases, what I'm going to do is to create a tiny demo database. So just the beginnings of a CRM or a customer relationships database management system. And in doing that, I'm going to access some of the customer information that is already in the Northwind Traders database. Now, as a point of review, let's open up the customers table. And you'll see here that each customer has a unique ID and a customer is basically a company in this case. Now, bearing that in mind, we're going to create a new database. So let's close this one. And I'm going to create a new blank database.
So I'm going to save this in my course files folder with a name that includes CRM, Customer Relationship Management Database, just so I can easily identify it. So there is my first version of my CRM database. Now the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to add a table which will record each contact I have with my customers. And it's going to be a very simple table. It's just going to contain the customer ID, the type of contact and a couple of other pieces of basic information. So I'm going to go away and create that table now and I'll come back to you in a few seconds. So here is the design. Now each customer contact record has a unique ID. That's the first field there. And note that that is also the primary key field. The second field is customer ID. So that must correspond to the ID of an existing customer. And at the moment, I only have this table, so I have no customer details. But what I'm going to do is access the customer IDs from the Northwind Traders database. So in this database, I'm going to say you can only put in customer contact details for customers that exist in the Northwind Traders database. Now, the other three fields we have there are contact types. So that might be something like email or phone. We have contact date, which will include the time. And finally, notes about this contact. Now, at the moment, all I'm interested in here is that second field, the customer ID. Now, given that I want to access data in another database, I'm going to close down this table. I'm going to go up to the external data tab. And within this import and link group, if you click the drop down underneath new data source and hover your mouse over the from database option, you'll see that one of the options we have is from access. And in this dialogue or this wizard, you're really just required to make two choices. And the first one is where to locate the data that you want to get. So I'm going to browse to the course files folder and select the Northwind database. Now it's worth pointing out here that once you've located where you're getting your data from, if you move that database to another location, another folder, it's likely to cause you a few problems. So you really need to understand how Access deals with that situation when you move a database. And we're going to look at that a little bit later on. Now, the second choice that you have is if you want to import or if you want to link. Now, in this case, we could import the table into this CRM database. I could say I want to take a copy of the Northwind Traders database customer table. And once I've taken the copy and imported it, in effect, the connection would be lost. So it would be that I've taken this as my starting point from now on, and I'm going to use that data, but it might change in the customer table, which wouldn't reflect because I'm just doing essentially a download or an import of that particular table or database at that particular time. Now, if what you really want to do is not import it, but instead leave it in the Northwind Traders database so it will be maintained, then you would select to link rather than import. So essentially what we're going to do here is we're going to create a linked table and click on OK. And you'll be given a list of available tables. Now, the one I'm interested in here is the customers table and click on OK. And what you'll see now is that I have my two tables in my CRM database. And one of them, the customers table, has a little blue arrow that indicates it's a linked table. Now, just some important points on this. Being able to do this will depend on the security on the Northwind Traders database. And if you're using that, that's fine. But if you're using this with one of your own databases, just bear in mind that some databases may not have enough access rights to be able to do this. Now, the second point on this is that I sometimes rename these link tables to remind me which database I'm getting this data from. So I might rename this customers table to be NWT for Northwind Traders underscore customers. And remember that when you're changing the name here, it doesn't essentially change it in the Northwind Traders database. 
And if I wanted to look at that data, I can double click to open it up. And it seems to be absolutely fine. I can see all of that information. Now I'm just going to close that down again. Now one other thing to note is that if I wanted to go into design view to make any changes, the chances are that I'm going to get a warning and it tells me the table is a linked table whose design can't be modified. If I wanted to change the design, I would need to do it in the source. Now I can choose to open it anyway, so if I want to look at the design I can, but I'm not going to be able to make any changes to that particular design. So let's look at one or two of these fields. I'm going to click in that company field. Now notice that it says in the bottom right hand corner, this property cannot be modified in linked tables. So again, I can look, but I can't change anything. Now let's close this design and go up into database tools because I want to look at relationships next. And I'm going to add both of these tables. So I've held down my control key, selected them both, and I'm going to click on add. Now what I want to do is I want to set up a relationship between the ID in the Northwind Traders database and the customer ID in the customer contact table in the CRM database. So we know how to do this. We've done it before. We can click on ID. We drag and drop it onto customer ID. So I'm just going to quickly check that that all looks OK. So we have ID in the NWT customers table linking to customer ID in the Tubble customer contact table. And that all looks good. Now, one thing that's worth pointing out is that I am unable to enforce referential integrity. You can see that option is grayed out. And that's because this option you just can't do with linked tables. So I'm going to click create to create that relationship. Now you can use the relationship for different useful purposes. So for example, when you are adding a record to the customer context table, you can perhaps bring up a list of the available customers in the Northwind Traders database customers table and select one of those. But if someone who is working in the Northwind Traders database tries to delete a customer that you've used in the CRM database, they won't be prevented from doing so. Now, I mentioned earlier that if you move a database that contains one or more linked tables, it can cause you some problems. And there is a tool in the external data ribbon that can help you identify and resolve some of these problems, and it's called the linked table manager. Now there's only one linked table and if at any stage I wanted to check it's OK, if I select it and click on OK, Access will check that all the linked tables can be successfully accessed and I can see there that mine is OK. And I'm going to close that window. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to move that database and I'm going to put it temporarily into a different location. Now, having done that, let me try and open the customers table. And you can see here I'm getting a message that it cannot find the file. Let's go to the linked table manager. Select our table and click on OK. Now, instead of telling me that everything is OK, it opens up File Explorer so that I can browse to find where that database has now gone. So all I would need to do is browse to where I've got it stored off. And there we go. We're back to saying that everything is OK. And just to double check, let's now try and open the customer's database. And there we go. Now, one other thing that's worth bearing in mind, if you are dealing with a very large table, so let's suppose this link table has thousands and thousands of huge records in it, and there are only a few records you're going to use, you can link queries. So essentially, you could create a query that just gets the fields you want from that table and link the query to the linking database. Now, I'm just going to close out of this and I'm going to go away and move that table back to where it should be. And finally, if you want to unlink a table, that's very straightforward. Just right click and you can delete the link. So let's click on delete. And it's worth noting that this doesn't delete the table in the Northwind Traders database. It just deletes 
the link. And you can see that that is explained in this reassuring warning message before we actually proceed. So I'm going to say yes. And my linked table is gone. That's it in this section. I will see you in the next one. Hello again and welcome back to our course on Access Advanced 2019. In this module we're going to look at ODBC and SQL Server in relation to Access 2019. Now as we've mentioned before, Access used to be a single file database system. And that single file contained the data and the user interface components such as forms and reports. And also that as time has gone on, this simple model has needed to expand and change. Now we've already looked at accessing access tables in one database from a different access database. And now we're going to take this one step further. So we're going to say that in access, you can use data that isn't held in access databases, but in other database systems. So Access can use data that's in any ODBC compliant databases. And fortunately, one ODBC compliant database is Microsoft's very own SQL Server. So in this section, we're going to explain a little more about open database connectivity. I'm going to show you how you can acquire SQL Server Express. I'm going to show you how you can download it and also install it how you can set up some sample data in SQL Server Express. And then in the next section, I will show you how to access that data using Access 2019. But first, let's talk a little bit about ODBC. So ODBC is a standard whereby providing a database system is ODBC compliant, then the data management side of it is interchangeable with other ODBC compliant database systems. So if we're using the example from the preceding section and I need some customer data from my new CRM database, Provided it's an ODBC compliant database, then Access should be able to handle it. However, in terms of this course and showing you how all of this works, we do have a couple of challenges. So one of them is that you may well not have access to an ODBC compliant database system. If you do, then you're going to be fine and you can work through this with me. If you don't, then one option you have is installing and setting up an ODBC compliant database yourself on your PC. And that is essentially what I'm going to go through in this section. Now, if you don't have the permission, the time or even the space on your PC to do this, then that's absolutely fine. But it is still worth you working through this module with me to gain a greater understanding of how it all works. Now the ODBC compliance system we're going to install is SQL Server Express, and that is free from Microsoft. So you won't need to spend any money in order to work through this. Now I mentioned that we have a couple of challenges. The second challenge that we have is that when installing this system, there are many, many options. So it might be that you're doing this on Windows 7 or maybe Windows 8, or maybe like me on Windows 10. So essentially, I can't demonstrate this as though it were a lesson because my system might be different to the one that you're using. So this really is more of a demonstration of how you would do it. Now, if you already have an ODBC compliant database set up and available to you, then most of this section you won't need. However, I will say at the end of this video, I will be showing you how to acquire some data that we're going to use in the next section because in the next section, I'll be showing you how to access the data from Access 2019. Now, SQL Server is Microsoft's ODBC compliant database system, and it comes in a number of different editions. Now, the page we're looking at here on Microsoft.com will probably have changed by the time you come to this page. They do tend to change their information and the way their pages look quite a bit. But the general principles will remain the same. So what I'm essentially saying here is that 
if when you come to this course, the page you go to looks slightly different to the one I'm using, the information is still going to be on there. You just might have to hunt around for it a little bit. Now from here, I'm just going to click on this Try Now button. And you can see that I have a two different versions that I could download if I wanted to. So I have SQL Server 2019 on-premise and SQL Server 2019 on Azure. Now, if you scroll down a little bit, it says or download a free specialized edition. And we have a developer edition and an express edition. And it's this express edition that we're going to be looking at. Now, before we download, there is one thing that you need to do. You really need to find out if you are running a 64-bit or a 32-bit version of Windows. And if you're not sure about that, the way you can do it is to go to Control Panel. And then if you click on System, and remember I'm using Windows 10 here, so the options you see might be slightly different, but you'll normally have something called System or System Type. And underneath here, it will say system type. And you can see here, mine says 64-bit operating system. So I'm just going to make a mental note of that. So let's now download SQL Server 2019 Express. And as usual, by default, everything that you download will go into your downloads folder. And I can see my bottom bar here, it's a .exe file. And this download here is essentially a management tool, and that will manage the download of SQL Server Express itself. So I've clicked on it to run it, and I'm going to say yes. And now what we have is the Express Edition dialog box, and it's asking us to choose an installation type, and we're just going to do a basic installation. I'm going to accept those license terms, and then I need to check my install location. So currently it's going to save to C Program Files, Microsoft SQL Server, and I can change that location if I want to. Now I'm happy with that, so I'm going to say Install. Now you can see at this stage, it hasn't yet asked me if I have a 64 or 32 bit system. And depending on the choices you've made, you may or may not actually need that information, but it is useful to know just in case you are asked. Because once you're in the process of installing, it's quite hard to go back to control panel and look that information up. So you can see what it's doing is two things here. So it's downloading that SQL Express Server Manager, and it's also installing the software. And this can sometimes take a few minutes, so you're going to need to be a little bit patient. Now, once the installation is complete, you should see a message saying that it's been successful. And it's important to note the information on this page. So you're going to need to make a note of the instance name. So in this case, SQL Express. Then underneath that, we have SQL Administrators, and that's just linking to my laptop and my username, so the account that I'm logged in as. We've then got some information about the features installed, and then finally we have the version. So take a picture of that just to keep it safe somewhere or write it down, because you're going to need this information later on. And the final thing you need to look at here is that connection string at the top. And you can see that there's a button to the right. If you hover over it, it becomes active. And if we click it, that's going to copy that connection string to your clipboard. And what I'm going to do is I'm just going to paste that temporarily into Notepad. I'm going to minimize that down. And we're going to use it a bit later on. Now, the other thing I suggest you do is to install SSMS, which is the SQL Server Management System. And this will make it a lot easier for you to see, update, or enter data into SQL Server Express. So that's what we're going to do next. We're going to install SSMS. And that will take you to this Downloads page. So you can see I have Download SSMS selected in the left-hand panel. And I have a link here, so let's just go ahead and download that. And again, that's going to go to your default folder of downloads, unless you set downloads to go to a different location. Again, this can take a few minutes. So again, you need to be patient and wait for this download to finish. So I can see my downloads now finished. So I want to run it. It is an exe file. So I'm going to click on it. 
And here we have the installer. So again, we've got the location that it's going to install into, and I am happy with that. I could change that if I wanted to. And you can see underneath it says, by clicking the install button, I acknowledge and I accept the license terms and privacy statement. So we're going to click on install. Now, when this setup is completed, you'll see this dialog. And the only option we have there is to close. Now, I will say that sometimes you are required to restart your machine. It didn't ask me to do that in this case. But if you do get that message, then you will need to restart your laptop or your PC or whatever it is that you're using. Now, the last thing we will need is some sample data. And if you've used an earlier version, you will be aware of a database called the Adventure Works database. And this has been used as sample data for SQL Server for a long time, and particularly this Wide World Importers sample database. And we're going to need some data for this in order to use it in the next section. So to find this data, you have two options. There is a version of it in the Course Files folder, which you could use, or you could jump onto this website and get the latest version from the web. And you can see here, it just says SQL Server, Samples, we have the Wide World Importers Sample Database. And the version that we want to download here is the Wide World Importers DW-Full.Back. So that is the full sample database. And you want the one that says OLAP. So you can click on this link to download it. And I'm going to save this in the course files folder. So it's entirely up to you if you want to use the one in the course files folder or come on here to get the latest version. So we pretty much have everything set up for the next module. So I will see you over there. Hello again, and welcome back to our course on Access Advanced 2019. In this section, we're going to continue using Access with ODBC and with Microsoft SQL Server in particular. So in the previous section, we downloaded and installed SQL Server Express. We also downloaded the SQL Server Management Studio, and we downloaded a backup of the standard Microsoft Sample SQL Server database, the Wide World Importers database. And we're going to take all of this and we're going to put it all together. So we're going to start by restoring the Wide World Importers database from backup into the SQL Server. Then we're going to browse the database in SSMS. We're then going to create something called a DSN. And then we're going to use that DSN to make some of the data in the Wide World Importers database available to us in Access 2019. So we have a backup of the Wide World Importers database, or perhaps you grabbed it from the Course Files folder. And what we're going to do now is to restore that backup as though it were our own into our local instance of SQL Server. And to do that, I'm going to use SSMS. And we're going to need to run this as administrator. So the first thing I'm going to do is find the software. And I can see there it is under my recently added list. I'm going to right click my mouse. I'm going to go to more and select run as administrator. Now, one of the things I need to explain here is that I will be explaining enough so that you know what's happening. But just remember that this isn't a SQL server or an SSMS training session. Now, the first thing I need to explain is that with SSMS, you can connect to a number of database servers. And database servers can be different physical devices, maybe devices that are on a network. They might be your own computer, the one that you're running SMS on, for example. And they may not actually be different servers. They might be different database servers on the same device. So it's extremely flexible, but it can also be a little bit confusing. Now, for the purpose of this section, you only need to bear in mind that we are trying to connect to that instance of SQL Server Express that we downloaded and installed in the preceding section. 
So in this connect dialog box, I need to put in a server name. Now this is the information that you should have made a note of earlier when we were installing. So what I have here in server name is essentially uh, the name of my PC followed by the server instance, the instance name. And that is what you should have made a note of earlier. And it's already populated mine for me, SQL Express, which if I check my notes is exactly the one that I had written down. I need to make sure that I have Windows authentication selected. And the username you can see has been populated. And that in this case is the administrator, which is me. So again, I have my laptop listed there, followed by my username. And I'm going to click on connect. So I'm now connected to my instance of SQL Server. And if you look on the left in the Object Explorer, you'll see that I have my name at the top. So let's just drag this out, make it a bit bigger. So we have my name at the top. And then underneath that, I have a tree view control. And the very first entry is database. Now, currently, I only have system databases. And those are the ones involved in managing the SQL Server itself. But I also have these database snapshots, which currently are empty. I don't have anything in there. So now what I need to do is to attach the wide world importers file, and then I'll be able to browse. So I'm going to need to restore that from backup. And it's very simple to do. If we just click on databases and then right click, you'll see that one of the options that we have in the menu is restore database. Now, the first thing I need to do here is select my source. And the source for this is going to be device. And what I now need to do is to browse and find the backup file. So I'm going to click Add. And what I need to do now is to find that backup file, which if you remember was in the course files folder. So I'm going to browse to that location. And of course, if I browse to that folder, I'll find that file wide world importers DW full backup. So I'm going to select it and click on OK. And that's the only one I'm going to restore from. So I'm going to click on OK and it loads in. And you'll notice that SSMS fills in the rest of this information for me. And I'm going to click on OK again. And after a while, you notice that you'll get this message that says database wide world importers DW restored successfully. So I can click on OK. And now you'll see under databases, I have wide world importers DW. And if I click the plus, I can now see the structure of that database. Now it's worth remembering that this is a SQL server database and not an access database but there are some commonalities between the two. For example, SQL Server databases have tables. And if I wanted to look in a table, I could browse to where it says tables here and just expand that tree. And I can see all of the tables within that database. And if I wanted to look a bit further into a table, I could browse that table. So for example, if we take this table just here, dimension.supplier, I could right click and I could say select the top a thousand rows if I wanted to. And this takes me in. So I have my a thousand rows in the bottom pane and then I have my code in the top. And if you are interested in SQL Server and SSMS, then you can look a bit further into this. As I said, this isn't a training session on SQL essentially. But there's a whole host of training courses and information out there if this does interest you. And we're going to use a little bit of this table in Access, and it's going to be used in our CRM table. And the table we're going to use is this dimension.supplier table. So just keep that in your mind because we're going to come back to that. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to close down this SSMS. So I need to explain to you before we move on what a DSN or a data source name is. So let's suppose you want access to be able to use the worldwide suppliers database. And in some way, you need to tell access what it is and where it is. So we need to tell it it's an ODBC compliant database, what server it's on. We need to tell it what SQL Express instant it uses 
and then what tables we want. So first, what we need to do is we need to tell it where to look. And the way we make other entities on our system able to see an ODBC compliant database is to create a data source name. And we do that from control panel. So bring up your control panel. And we're going to jump into this first option here, administrative tools. And you'll see here you have two files, so ODBC data sources 32 bit and ODBC data sources 64 bit. So that's why it's important to remember what your system is actually running. And if you remember back to when we last came into control panel, mine is 64 bit. So I'm going to need to run this as administrator. So I'm going to right click and I'm going to select run as administrator. Now there are three different types of DSN and in this case we're going to create one using the third type of file DSN. So we're going to jump across to file DSN tab and you really don't need to worry about all of the other information in these other tabs. Now what you see here might be different to what I see as it really completely depends on what's on your system already but we're going to be adding a brand new file DSN. So we're going to click on the add button and you have options for which driver you want to set up a data source for. So for us, this is SQL server and you could at this stage then click on next to move through that wizard. But if you know all of the information that you need to add, which we do because we made a note of it earlier, you can set it up through advanced. So if you look here, it's telling us what we need to add into this little panel here. So we need to add the server and also the database. So I'm going to click underneath where it says driver and we're going to type in server equals and then we're going to grab our server name. And again, yours is probably going to be different to mine because the server in my case is my laptop and this is my entire laptop name. And then we have the instance, which was SQL Express. And we also need to add the database. So database equals wide world importers DW. Now, if you are typing these in manually, just make sure that you've got the spelling exactly correct before you move on. So I'm fairly happy with that. I'm going to say OK. And I'm going to click on Next. And we're going to give this data source a DSN name and you can decide to save the DSN in any location you want to, but there is a default location for DSNs and I'm going to save to that. Now, remember, if you are following along, you won't be able to use my DSN because yours would be different. I'm going to click on next. I'm going to do a final check of that information. And if I'm happy with it, I'm going to click on finish. And you can see there that my sample DSN has now been created. So I'm going to click on OK and we're now ready for the next step. So I've opened up Access again and I have my CRM database open. And I want to access the data in that suppliers table from Access. So I'm going to jump up to my external data ribbon. I'm going to click on New Data Source. I'm going to say from other sources and we're going to select ODBC database. And up pops our little wizard and I'm going to say we're going to create a link, a linked table and click on OK. And now I need to browse to my file data source DSNs. If I scroll across, I can see it's just there and click on OK. And now I get to choose my table. And if you remember, we decided we were interested in this dimension.supplier table. So I'm going to select it from the list and click on OK. And you can see that dimension underscore supplier table has been added into my navigation pane. And once again, note that it has that little blue arrow next to it, which denotes that that is in fact a linked table. So I'm going to double click on dimension supplier. And there we go. I have access to the data in the SQL Server database. Now, one other thing to notice here in the navigation pane is that globe icon. And again, that says that this table is linked by ODBC specifically. Now, of course, I can right click and go into design view if I want to. 
but remember that I can't change anything related to that design. So I can click yes to view the information, but I can't make any changes to it. Now, if a linked table such as this doesn't have a primary key, then Access will normally create one. And you can see it's done that here. It's made the supplier key the primary key. And when it comes to the data types, also because the data types are slightly different between Access and SQL Server, you may find that the data type as you see it in Access may not be exactly the same as the data type in the SQL Server Management Studio. So that's it, we've successfully linked to an ODBC database. And as before, if you want to remove the link, you can right click and you have the option to delete. That's the end of this module. I will see you in the next one. Hello again and welcome back to our course on Access Advanced 2019. It's now time for exercise two and I can't give you a sample answer for this because I would need to use a DSN from my system that wouldn't work on yours, but I'm going to show you my answer on the screen here anyway. So I've made version two of my CRM database and at present it just has two linked tables and the two linked tables are tables in the wide world importers database. We've got the dimension customer table and the dimension suppliers table. So what I would like you to do is create a new database and just link to those two tables in your copy of the Wide World Importers database. So to do this, you're going to need to have created the Worldwide Importers database in SQL Server from the backup file. And then you're going to need to create your own DSN and then use your own DSN to link to those two tables. See how you get on with that, and I will see you in the next section. Hello again, and welcome back to our course on Access Advanced 2019. Now, I've already mentioned a few times that an Access database is a single file, and due to this, it creates a number of problems. Now, one popular way of overcoming these problems is to split the Access database into two parts, a front end and a back end. So in this module, we're going to talk about why you might want to split an Access database. We're going to go through the actual process of splitting up a database. We're going to talk through some of the issues around protecting the back end and some of the issues around selecting a location for the back end. So let's look at that first point. Why split an access database? And I'm looking at the exercise one version of the night movies database. And you can see we have the navigation pane and we have our objects grouped under tables, queries, forms, etc. Now, if several users are going to access this database, and it's currently all in one file and they're going to access it from different locations such as a network location. The more users that access it, the more likely it is to get damaged, perhaps by a network glitch or some kind of hardware error. And if that file is damaged, then the database might be out of use. Now, helpfully, there's not really a reason why each user shouldn't have their own copy of most of this database. So each user could have their own copy of forms or queries in the database. But one thing you can't have is your own copy of the data. The data must be shared. So what you could do is split this database into two and have the shared data in the back end and the non shared data. So things like user interface components, forms, etc., can be put into a front end database. And there are other reasons for splitting. So let's suppose this database is in a shared location and we have 10 people using it from different locations. And every time one of these users wants to view or amend data, they load a form and that form has to travel across the network. So maybe they use this form, maybe they change some data, maybe they run a report. All of that data has to travel generating network traffic. 
So if you split the database, so the back end is in the shared location and the front end is on the user's PC, only the data part generates network traffic. So as each user is just loading forms on their local device that reside on their local device, it will reduce the amount of network traffic. Another factor that can be important is, generally speaking, security is easier to organize if you have a database split. And we're going to talk a lot more about the security aspect a bit later on. But it is worth bearing in mind that when establishing security, the way that you do it for the back end is a lot different from the front end, which kind of leads me nicely into my next point. If you have users who want to create their own reports or forms, it's generally easier to manage if each of those users has their own front end. So rather than put them into a centralized location, cluttering the database up for other users, they can keep those customized elements to themselves in their own copy of the front end database. Now, two other things to quickly mention, and these aren't really reasons for splitting a database, but either or both of these can be consequences of splitting a database. So one of them is that it sometimes makes it easier to do updates. So for example, if you fairly regularly bring in new forms or reports, you can update the front end database without necessarily changing the back end database. So users can essentially continue to use the database while others are being upgraded. The other point is that if your ultimate aim is to move to something like SQL Server, then starting out by splitting the database can be a useful step in that direction. So let's now get on with splitting our database. And I'm not going to use an existing database. We're going to use one of those in a little while in exercise three. But I am going to create a new small database, which will make it a lot quicker and easier to demonstrate. And we're going to create an asset tracking database. And for that, I'm going to use one of these templates. And if I scroll down, you can see it's the first one here in the list. So I'm going to click on that template. So here is the information about that asset tracking template. You can see it's provided by Microsoft. Now I'm going to go away and give this an appropriate name and save it into the course files folder. So join me again in a couple of seconds. So there we go. I've given my file a new name so I can easily identify it and I've saved it into the course files folder. So I'm going to click on create. Now, one thing to note here is that when this template has loaded, you're going to get this welcome screen. And I'm going to talk more about this a little bit later on in the course. But for the moment, let's just close down the welcome screen. And another thing to point out is that this database has four tables and you can see them listed there. We have assets, contacts, filters and settings and some things to bear in mind. If you're going to split a database, you should always take a backup of the database in case things go wrong. So you can always restore back to an older copy. The other thing to make sure to do is that everything is closed. So you want to close all of the objects in the database. So I'm going to go over to the little cross and just close down all of the objects in this database. And it's always best to do that before you start the split. So now we're going to go up to the database tools ribbon. We're going to go to this move data group and it's not immediately obvious which option you should select here. But if you hover your mouse over access database, you'll see the little screen tip there says split a database into two files, one containing the tables and one containing the queries and forms, which is exactly what we want to do. And this brings up the database splitter. Now, before we perform the split, let me draw your attention to some important paragraphs in this dialog box. So it says here, this wizard moves tables from your current database to a new backend database. In multi-user environments, this reduces network traffic and allows continuous front-end development without affecting data or interrupting users. If your database is protected with a password, the new backend database will be created without a password and will be accessible to all users. You will need to add a password to the backend database after it's split. 
It then says that this could be a long process and advises you to make a backup copy of your database before splitting it. And I will say that having done this in the past, even on a fairly small database with little or no data, it can sometimes still take a little while for the split to work. So I just advise you to practice a little bit of patience. So we're going to go ahead and we're going to click split database. Now, an important point to note here is that the file name that is assigned to the backend database is the same as the file name that I gave the database myself. But you'll see there is a slight difference. If you look down in this file name, you can see it's added a suffix after the name of underscore BE and the BE stands for backend. So this is the default suffix that you'll get every time you're splitting a backend. So I'm now going to browse to my course files folder, which is where I'm going to store this. And once I've located my folder, I'm just going to click on split. So my database is now split and I have this little message that says it's been successful. So I'm going to click on OK. And now if you look in that navigation pane underneath that tables group, and I'm essentially looking at my front end database right now, each of those tables has a blue arrow that indicates a linked table. Now, a couple of other points to cover before I finish off this module. The first one is that the location of the backend database is very important. It must be a shared location, so possibly a network location. And then any user that needs to access the data can do so subject to any security arrangements that I've put in place. Now, if I want to give all or any of the users their own copies of the front end, that's fine. And in the next section, we will review how to make sure the front end is successfully looking at the back end. So in the next module, we're going to start using the split database and I'll cover some of the important implementation points. So I'll see you over there. Hello again and welcome back to our course on Access Advanced 2019. In the previous section, we split an assets database into two parts, a front end and a back end. And I'm currently looking at the front end database. Now, there are a number of consequences of this split that I'm going to talk about in this module and also a couple of other important points to be made aware of. So in this module, we're going to look at the use of shared and local tables. We're going to look at the importance of backing up local data. Then we'll look at saving an access database in what's called compiled format. I will then show you how to move the backend database and also the advantages of using trusted locations. So let's look first at the four tables in this database. And as I pointed out in the previous module, all four of them are linked to tables. But if I open the settings table, the function of that table is very different to the function of other tables. So as you can see, it has a single record and the record has two fields and its ID is one of them. Now, the purpose of this record is to determine if that welcome screen is shown or not. And the fact that the single record has show welcome checked means that the welcome screen is shown. Now, there are two possibilities here, either that the design of the database is such that this determines whether the welcome screen is shown. And the other is that each user of the database should have one of these records and each user can choose if they want to see the welcome screen. Now, the mechanism for changing this record is one of the things we're going to come back to later in the course. But for the moment, the important thing is that rather than have this record in this table shared by all users of the database, each should have their own version of this record and this table. And therefore, this table should be a local table to them and not one of the shared tables. So what we essentially need to do here is to move this table back into the same database as the front end, the queries and the forms, etc. So that each user has their own copy of this table and this record within the table. So given that we have a shared table and that we want to convert it back to being a local table, that's a very easy thing to do in Access 2019. 
So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to close this table. And I'm going to go to settings, I'm going to right click, and you can see we have an option in our contextual menu that says convert to local table. And you can see now in the tables group that little linked table arrow has been removed. So that's converted that back to being a local table and it's now stored in the front end database. And of course, each user will have their own copy of that. So clearly the use of a local table for this purpose is fairly straightforward to see. There may well be other settings you may want to give users local values for, but you may also want to let users set up their own local data. So if, for example, they are developing their own add-ins or forms, and that requires them to have some local data, then you can certainly let your users set up their own local tables as well. And it's quite normal for users to be accessing a combination of local and shared data. And another important point is if users do have local data in their front end databases, you do need to consider the consequences from the point of view of backing up the data. If the data is, if you like, your responsibility, you need to make sure your backup regime covers not only the back end database, but also the front end database. Whereas if you're giving users permission to create their own local data, you may just need to make it clear to them that it's their responsibility to back up the front end data. Now, the next feature of Access 2019 we're going to look at is the facility to save the database in compiled format. And I'll explain more about what that means in a moment. But if you've just split the database, you can save the front end in compiled form, which will not only usually improve the performance of the database, but it normally makes it a little quicker and smaller. But also you will find security advantages as well. For instance, users won't be able to modify the forms in the database. Now, in order to do this, we save the database in a different format, a compiled format. And the standard extension for this is ACDE. And in earlier versions of Access, it was MDE. And as I said, in this compiled form, all of the program code, which is responsible for running forms, reports, etc., is in compiled form, so it can't be edited by users. Users can, however, create and modify tables and queries. So let's save this current database in ACDE format. So we're going to jump into File. We're going to go down to Save As. And you can see here in Save As, we have an option for Make ACDE, and it says file will be compiled into an executable only file. So we're going to select that option and click on Save As. And I'm going to navigate to the same folder, so we're going to save this into the Course Files folder. And you can see there the file extension ACDE. And I'm going to click on Save. Now, you can see that we've got the welcome screen come up again, so I'm just going to close out of that. Now, let me also close this ACDB file and take a look at the ACDE file in File Explorer. Now, what you can see here is that the ACDE file is smaller than the ACDB file. And although functionally the database will be able to do the same things, what users can do will be severely limited. So let's open the ACDE. So you can see here that I have a warning message that's telling me it's not possible to determine that this content came from a trustworthy source. Now, I know that this is a trustworthy source, so I'm just going to click open. And you also might see little pop ups like this saying module not found. Now, don't worry about that too much at the moment. We're going to look at that later on. So I'm just going to click on OK. And the asset list form opens. Now I'm going to close this form down. So let's now try and go into the design of the asset list form. So if I right click, the answer is that we can't. You can see that design view option is grayed out. And if I was to go to a report, so let's scroll down and choose this asset details report. If I right click again, I can open it, but I can't go into design view. So in ACDE format, users are restricted in terms of their ability to change the design of the database. Although generally speaking, they can still run forms and reports. 
So essentially, they can still use them, they just can't change the design. And we will see in this course that there are various ways that you can control what users can do and protect the database. Another consequence of these facilities is that you can provide many levels of security on the database as well. So as you start to look at options for distributing access databases using ACDE format, for the front end, it's an attractive possibility. You might want to say that you don't even want people to be able to see the navigation pane on the left hand side. And that's something that we're going to look at as well. Now, something that may well happen is that you may need to move the back end database at some stage, and this could potentially cause problems for your users. We've covered the tools for overcoming the problems this produces earlier in the course, but I would like to give you a quick demo of what happens here. So I'm going to go to my course files folder. So there is the backend database. I'm just going to move it to this little subfolder that I've called cupboard for the moment. And then I'm going to open the ACDB. And of course, it can't find it. So I'm going to click on OK. And you can see that I've now got this macro single step dialog box. Now, again, don't worry too much about this at the moment. I'm going to explain that a little bit later on. So I'm just going to click Stop All Macros. And I'm going to jump up to that external data ribbon. And I'm going to go to Linked Table Manager. So relinking these tables is going to be fairly straightforward. So I'm going to select all three tables by clicking Select All. And I'm going to click on OK. And you can see it's prompting me for the new location. So all I need to do is to browse to that cupboard subfolder. There's my backend database. Click on Open. And it says all selected link tables were successfully refreshed. Click on OK and click on Close. And now if we try to open the database again, we can see that it opens fine. So again, I can just close down that welcome screen. Now, the last thing I'd like to look at is setting up a trusted location. In fact, you can set up more than one trusted location. Now, your users may get a little frustrated by the fact that if you distribute ACDE files like this, as it opens, you get a security notice. So if I open the database and then use it and close it again, each time I open, I keep getting the same message, which is potentially kind of annoying. So a way we can get around that is to go to File, down to Options, and we're going to jump straight into the Trust Center page. And we're going to click on Trust Center Settings. Then from here, we're going to go to Trusted Locations. And what I could do is click on Add a New Location and add my Course Files folder into my Trusted Locations list. So that means every time I open a file, I'm not going to be prompted with that warning message. So I'm going to go ahead and I'm just going to add that new location in and I will join you over in the next section. Hello again, and welcome back to my course on Access Advanced 2019. It's now time for us to do exercise three. And what I'd like you to do is to take version A22 of the Night Movies database and turn it into your exercise three database. Now the database needs to be split into a front end and a back end. And the front end needs to be saved in compiled form. You also need to make sure that when you open the front end, you don't get the security warning you saw in the preceding section. So here is my version. Let's now look at the file manager exercise files folder. If we look at the folder, it's very important to note that there are two versions for exercise three and each version has two files. So there is one called exercise three x32 ACDE, that's an executable database file with a back end, and there is an exercise 3 x64.ACDE, and that's a 64-bit executable file with its own back end. 
Now, depending on if you're using a 32 or a 64 bit version of Access 2019, you'll be able to open one of those ACDE files and not the other. And of course, when you do open the relevant ACTE file, you will need to relink the tables in the relevant backend tables as well. So just be careful of that one, as one of the two won't work for you. That's it for exercise three. See how you get on with that, and I will see you in the next section. Hello again, and welcome back to our course on Access Advanced 2019. In this module, we're going to be taking a look at how you can address multi-user issues when sharing data. And I've referred a number of times to the principle of data being shared between users. Now, whilst we have been looking at putting in place the mechanisms to do this, there are a small set of issues that arise when users share data. To give you an example, let's suppose you located a record in the database, perhaps looked at it on a form, and you're considering making a change to that record. And whilst you're doing that, another user of the same database accesses the same record and also wants to make a change. Potentially, either of you could make a change that would affect a change the other one has recently made. Or perhaps whilst one of you is making a change, the other changes it. So in that case, the first user would be looking at an outdated record. So these multi-user aspects are handled in Access using a number of different tools and techniques, and we're going to look at many of these in this module. So first of all, I will look in more detail at the issues that arise when users share data. Then I'll cover some of the advanced client settings in Access that can help you deal with these issues. And then we'll look at default record locking and record level locking. Now, when it comes to looking at issues when users share data, one of the most important things to look at is the balance between the size of the database and the number of users and the level of churn in a database. And churn is the amount in which that data changes. So if you have a database, so maybe a large one that has a large number of users, but where the level of change or churn is low, then you can afford to approach the issue of change in a very different way to one where the level of churn is high. So for example, if you have a database with a very low level of churn, you can probably take the approach that when a user is going to change a record, the other users are locked out of that record. Whereas if you have a database with a high level of churn, so maybe you have a lot of users, and at any time users might want to see records in that database, and if anyone wants to change a record, it's probably going to be a little bit frustrating for other users not to be able to see records where one user is attempting to change one. So when you're looking at your approach to multi-user access, it's important to take into account the level of churn in the data. So what we're going to do now is look at some of the advanced client settings in Access 2019. So let's jump up to the File tab, and we're going all the way down into Options. And we're going to go to the Client Settings page, and we're looking for the Advanced section. So let me scroll down, and there we go. Now, some of these settings are very important in a multi-user context, and one of them is the default open mode. Now, I must emphasize this is the default open mode, so it's not a particular open mode for one database or one user. It is the default on this device. And the choices are shared or exclusive. And almost without exception, this will be set to shared because you would expect to open access databases in shared mode. There are some times where you may need to open an exclusive use, usually for maintenance. So if you need to do something to the database where you need exclusive access, in which case you need to make sure that anyone else using the database is disconnected from it, then you would open the database in exclusive mode. So let's suppose I wanted to open one of the exercises in the exercises folder in exclusive mode. I'm going to cancel out of here. So let's click on file and go to open. And I'm going to browse to my course files folder. 
And let's say we want to open this one here, the a02.acdb. Now, instead of just clicking open, if I wanted to open this in exclusive use, if I just click that drop down on the open button, you see I have an option there for open exclusive. And of course, this relies on nobody else using this particular database at the time. And as soon as I open it in exclusive mode, it means that no one else is going to be able to go into it. Now, I'm not going to do that for the time being. I just wanted to demonstrate it. So I'm going to click on cancel and jump back to my database. Now I'm going to go back to our options and down to advanced again. Now with the next option, we decide on the default for record locking. And I must emphasize again that this is only the default and you may vary from the default in a number of ways. But let me describe these three options for record locking. The first one is no locks and we do not by default lock a record. If a user is looking at a record and beginning to make changes to that record, it doesn't lock anyone else from being able to look at the record or potentially making changes to it. So this option is used when either there is little chance of two people trying to change the same record at once or where the implications of doing so are not that serious. And whichever record locking option you decide to choose, you can in any case write VBA code to ensure there's no damage done so that on top of whatever access is doing, you can still write code to ensure your database is safe. Another situation where you might use the no locks option is primarily when people are adding data to a database and there aren't really that many situations where the data gets regularly changed. Now, the second option for default record locking is all records, and this applies to a table. And when you apply an all records locking option to a table, it means that all of the records in that table are locked. So this is sometimes used as a halfway house for doing maintenance. If you need to do maintenance on a table, but you don't want to lock people out of the database altogether, you can use the all records record lock. And finally, the third option is edited record. And this means that when a user selects a record or opens that record, that record and that record alone is locked. So the assumption here is that someone else might look at that record while changes are in progress and we are going to stop them from making changes themselves. Now, this is a safer way of doing updates, but it can be frustrating if the person who gets the edited record lock then goes off to make a cup of coffee, leaves the record open on their screen. And so that record is locked for a substantial period of time. Now, with this edited record option, it may still be the case that you need to write VBA code to deal with potential conflicts. But it is a safer way of dealing with record locking where you have a database where there is a significant chance of potential conflicts when editing user records. Now, I have one or two more things to explain here, and I want to particularly look at this checkbox underneath the default record locking option that says open databases by using record level locking. I talked just now in terms of locking individual records, but there is an alternative option to that. And this is for us to use page level locking. The records in an access database are actually accessed using pages of data and a page can typically have many records in it. So if you are doing edited record locking and you are asking access to lock individual records, if you check this box, it will actually lock the page that the record is in, which means you may be locking other records around that record as well. Now, the reason you might do this is for performance reasons, because locking pages is a much quicker thing for access to do. So if you have performance issues with an access database, sometimes switching from record level locking to page level locking can sometimes make things better. And I also suggest that you take a quick look at the numbers underneath that checkbox. There is a set of numbers there, and sometimes you might need to adjust those numbers to better suit the multi-user environment you are working in. Now, let me explain one or two of them, and you can look the others up in Microsoft Help. So the second one down, refresh interval in seconds. This is the interval in which data will be refreshed for you. So mine is set to 60 seconds or one minute. 
So in my case, every one minute that data will be refreshed. So if someone has changed something, that will be refreshed minute by minute. And of course, you can change that refresh interval just by using those little scroll buttons. Notice that there is also an equivalent ODBC refresh interval. So I suggest you familiarize yourself with those and adjust those numbers as necessary. In the next module, we're going to start to take a look at the use of macros. So I will see you over there. Hello again, and welcome back to our course on Access Advanced 2019. In this module, we're going to look at macros and you may well have used macros before. And we're going to go through some of the basics in a moment, and then we're going to move on to the more advanced aspects of using macros in subsequent modules. So macros in Access are pretty straightforward, and the advantages you get from being able to use and understand macros far outweigh the amount of effort involved in getting to grips with them, at least the basics up to an intermediate level of their use. So specifically in this module, I'm going to give you a quick introduction to macros. We're going to do a quick comparison between macros and VBA. Then we'll run through creating a very basic macro, and I'll show you the different ways you can run a macro. And we'll also look at how you can edit a macro as well. So let me start this brief introduction to macros by talking about what a macro is. Now, when you're using Access, you normally perform sequences of steps. So these might be things like opening tables, locating records, making changes to data, and so on. And sometimes it can be helpful to record the sequence of steps and replay them again. And this is particularly useful if the particular task, the thing that you're trying to carry out, is something you do on a regular basis. It can really make you a lot more efficient. Now, one option for recording a sequence of steps is to record them in a macro. So let's say you have four steps that you perform in order to carry out a specific task you can record those steps in a macro. Now, not only can you repeat that sequence of steps whenever you like by running the macro, but if in fact what you need to do is perform that sequence of steps hundreds of times, then you don't have to sit there and manually perform those things hundreds of times. What you can actually do is set Axis up so that it runs that macro hundreds of times. And macros can be useful not only for performing steps many times, but for performing those steps in the same sequence many times. So in effect, it removes the element of uncertainty or error or doubt. One other very important factor in Access is that macros are not the only way of performing steps, if you like, automatically. There is another approach, and it's a different programming language called VBA. And in Access, you can use either macros or VBA. Now, if you've used other Microsoft applications, most of them have macros and VBA as well. But one important thing to warn you about is that although this terminology is used through all of the Microsoft applications, the exact nature of macros and VBA in each application does vary quite a bit. And in fact, in Access, Macros and VBA are very different languages. And although you can do many things using either Macros or VBA, just about anything you can do with Macros, you can do with VBA. Whereas with VBA, there are a vast number of things you can do with it that you can't do with Macros. So to some extent, Macros are the less versatile tool, but they are the easier tool to use. So we're going to be looking specifically at macros in this and the next few modules, and then we'll look at VBA a bit later on in the course. So let's start out by creating a very basic macro. I'm going to jump up to the Create ribbon. And the last group on the end is Macros and Code. So let's click the Macro button. And now we're in a space where we build up a macro as a sequence of actions. And if you look at the tab just here, you can see that my macro that I'm about to create has been given a default name of macro one. And of course you can change this, which I'll show you how to do later on. 
Now the actions that are included in the macro can be selected from the actions catalog on the right hand side. So let me make that a bit wider. And we have some program flow actions. And you'll see one of them in there is a comment. So that means that we can put a comment in. And I can also do things like include an if statement if I want to. So what an if statement would allow me to do is to carry out my macro with its series of actions on a conditional basis. So for example, you may need to check something at some stage and then the subsequent actions will depend on the result of that check. And you can also create sub macros and we'll talk about that a little bit later on. Now the actions themselves are included in this catalog here. So for instance, you have data entry operations. And if I click the little arrow to expand that, I can see the options or the actions that I have. So from here, I can do things like delete records, edit list items, save records. And you can see underneath, I have quite a few other different catalogs there as well. So let's get started building our macro. Now there is a tradition when it comes to programming that the first program that you ever create, in this case, the first macro, is just to say, hello world. So we're gonna stick with that convention as we build this macro. Now I know hello world is not particularly useful, but this will demonstrate many of the things you need to know to get you started. Now notice that we have this little control here, this plus, and in the box it says add new action. So I can click the drop down and I can choose the action I need here, or I could choose it from my actions catalog on the right hand side. Now on this occasion, I'm gonna use this drop down list simply because it's right there in front of me. And the action that I'm looking for is message box. So I'm gonna scroll down and again, these are in alphabetical order and I can see there it is in the list. So let's select that one. Now when I select this, a couple of important things happen. One is that I'm presented with the arguments to go with this particular action. Now, in the case of the message box, there are four arguments. There's four additional pieces of information that I need to provide. So the first thing is the message itself. And we've already established that our message is going to be, hello world. I can select if I want a beep sound when this message comes in. So in this case, I'm going to say no. I need to select the type of message. So again, if we click the drop down, you can see I have critical, warning, warning, and information. So I'm gonna say that this is a warning with an exclamation point. And then we need to complete a title. And title, you'll see what this is in just a moment, but I'm just gonna put something in here for now. Now, the other thing that happened here is that Access presented me with my next action. So I can go in and I can add another action if I want to. So I could do exactly the same thing, select from this drop down list, or again, I could choose from my actions catalog. So let's add another action in here. So I'm going to say go to page. And the sequence in which Access adds these options is just going down the page from top to bottom. Now, if I was to make one of my actions an if command or add another action that uses the if command, that sequence might get more complicated, but basically it's always from top to bottom. Now, I don't actually want this go to page action, so I'm gonna delete it. And you'll see just on the right hand side, we have a delete option. So very simple, just click that and it's gone. Now, in theory, at this point, I could run my very simple macro. I will, however, run into a very small issue. So I'm gonna run this macro. I'm gonna go up to my design ribbon underneath my macro tools. And the first button I have there is run. So let's click it. Now, what Access does is it basically insists that I save the macro first. So I'm gonna say yes to save my macro and I'm now required to give my macro a name. So much like everything else that we do in Access, I like to have a naming convention. So I name all of my macros MCR, and we'll call this Hello World, and click on OK. So now my macro exists and it's run, and you can see what I'm getting here is a message box, which is the action we selected. The message is Hello World, there was no beep when it came up. 
The type is a warning, and you can see the yellow warning triangle, and the title, this is important. So it looks like my macro is working perfectly at this stage. So let's click on OK. And why don't we run it again? And there we go, works perfectly on the second time around as well. Now, one other thing to be aware of is if I go over to my navigation pane and just click the drop down there, we have an option for macros. So if I click macros, you can see it's going to list all the macros that I have, and there is my macro for Hello World. Now, as you'll see in the coming modules, there are many ways of running macros, and in many situations, macros can be invoked automatically when other things happen in your database. But the one other thing you need to know is how to change and edit an existing macro. And this is pretty straightforward stuff. So I have the macro selected in the pane on the left. And if I wanted to make changes to this message box command, if I click somewhere within, you can see that I can now make changes. So I can change my message. I can change the beep. I can change the warning. I can also change the title. So let's make some small changes to our macro. I'm just going to change the title. And I'm going to change the type from warning to information. And let's add an action. I'm going to add a comment and I'm going to select it from the actions catalog this time. And you'll see this comment appears within this sequence of action steps. So let's add a quick comment. Now, once I've finished that, I can perhaps have another action. So let's have another message box. I'm going to add a message. This time I'm going to keep beep as yes. The type is going to be information and the title. So now what we essentially have here in our macro are two message boxes and the second one has a beep. So I think I'm just about ready to run my macro. And remember, when you go to click run, it will ask you to save any changes that you've made. So let's click on yes and see this macro run. So there's my first message box. I have the information icon. It says hello world with the title of this is a very important message. I'm going to click on OK and I get the second message box. I hope you're well with the title of have a nice day. And you probably didn't hear the beep because of the way that I'm recording this video. But let me assure you, there was a beep when that second message came in. So you've seen there running a macro and also editing a macro. The final point I want to go through is just in the navigation pane. If we click the drop down and select all access objects, you can now see your two linked tables and also the macros that you have. And as with most objects in Access, once you've finished working on your macro, you can right click and you can close it down. But remember, it is always over here for you to run. Now, if at any point in time I wanted to go back in and edit this macro, if I just select it in the navigation pane, right click and select design view, that's going to take me back in. Then all I need to do is click within whichever part of the macro I want to edit and I have all my options available to me. So very, very easy to modify any existing macros. In the next module, we'll look at a special kind of macro, an auto exec macro. So I will see you over there. Hello again, and welcome back to our course on Access Advanced 2019. In the previous module, we created a very simple macro to display Hello World. And we talked about some of the properties and uses of macros. In this module, we're going to take a look at the ways you might use macros and also look at the very important auto exec macro. So first we'll look at macros and events. Then we will apply a macro to an on click event. We'll talk about the auto exec macro and we'll talk about the possibilities of using local settings in Access 2019. 
Now, when we ran Hello World in the previous module, we clicked on the Run button in order to execute that macro. But there are various different ways to run a macro. And macros will run on the basis of various events occurring. So that might be clicking on the Run button, but it also might be something like somebody clicking an OK button on a form, maybe opening a form, closing, deleting a record. Each one of those is an event and macros can react to respond to events. And in a simpler way, you can write VBA code that responds to events as well. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to create a form in the CRM database. I'm going to put a button on that form and I'm going to make a macro run when you click on the button. So I'm going to jump up to the create ribbon and we're going to go to form design. And I'm going to put a very simple button on here using my control. So I'm going to grab this one here, the button control. I'm just going to draw a reasonable size button. Now I don't want to utilize the wizard at this stage, so I'm just going to click cancel. And I'm going to give this button a different caption. So we're going to say click here. I'm going to save the form. And if we select all access objects in the navigation pane, you can see the form just there. Now I'm going to create a macro. I'm going to save the macro. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to make that macro run when I click on the button on the form. So to do that, I need to look at the properties of the button. So I'm going to go into design view for the form. And I need to make sure that I have the button selected. And I'm going to bring up the property sheet. And for this type of thing, the tab that I want to go to is the event tab. And with the event tab, I can specify what happens when certain events occur. So the most obvious event here is the on click event. So if I click the ellipses, it will take me into the choose builder so I can build a macro, an expression, or possibly even some code. Now I've already prepared a macro, I've already recorded one, so I don't need this builder. So I'm going to cancel out there. So if instead I click on the drop down in this on click field, you can see it lists out all of the macros that I've created. So I can just select my macro. So having assigned that, I can now close the form and save. And let me reopen the form. So there is the form. The only thing we have on this form at the moment is this button. So if I click on the button, you can see my macro runs and I get my message box. So not only can I do that as many times as I like, but if I wanted that message to come up many different times on different forms, I can assign that same macro to each of those events on many different forms. So essentially, we would call this reusable content, essentially. So in order to demonstrate this point, I'm going to go into the design view on this form again. I'm going to click on my button and make sure I'm in my event tab in the property sheet. And what I'm going to do this time is I'm going to assign my macro to the on mouse move event. I'm going to close and save the changes and I'm going to double click to reopen up my form. Now watch what happens as I move the cursor. Currently nothing is happening. However, watch what happens when I move my cursor over the button. You see my macro runs and I get that message box pop up. Now, this might not be the behavior that you want, but hopefully that demonstrates how easy it is to assign a macro to an event. And again, as we will see later on, the Access Event module includes many events for various objects in Access. So I'm going to click on OK 
I'm going to go back in and I'm going to change this button so that it doesn't fire when we move the mouse. We're going to turn our attention now to looking at a really important macro and that is the auto exec macro. And many databases will have an auto exec macro and you may get to the point where you want to write your own. So what I have open on the screen here is the asset tracking database and there is an auto exec macro and you'll see in the navigation pane right at the bottom where we have macros you can see it sitting there auto exec and it's really important that this macro is spelt exactly right and provided it's spelt correctly that macro will be executed when you start up the database. So let's look at the auto exec macro for this database. I'm going to right click and I'm going to go into design view. Basically what we have here are two open form statements, although the second is within an if. So the first open form statement, and you can just click in here to see the different fields. It makes it clear what each parameter means. So you can see here it's opening the form name asset list. It opens in form view and remember if you want to change anything you can click the drop down and you have their design print preview data sheet so on and so forth. If you want to apply a filter or a where condition you can apply that in there. And then we have data mode and data mode you can add edit or read only. Now I'm going to leave that blank for the time being. And then we have a window mode and if I hover over that it says select the mode for the form window. So we currently have normal and that means the form is in the mode setting for its form properties. We could also choose hidden, we could have icon, dialogue, so on and so forth, but I'm going to leave mine as normal. So in terms of opening you can completely choose the parameters that apply. Now you may have noticed each time you open this asset tracking database that the asset list is always open and the reason is because this open form statement is in the auto exec. So if you want to see a different form you know how to change that by changing the auto exec macro. Now the second option that we have on here is within an if statement. We are saying that if a condition is true then open the form. So let's look at this if statement and when doing that we're going to look at one option for dealing with local settings in an access database. Now earlier on in the course we changed the settings table back from being a table in the back end database to being in the front end database so that each user could have their own settings. So if we go up and look at the settings table in design view you can see that we have two fields in each record. We have the ID and then we have the show welcome field and that is set to yes or no. And having looked at this design in the settings table, let's open it in datasheet view. So you can see there we have the two fields in each record, ID and the show welcome field. So if I want to show that welcome screen when I first come into the database, I can make sure that I have that's selected in there. So essentially we have one record and the value of show welcome is true. So let's go back to the macro and just look at this if statement. So the if statement is saying get me the value of the show welcome from the settings table and if it's true open the form welcome. So that's basically how it works, what it's saying here. But you might be wondering, what is this dfirst command that we have here? Well, dfirst is a function used in Access to do what might seem like quite a strange thing. And the best way to get more information on this is to jump into help. So you can see here there are actually two functions with dfirst and dlast. And it says you can use the dfirst and dlast functions to return a random record for a particular field in a table or query when you simply need any value from that field. And you can use the dfirst and dlast functions in a macro, module, query expression or calculated control on a form or report. So in this case we are only going to have one record in that settings table and so the show welcome value in that field will be the only show welcome value in that table. That's why we can use dfirst. 
If we needed to find a specific value corresponding to some other specific filter or wear condition, we would need to do something a little bit more sophisticated than this. But the advantage here is that all we need to do is to find that show welcome value. So we can use the dfirst function. And in that function, we first specify the expression that corresponds to the name of the field. So show welcome in this case. And secondly, the domain where we're looking for that. So that would be the settings table. So what we're essentially saying is, I don't care what the value and the reason is because there will only ever be one. So in this case, there is a tick in that show welcome screen. So the value will be set to true. So when I open the database, I will see the welcome screen or the form. So this is an example of using local settings to allow users to determine certain aspects of how your database application runs on individual installations. Note here how important it is that the settings table is in the front end database and not the back end. Because if it was in the back end, there's only one setting of show welcome for all users of the database. So that's it for this module. In the next module, we're going to look at more autoexec macros. So I'll see you over there. Hello again, and welcome back to our course on Access Advanced 2019. In the previous module, we've been looking at macros, and we've also been looking at autoexec. Now, for much of this section, we're going to be looking at some of the other things you can do with autoexec macros and some key aspects of their use. So we're going to go through some more of the key points. I'm going to show you how to trust a project as part of running an autoexec macro. We're going to look at the use of a login dialog. I'm going to show you how to hide the navigation pane. And finally, how to bypass the autoexec macro. So first off, we're going to focus on a specific example of an autoexec macro and look at some of its features. Now, a couple of warnings before we proceed. As you start to learn more about macros and the use of autoexec, you will discover it has a few shortcomings from the point of view of absolute security. Access is a little limited in terms of what you can achieve. Now, for many people, this isn't a problem, but if you do require a high level of security, then it is sometimes necessary to move into using VBA rather than macros. And in some situations, it's not possible to achieve a high enough level of security in access anyway. Now, one or two of these points I'll come back to, but ultimately, if you can achieve the required level of functionality and security in access, it will very much depend on what your requirements are. So first off, let's take a look at autoexec. And the autoexec we're going to look at is the Northwind Traders A2 database in the Course Files folder. Now, when you open this file, there's a couple of things I want you to notice. I want you to notice the navigation pane on the left hand side and also the fact that we have this login dialog pop-up box. So the idea here is that you come in and you select your name as an employee and then click the login to go into the database. Now we're going to come back to this a little bit later on. So for the moment, I'm just going to close out of this login dialog. Now notice what you can see in the navigation pane. We can see lots of tables for customers, employees, so on and so forth. And if we scroll all the way down, you can see right at the bottom, we have our macros. And you can see one of them is autoexec. So let's jump into design view for the autoexec macro. Now, in order to make this a little bit less chaotic to look at, I'm just going to collapse up some of these objects. So let's collapse up tables, queries. So we can just purely focus on this macros section. And the first thing I'm going to concentrate on here is this top section where it says set displayed categories. Now, if I click this drop down button in the navigation pane next to all access objects, you see I have all of these categories. So I have things like creation date, modified date, filter by group, so on and so forth. Now, if I wanted to set up my database application so that some of these options are not visible, so maybe I didn't want users to see created date, modified date or filter by group, I can do that. 
And I should emphasize we aren't talking about what is selected when they open the database. We're talking about what can be selected, what is available. So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to go over to the Actions Catalog pane on the right hand side and I'm going to expand this User Interface Commands option. And you'll see that one of them there is Set Displayed Categories. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to click on this, I'm just going to drag it and I'm going to drop it in between that if statement and the first set displayed categories. And you see I get a horizontal line there, which is showing me where it's going to be placed when I let go of my mouse. So what I can now do from here is that I can click the category drop down and I'm going to say created date and I'm going to change the show to no. I'm going to do this twice more. I'm going to grab set displayed categories, I'm going to drag it, I'm going to select from the category modified date and I'm going to say no, do it one more time, I'm going to select the category and this time I'm going to say tables and related views and set that to no as well. Now having done that, so I'm going to close down the auto exec and I'm going to save the changes. I'm going to close down the database and I'm going to open it up again. Now again, I'm just going to cancel this login dialog, but if I now click on all access objects, you can see that I no longer have in there those options that we set to know. So there's no creation date, there's no modified date, and there's no tables and queries. So that's a demonstration of how you can control which options are available to users in that navigation pane. Now, I've just been in and changed the auto exec back to only having the original set of displayed categories action in it. And I want to now focus on the second action, which is this one here, the if statement. And in this case, we're looking at a property of the current project. And just to make this a bit easier to see, I'm going to collapse up some of these other categories. So you can see here it's referring to the current project. Then we have a dot and is trusted. So is this current project trusted? Now in this case it is trusted and the reason it is is because the database file is in my course files folder which we placed into a trusted location earlier on in the course. Now, if it wasn't trusted, then what would happen is that this would say, if not the current project is trusted, then a form would be opened and the form is called the startup screen. So let's have a look at that form startup screen. I just click to open. This is really just an informational form, so it doesn't really have any executable buttons in it. So what it says is, welcome to the Northwind Traders sample database. In order to use this sample, click options on the message bar and select enable this content. Alternatively, open the database from a trusted location. Now, in fact, that would appear with the standard access warning about trusting a project. And really, this screen is there for additional explanation. So it helps users understand what's happening. Now, in order to demonstrate what this would look like to a new user who'd not yet trusted this database or put it into a trusted location, I'm going to make a copy of the database and put it into a location that's not trusted. And that's how it would look if it were opened from a non-trusted database. So that's a good example of a form that gives a user help, but doesn't really provide any functionality. So we're back now at the Northwind Traders Auto Exec, and we're moving on to the next action. So it says, if the current project is trusted, then open the form Login Dialog. And it's important to point out that the login facility in Northwind Traders isn't really implemented in a way that would be viable as a workable logging facility, but it does have some useful features. 
So first of all, let's look at some of the reasons why you wouldn't do logins using this approach. So I'm going to close and reopen the database. And the first thing that you're asked to do in this login dialog is to select an employee. Now, this would be quite unusual and not very clever to choose a username from the drop down list because essentially anybody could jump on here and select anyone from this list. So I don't think you would arrange it in this way, but the idea is that you select your username and you click on the login button. So I'm going to just select the default Andrew Cincini and I could then log in. The other thing that you wouldn't normally have on a login dialog is a close button because again, effectively what someone could do is just click on that close button and carry on working in the database as normal. So it doesn't really suffice as a viable working option when it comes to logging in. But let's look at the login dialog itself. So I'm going to close out of here. So I've opened the login dialog in design view. And you can see the two controls in here, the select employee and the login. Now, if I click on the, the larger one, so the select employee, and you look over in the properties sheet on the right. So you can see here in the properties sheet, the selection type is combo box. So that's a combo box control. And if I click on the event tab, you can see that I have an embedded macro in here after update. So basically, when someone has made a selection on the combo box, this macro is then fired. And an embedded macro is one that's actually been embedded into your database as opposed to creating an external macro and saving it as an MCR file. Now, if we click on the ellipses, so it has a set temp var action, it has an on error action, a requery action, and a run menu command action. Now I'm not going to go through each one of these. I'm in fact just going to close this. Now if I go to the login button, if you look at the property sheet, you can see the selection type is a command button. And if we look down in the event tab, it says on click, and then we have another embedded macro. And if at any time, if you wanted to specify an embedded macro rather than one as a separate macro file, this is how you would access it. Now, the important difference here between embedded macros and external ones that you create yourself is that embedded macros can't be reused. So by putting a macro into a separate file, like an MCR file, you can then call it from a number of different places. But if I only wanted it to be accessible in this location, then this is a nice way of keeping the code with the control. So what we've seen here are some of the elements of a login system. And what we really need to do is to take away that close button in the corner of this login dialog. And in reality, in a real life scenario, you'd probably want to add a lot more checking into this login dialog. So you'd want to check that the employee is valid or the user is valid. And you might want to get them to do something like provide a password. And you definitely wouldn't want to allow them to just be able to click a close button in the corner to bypass the entire login process. Now, we're not going to go through a lot of those things, but it's definitely something that's worth thinking about. Now, as an Access user, you will know how much you depend on the navigation pane when it comes to working within your database. But when it comes to users accessing a database, as we've already shown, you can control what's available. But one other option is to hide the navigation pane altogether. So what I'm going to do now is show you how to remove that. So I'm back in Design View for my Auto Exec. And the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to remove this set displayed categories action at the top here. I'm then going to jump across to my action catalog. and I'm going to expand macro commands and I'm going to select this one run menu commands. So I'm going to double click to add that in and note it will add in that action wherever you are currently clicked. So you can move these around if you're not happy with the sequence. And I actually want to make this the first item. So I'm going to just drag and drop it at the top. So now with my new action, I need to select my first command. And I'm going to select 
window hide. I'm going to close and save. I'm going to close my database and I'm going to reopen it. Now you'll see when I reopen, I still have that login dialog there, but there is no longer a navigation pane. So on the face of it, I'm protecting my database from users fiddling around with those different elements. Now, of course, users do still have the option of pressing the F11 key to bring that navigation pane back up, but you can prevent that. So if you go into File and down to Access Options and go to the current database page, one option here is Use Access Special Keys. So if I uncheck this and click on OK, it says to me, you must close and reopen the current database. So I'm going to click OK. I'm going to close down my database, reopen it. And now if I try and use my F11 key to bring up that navigation pane, nothing happens. Now, of course, there are ways of even getting around that. But for most users, this will probably suffice. Now, one last thing to show you, and that is that you can suppress the running of the AutoExec macro when you open an Access database by holding down the Shift key. So again, I'm going to close my database down. And now when I go back to open my database, so you can see here it's the top one listed in my recent. If I hold down my Shift key when I open it, it now opens without the auto exec being run at all. So I don't have that login screen popping up. Now, not everyone is going to know about that option and it is possible to even suppress that as well, but you would need to use VBA code. So really what you need to do here is you need to assess how secure you need to make your database. And usually a few simple steps like this, so hiding the navigation pane, is enough to achieve a reasonable level of security. So quite a lot in that section. That's it for now. We're going to move on to the next section where we're going to look at macro security. So I will see you over there. Hello again, and welcome back to our course on Access 2019. In this section, we've been taking a look at macros. And in this module, I want to look further into macro and code security. And quite a bit of this applies to VBA code as well as macros. So in this module, we're going to take a look at an overview of code security. We're going to look specifically at macro settings. And then we'll look at trusted documents, trusted locations, and trusted publishers. Now, in principle, in Access 2019, security is pretty straightforward, provided you stick to one or two principles. So the first thing to bear in mind is that the main areas of risk to databases come from code being run. So one of the most important principles is that you should only have code running that you trust. So, for example, if someone gives you a database from outside or you download a database from the web, you do need to be careful of any associated code. And bear in mind, some access code can be very clever. And if that code includes commands to do things like delete records in a table or corrupt data, it could cause a lot of damage. So what we're really talking about here is restricting the ability of code to run. So let's jump into our macro settings. I'm going to go up to File and down to our old favorite options. And we're going to click on the Trust Center page. And we're going to jump straight into Trust Center Settings. And from here, Macro Settings. And you'll see that we have four main options just there. And again, just to reiterate, the macro settings apply to macros and VBA code. So the first option here is disable all macros without notification. So 
This means if you get a database from someone else, the macros won't run, and you also won't be told that the macros won't run. Now, the second option, and this is normally the option that I have set, as you can see here, is disable all macros with notification. So this means if I open the database I've received from someone else, the first thing I will be told if it has any code in it is that there is code and it doesn't run, I will be invited to give permission in order for that code to run. So if I know it's from a trusted source, I can just click yes or enable to run the code and off it will go. Now the third option here, disable all macros except digitally signed macros. This is normally more relevant to commercial situations, but you may, as a private individual, have a need for this option. So what happens here is that providers of macro code can digitally sign those macros to assure that they are safe to use and you would normally buy a digital certificate which would interact with the certificate supplied with the macro. Now, as I said, for most people, this won't be an option, but just remember that that option is available. Now, the fourth option here is enable all macros. And I don't think I have ever had this set on any PC that I've used. So basically, whatever macro it comes across, it's just going to run that code. I would say this is probably the most risky out of all of them, and I wouldn't recommend that you use this option. So let's turn our attention now to trusted documents. Now, if you open a database in Access and trust it, then the document is added to your trusted documents list. Now, the odd thing about this is that you can't actually see the trusted documents list. But basically, as you go through trusting documents, they are added to this kind of list that sits in the background. So once you've trusted it once, the next time you open that database, you're not going to be asked to trust it again. Now, there are some important controls here. You have a clear button. So let's suppose you've been using Access for some time and you're a bit worried that the list contains maybe some old databases that you don't use anymore or maybe one proved not to be quite as trustworthy as you first thought. So what you can do here is just completely clear that list out and essentially start again. So each time you then open a document, you'll be asked to trust it to build up that list again. Also note this checkbox here, allow documents on a network to be trusted. So you may decide that's an option you want to do. So any documents that come from a network, you want to trust them. Now, the next thing I want to look at is trusted locations. And we did speak a little bit about this previously because I added in my course files folder and my exercise folder into trusted locations earlier on in the course. So effectively, anything I open that's come from these two folders is automatically trusted. And you have your options down here to add a new trusted location. You can remove and also modify. And again, I have a checkbox towards the bottom, allow trusted locations on my network. And you can see that that isn't actually recommended, hence why I do not have it ticked. And then the final one in this module is trusted publishers. Now I can see that I have something in there and really talking about these certificates that apply to these publishers is outside the scope of this course. But if you do get a certificate from a publisher and you set it up in Windows, you can see the details of the certificate by selecting the publisher and clicking view at the bottom. So those are some things to bear in mind when it comes to your macro trust center settings. That's it for this module. In the next module, we're going to do an exercise. So I'll see you over there. Hello again, and welcome back to our course on Access Advanced 2019. In this section, I'm going to set you exercise four. And in exercise four, we have quite a bit to do. Now, the starting point is version 23 of the Night Movies database in the Course Files folder. What I want you to do is to take a copy. Now, it has a front end and a separate back end, and you need to create a new version. I've called mine exercise four, but you need to make sure the front end connects to the correct back end. 
So if you just copy both of the version 23 front end and back end files, of course, the copy of the front end will link to the original back end. So you need to make sure you have a pair of separate front end and back end files. So let me open up my new version, my exercise for solution and show you the features I want you to include. So I have a welcome screen and you can see there that I've included a clapperboard graphic. Now, if you want to use one of your own graphics, that's fine. But I have also included the clapperboard as a JPEG file in the exercise files folder. So you might want to use that. I've done this as a modal dialogue. You can see that I have a close button, but I don't have any navigation buttons associated with changing data. Then, of course, when the user closes the welcome screen, they are back into the application. Now, that isn't all there is to do. I want you to incorporate a couple of other features. Now, let me just bring up the navigation pane and there's no need to suppress the navigation pane in this exercise. I've included a settings table and the settings table is used so that users can enable or disable the welcome screen. There is also an auto exec macro. And of course, you can use the auto exec macro to invoke the welcome screen. Now, if I jump up into options and go to current database, there are a number of settings you can use in here to do some of the things we've looked at doing via auto exec. For example, you can set up the first display form just here. So currently it says FRM navigation form. Rather than specifically open a form in the auto exec and bear in mind on this occasion, we're essentially opening two forms. That is the welcome screen in the auto exec. And then from here, we can specify which one we want to start working on. Now, if we move a little bit further down these options, there is a facility where we can choose to display the navigation pane. And if you click on navigation options, you can essentially specify what's available in that navigation pane. So this is a very flexible way of controlling that navigation pane. So there are a couple of facilities in options that you may want to look at as good alternatives. So that's about it on exercise four, except that when you have it working, I'd like you to take some time just tidying it up a little bit. So you may have looked at the version of the welcome screen that I showed you, and you may have seen the name on the form as FRM welcome. Well, notice it now says welcome with an exclamation mark. The dialogue is centered and I've sorted out inconsistencies in the color of the text. And the version you're looking at now is version four in the exercises folder. So see how you get along with that. We're going to move on to customizing the ribbon and the quick access toolbar in the next section. So I will see you over there. If you're not a subscriber, click down below to subscribe so you get notified about similar videos we upload. To get the course exercise files and follow along with this video, click over there and click over there to watch more videos on YouTube from Simon Says It.